Okay. Hey, everybody. It's Adam Farkas, and welcome to another edition of C Wire. Uh, hopefully, everybody uh, can hear me here. Um, I have uh, Steve Silverberg and Paul Farkas with us here today. How you doing, guys? Excellent. Very well. How you doing, Paul? Fine. How's the weather in Florida? Steve? Good night. Uh, it, when I came here, it was right after the hurricane. It was terrible. We had lakes that didn't exist before, but now everything's calming down, and life is as beautiful as it can be indoors, away from people. <laughs> but uh, nice. Excellent. It's not 95 degrees. It's 80 degrees. It's, it's what, it, what Florida is, is known as for, nice in the winter, crummy in the summer. <laughs> awesome. So we're, we're here out in Oregon, Paul and I, and uh, it is a very typical Oregon November right now. It is dark outside. It is raining. It is miserable. So you should th thank your lucky stars. <laughs> yep, <laughs> because we, we, we have it way worse here. So anyway, thank you everyone for attending. Um, you know, hopefully people are showing up for this live stream today. And, and forget about the live stream. Hopefully people are going into classes today. Um, it's, it's really great to be back here one more time. And, and I guess this is our next to last show for the year. We're doing this again in December. Um, and that's going to be our big, our big finale, our blowout. Uh, but for right now, for those who are attending, thank you so much for being here because we couldn't do it without you. Just want to remind everyone that at this point, CWIRE is by far the largest conference in optometry with about 6,000 ODs uh, attended so far. So, um, and again, we couldn't have done it without everybody. So it's been quite a, a crazy year. I mean, I think um, when we started this, remember, we did our first show back in February. And CWIRE was intended to be done once, and then that was it. And then the pandemic happened. So we've done it now, I don't even know how many times. It feels like almost monthly. This will be our seventh of eight. Yeah. Seventh so, of eight. So, yeah, we've, we've compressed a lot uh, into this year, uh, and hopefully we, we've helped people get a lot of credits. Um, but this morning, what I'd like to just talk about really briefly is how you get the credits and everything that's that's been going on. So, and just a reminder. So again, we're returning live on December 12th and 13th. So if you can't stick around for a lot of the show today, um, you know you can come back next month and, and finish it off. Um, to plan your day, just remember the course schedule is at cewire2020.com. Click on courses and then download printable course schedule. That's probably the easiest thing to do. It's a PDF with the schedule of events today. And remember, you can't be in two places at once. The software is going to watch to make sure that you are actually, um, you know, sitting there watching the video. Essentially, it watches to make sure your browser window is open. And if you sit through an entire lecture, you get credit. Um, the critical thing is, of course, and to make it mm -hmm. uh, to make it clear, um, if you paid for this uh, uh, seminar, you are paid for the December seminar for free, also. So um, yep. you don't have to take all the courses today, and don't get worried about it. You have plenty of time. You have literally another um, thirty-two hours of live presentations. Yep. Yeah. So you can always come on back. So uh, and remember, you have to watch the entire lecture. Don't leave early, or else it's not going to record the fact that you were there. Um, you also may need to make sure you have your Arbo OE tracker number uh, listed uh, in the control panel. And Steve has actually written in each lecture hall how to do that to make sure that it's yep. it's in there. So all good. By the way, in the next time we do see wire for 2021, now that we have adapted to these new rules, when you register, you'll just put your OE tracker number in your registration. Um, so you won't ever have to even think about it again. It'll just be be in there. Um, yep. And also, so you got to remember, you can take this on demand right through December thirty first. Yep. Yeah. Everything. But you have to take a quiz. Don't forget the quiz. Right. There's a quiz for on demand use, and this is again an Arbo rule, not not, not our rule. So it's uh, I it's kind of an interesting thing that they would still demand that, I, and I'm not sure why that is or what logic they use to come up with this. Where live, you don't need one, but on demand, you do. But anyway. Um, but we try to make the quizzes fair, number one. They should be easy to pass, and you don't have one shot. If you don't pass it the first time, you could take it multiple times. We won't tell you what you got wrong, so you have to take the quiz all, all over again. But um, if you listen to the lecture, you should pass easily. They're not, that, is required. they're not that hard. This isn't like a, I don't know, college-level physics lecture or anything, right, where <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> the average is like a 30 or something. Um, no, you know, P, we, we try to make them as fair as possible. Um, here's an important slide uh, that I need to let everybody know about because we're getting a lot of emails from folks about my credits aren't showing up in the OE tracker. Arbo right now is reporting huge delays 
um, in getting credits uploaded into their tracker. Uh, we're looking at delays of two to three weeks or more, meaning that if you attended CWIRE in October, you may not see your credits yet in the OE tracker. And this is not our fault. What's happened here is that because of COVID and because there are so many little CE providers trying to pop up to meet demand, Arbo is being overwhelmed with people trying to submit credits. And so it's a manual process on their end. When we send credits over to them, we do it electronically, but in the form of a spreadsheet. They take that spreadsheet and then manually enter it uh, into their system. So I have no idea what their back end looks like, but obviously it's not the most efficient thing in the world uh, and was never designed to be used, you know, in a situation like this with COVID. So they are falling way behind. And Ar and Arbor doesn't have a staff of thousands. So they have a few people, so they're doing yeoman work. They are, yes, they definitely are. They are overworked and they could really use more people. In fact, I know people complain about having to pay like 30 or 40 bucks or whatever for the OE tracker. And I know even I've complained, right, about having to pay <laughs> Arbo to get lectures approved and stuff. But the reality is they operate on a shoestring budget uh, and could probably deal with at least one or two more people or modernization of their backend systems to make this faster uh, in the era of COVID. So I apologize if you haven't seen your credits yet. If you're really worried about it, here's what you need to do. Inside of your help center, you can see a list of all your certificates. Um, what you wanna do is pull that up and make sure that all the classes that you've passed are actually listed on your certificates in there. Also make sure your OE tracker number is there. If those two things are met, your certificates are showing in our control panel, and you have an OE tracker number, then you don't have to worry. We submitted those credits for you. That will work perfectly, but you may just have to wait for quite some time until Arbo gets it in. Uh, I, In fact, I don't even know with today's talks how long it's going to take them to get these things uploaded. I do know that what we're planning to do is very quickly on Monday gather everybody's credits together from the weekend show and get them into Arbo as fast as we can to try to minimize the delays. So anyway, I I'm sorry about all this. There's nothing we can do. It's not our fault. Um, the best that we can do for you guys is just keep on top of Arbo. And I'm going to have a call into them on Monday as well, you know, just to see where things stand with the October show, because I feel really badly for folks um, who are waiting on their credits. Yep. The other thing I put it down there, if your license is up and like imminently, like this month, just drop me an email, send an email to support at CWR2020.com. And I'm going to see what I can do about trying to individually push those credits in for you with Arbo and just let them know, hey, this is an emergency. You know, we don't want anyone's license to come up and, and not get, uh, you know, reapproved because they don't have the C credits. So I guess what makes this more complicated, and Steve, you can appreciate this too, is that each state, you know, has their own different rules for re-upping your license, right? Some might check more thoroughly than others whether you've actually done the CE or not. Um, so I, I could imagine in some states this could actually be a very big deal if that tracker is not showing all those credits already. And people do have questions, even though we've laid it out. So you only have to enter your OE tracker number once for the whole conference. It'll be remembered, and in fact, be remembered for December also. So you don't have to enter it after each and every lecture or before each and every lecture. So yep. you don't. Just once is all good. Yep, just enter it once and we have it and then we're good. And again, next next year, now that we understand how things work in the era of COVID, we'll ask for the OE tracker number right when you register. It'll be right in your face. Uh, so, you know, it'll be much, much easier to deal with next year. You know, this was never a problem, for the you know, never a problem before um, because we you always had a testing requirement before, right? So, um, Correct. Yeah, so... And so Richard is actually emailing us that he got logged out and can't get back in. So let's see. I'll go to his lecture. I'll. Uh, is, no, he didn't go in, so I'll try to. I, I didn't get his email yet. Okay. So Maybe if I'm... you're having problems getting in, this is a. I guess I can start over again. And Steve, you can actually get in okay, right? Yep, I'm fine. Yeah, and, so and, everybody, and there's many people in the lectures. I, not not um, uh, as many as the first time, but there's uh, a few hundred people that sprinkled in for the first uh, round. So oh, they were all in there and that they had no trouble. Excellent. So, here. yeah, so let me, I'm going to send, I'll let everyone then, know if you need immediate help. 
uh, if you need immediate help, let's see if Rich is in there now. I'm lo I'm just looking to see if Rich is in the room. Um, just refreshing it. He's not. He was sent. I didn't get the email, so he must have sent it just to you. Uh, so I see it actually in the group chat on uh, on the live stream. So yeah, you see my post on the live stream, on the live stream, but in the uh, sessions. But in any case, there are uh, nobody's complained that they couldn't get in. Who's here? Uh, each room has approximately a uh, hundred people, but less than some. But yep. uh, the, the more um, popular um, lectures, everybody's, uh, all, all the speakers are there, which is great. Okay. Um, yep, and so we'll make sure that make, everybody Make it clear. It. And if you're one of the few people that don't have an OE tracker number, if you put your license number in that um, field uh, update profile, that should be sufficient enough that at least to, you can generate credits for you. Yep. We, of course, can't send them into Arbo if you don't have an OE tracker number, but you can generate a transcript, uh, and you'll have a, a firm hard copy to... Um, show you state board. Exactly. Part of the, the tragedy, of course, of the way the Arbo system works right now is that um, if you enter your license number in, we can actually try to submit that to Arbo and their system can't reject the number that we send them. So in a, in a well, you know, highly functional system, what should happen is if their system recognizes an ID that is not an OE tracker number, it should reject it out of hand quickly, just spit it right back out and say, hey, this isn't an OE tracker number. But as far as I understand, you can submit garbage data to their system and it has a difficult time telling, you know, that, hey, this isn't a valid OE tracker number and then humans have to intervene, which is, I think, part of what's taking them so long to get credits in. If we submit bad data to them. So again, we, because we have such an extreme number of credits here, we, you know, I, we, the Royal, we, I have looked through the spreadsheets before we submit them to make sure that any, any ID number there looks like a valid OE tracker number. Um, but again, you're right, Steve, if, if people just enter their license number, it's good enough for them to go to their certificate page, print them out and submit them to your, your state board. Sure. I use the analogy of you're sending an email and you don't put I at my I often miss it I put this number two there mm -hmm. uh, whatever platform you will say that's not an email address it recognizes it well uh, they have to get their software up to snuff to do that but um, at this point it doesn't matter you will get your credits um, if we have to jump through hoops to get them to you because you didn't have the proper um, uh, information for us we'll still get a few nobody's I don't think nobody's not got their credits. Yeah, no, that's that's the most important thing. I think you're right, is that we're always here to help. So you're not going to not get credits. If you sat through the class, you'll get your credits. It just it may take us a while to actually get them in if you have an exceptional situation like the wrong OE tracker number or just a license number or things like that. Um, it's funny, these systems in general, not just for CUI or Arbo or anything else, systems tend to be very brittle that involve computers, right? It's when you start hitting exceptions that's when problems start, right? If everybody did everything properly the first time <laughs> without exceptions, computers would be great. But it's always these exceptional cases that cause everything to get messed up, um, especially if a system is brittle. And as far as I know, Arbo's system was engineered, what, a decade ago, maybe? Um, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how much they've done in the way of maintenance since then to keep it sort of fresh and to sort of smooth out the rough edges. So I think they rely a lot on their humans to smooth out those rough edges. So. I think that's kind of what you're oh. seeing here. Here's, here's an emergency commute uh, comment. Uh, someone is having trouble getting into a room. Do you right. want to describe how to get into a room? Yeah. So I so yeah. So that was in the chat that I, I mentioned. So oh, so this where do I go into to get into a room? Okay. So you go to first um, log so into to the conference, and then there's a tab for session lobbies. And then after session lobbies, you have a choice of four tracks, and that you just click on the track that you want to go in. You should be in that room. And there's, um, for example, in, in both Nolan's and um, Dr. Madonna's room, there's over 100 people each. So um, they, if they got in, it's using the same software that you're using. Yep. And so Brad, who asked the question here on the live stream, we just sort of. Oh, I didn't. Yep. Yeah. So in our live stream, we have a little chat going. So it's if it's not obvious, let me actually kill this for a second and show people. 
So I'm going to put this up. So at the top of CUR, there's a thing up here that says log in. And if you click there, and actually, hang on for one second, everybody. I'll make this more explicit for everybody, so hold on. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> See, this is uh, working on the fly here, right? So let me... This is so funny. So you're about to see some behind the scenes stuff that sure. you never never knew that you even And just wanted. a little bit of a note. Somebody is... And a few people are having trouble logging in um, on the Firefox uh, platform and they went to Chrome or the Microsoft Edge and they were able to get in. So Firefox might be a little finicky for some reason today. Yeah, I'd recommend using Chrome just because the performance is better too. Okay, so hang on mm -hmm. one second and let me try to fix this for everyone so they can... Okay, so I'm going to make it very clear at the top of the C-Wire website right now <laughs> where you log in. <laughs> there we go, and I'll reload it so everyone can see. Ta-da! So at the very top of the screen, it says registered users click here to log in and enter the conference. Um, and you can see that at the top of the screen. Um, and that's where people can go to, to log in. There you go. So right up there at the top. Or you can click log in here. So lots of different places to log in. Mm -hmm. And when you listen to Dr. Brimmer's lecture, it, um, she's a soft-spoken lady, and so just turn your sound way up and you'll be able to hear it fine because that's a, a, a challenge that we had in, in all our conferences. So, yeah, so uh, she's great, and you could usually hear everything. It, it's just that we always get that, in quotes, complaint. But uh, if you turn up your speaker on your computer, you should be able to hear it fine. Yeah, and the... And, and uh, headphones, of course, do the trick. We, we Yeah, and we redid a couple of the other lectures that they resubmitted to us, Dr. Michaud's lecture. Um, this, this is another like little inside baseball thing here. Because the conference has been running for so long, some of the lecturers had updated information in some of their slides, so they redid a, a couple of them or, or redid uh, the recording. Yep. So like Dr. Michaud's lecture um, was resubmitted to us yesterday, so he's got new stuff up there Ooh. now. So And this, is ha this happens where it's just sort of rolling updates. That's kind of cool One. for us and for our speakers that they re realize that even though we're uh, doing this over a course of only seven, eight months, that some of the, the uh, information is not as timely and they update it. So great um, work by our speakers. Yep. Yeah, they, they want to keep yep. things One, up to date. One item now. It's 12 past the hour. Now if they check in at 12 past the hour, will they still get hourly credits? Probably not. The system will um, probably say that it's a little yeah. short. Uh, so, you know, they may, for this particular lecture, you may just want to hold off and just wait until December, you know, if you really want to get the credit for that. So, um, again, these are Arbo's rules. We didn't create th these rules. We try to just stick as closely as we can to what Arbo wants, uh, for better or worse, right? I mean, people sometimes say, why are you being so strict, you know? <laughs> well, we're being strict because yeah. it's what they, what they demand. And... You know, we try to follow the rules. Okay. And just for your information, Richard Holm is on and he feels happy. He, he thinks the air conditioning is very good in the room also. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me just, you know, we can quickly move on here just to our sponsors. I want to thank all of our sponsors for, for being here again today and, and, you know, participating in this. There's a, um, a lot that goes into creating CUR. Uh, you know, particularly before the lectures even get started, right? You know, we have to create this roster of speakers and get the tech working and everything else. So we couldn't do this without our sponsors. So thank you to them for showing up. I just want to quickly run through each one so everybody gets familiar with who they are and maybe stop by their booths and say hi. Uh, and if you're in the market to buy something, this is a pretty good time, right? So end of year is coming. There are tax advantages, right, to buying capital equipment now. So, you know, check it out. So Marco, and they do have some show discounts. Yep. Yeah. And so I, this is the embarrassing thing. I don't know what all these show discounts are today. I know a few of them because a couple of the companies have gotten in contact with me, but we have so many sponsors. I mean, at this point, it's like me walking around Vision Expo. It's like, I, I don't know, you know, exactly what people are offering day to day. That's why it's so important that you go to the booth because they can let you know, right? You can contact them directly and say, 
you know, figure out exactly what people are offering. But from what I do know, here I can I can share some of them. But thank you to Marco for sponsoring uh, the live stream as usual as they have since 2015. Um, you know, we couldn't couldn't do it without them. They've been very supportive right from the beginning. Marco was our very first sponsor, as a matter of fact. They, you know, gave us the inspiration to do this when we thought it would be a good idea. And they said, why not go for it? Give it a try. See what happens. So in a very real sense, um, you know, we, we couldn't have done this without Marco. So thank you to them. So Optos, makers of wide field cameras that everybody knows and loves. Uh, there are a couple of wide field lectures here today and tomorrow, I believe. I think there's two or three of them. Yes, there are. Uh, and it's about a mm -hmm. wide variety of technologies. They cover Optos, and I'm sure, in, in one or more of them. But go check them out. If you, ha if you don't have a wide field camera yet uh, in your office, this may be the time to invest in it. You know, Steve, I remember when these things first came out, just how... <laughs> <laughs> gigantic they were expensive uh, and expensive and <laughs> yeah it's and more a, more difficult to use um pushing the patient's head against it uh things like that but they've gotten cheaper better and um uh, easier to use for the staff yep, yep. and i, I remember too, when i bought my first optos yeah and i remember in fact when the, they first came out i remember looking inside of one of the machines and i was just horrified by what I saw in terms of complexity. I mean, these are incredible devices. Um, mm -hmm. And now, of course, they're, as the tech has improved, um, you know, they're getting smaller, you know, easier to take the pictures, more reliable and so forth. So check out Optos. They've been evolving over the past decade. Um, yep. So. So, well, actually, to, to divert a little bit, um, uh, I go on all the various sites on Facebook, etc., and now people post pictures showing what they found on their wide field camera, usually the Optos. And they, um, people say, well, you could have found that by dilating the pupil, et cetera. So optometry and maybe even ophthalmology to a certain extent are relying on these wide field imaging systems rather than their own uh, uh, knives and bearskins techniques that we learned in optometry school uh, years ago. So it's becoming, I don't know if they're losing their skills and relying upon these things, but you st should still have those skills basically in case uh, the laser breaks down one day or something like that. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> So it, really, it seems like the younger ODs are now um, defaulting to that. And, for example, like auto refractions, I, they've lost the ability to do retinoscopy. Uh, so my, I'm getting off my uh, soapbox now. Well, I mean, you know, it's kind of like using a stethoscope versus, you know, looking at, at an echo, right? It, you know, mm -hmm. your stethoscope sure. can, if you know what you're listening to, your stethoscope can tell you a, a great deal. You can infer a lot about what you're hearing, but there's nothing that beats actually seeing the blood flowing back and forth through a heart, right? Uh, and I think it's right. it's kind of the same thing where you're right. You know, you sort of lose those those base clinical skills, and you're you're supplementing them mm -hmm. with something that's probably better when it's when you have access to it. Right. Okay, so Conan Medical, makers of a wide variety of devices uh, that you know and love here. Um, I think these specials still apply. If not, you know, I, I apologize for getting it wrong. Um, but, you know, they, what they were offering last month, and I think it's still the same, six months deferred payments, six months no interest on approved credit for all devices, and then low rates for qualified customers. Uh, and they wanted to let everybody know that iKinetics not only qualifies for Section 179, but may also qualify for the ADA tax credit which could be up to $5,000. So again, as the end of the year comes, people are starting to think more and more about uh, tax issues. So um, this might be a good time to, to jump on board if you're looking for equipment. Just to, um, for the masses, a 179 election means if uh, an instrument is uh, $30,000, you could elect to deduct all $30,000 in the year that you purchase it up to December 31st. So it's a if you had a really good year, which I don't know if COVID... Uh, has made that the case, you can um, use that this year, or you could decide to use it in, in subsequent years. So you have the choice of how do you want to depreciate this, these uh, equipment pieces. You know, it's an interesting question. What has COVID really done to a lot of practices? We had that time when everything shut down, but then the government obviously came to support a lot of private practices, right, a lot of industry. And then we saw a lot of deferred um, you know, people got deferred care, but now all of a sudden are streaming back. So net, what will it look like at the end of the year for a lot of people? I don't know. Yep. From what we see on OD Wire, your other site, uh, the feedback from doctors are that they're busier than ever. So I think net, net, it probably won't be a much, uh, a very bad down year because the government stepped in and helped with salaries and, um, and just keeping the, the practices afloat between March and May. And then when things opened up, uh, 
they got busier because of the pent up demand. So hopefully it won't be a negative year. 2020 won't be uh, what we anticipated, but won't be as bad as we anticipated also. I, I think this is going to be a banner year for tax accountants, right? Because they got a lot of work to do <laughs> to figure all this stuff out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, yeah, how they can, I don't even know how if somebody's gotten money is it a loan is it a gift it's because the banks don't even tell you whether you have to repay it right it's going to be a mess so anyway good for the accountants bad for the rest of us I guess um, so Mackie Health um, so makers of supplements and you can see the supplements the different lines mm-hmm. that they make here um, and so Steve I know you used Mackie Health in your office and you can see that they have uh, all all three of the yeah, critical we use carotenoids. The, uh, the lutein. Every day. Uh, yeah. It... yeah. So so I guess this one's different. It's got and the, the from meso... my little clinical studies, it works. It, it seems to slow down. Yep. Yes. Now, there's three um, uh, yellow pigments that help prevent macular degeneration: um, lutein, zeaxanthine, and mesozeaxanthine. Uh, they have the meso in it, which the um, ARADS 2 study didn't recommend, but apparently it's in the very center of the macula and even protects it more so. So I've seen drusen uh, slow down, disappear. I've seen people not progress, um, and it's a win-win. Patients love it. Uh, it's a great profit center, for, we might mention, for the office also. Um, and you're, you're doing something over and above the ARADS 2 study. They have various products. You can have the ARADS 2 with Macula Health. You have various combinations, and a sales rep will, will visit your office or at least talk to you on the phone. And uh, uh, usually, um, if you see what they recommend, they recommend doubling the price, and we have no trouble doing that. Uh, we would sell year supplies. We encourage people to actually buy them in 90-day supplies so they come in or we can uh, mail them to them. So uh, great uh, product. Uh, Dr. Nolan is lecturing uh, as we speak about um, this science in general, but he investigates Mackey Health along with other products because all our lectures have to be um, uh, not plugging one particular product, but definitely something you should consider in your practice. It would fly out. Yep. And you can see some specials here. I'm assuming these are still running, uh, although Mackey Health does tend to rotate their specials quite frequently, so go check them out as well. If you go into mm-hmm. the booth and just drop them a line, they're always there. Very responsive company. Um, you know, if you need to get a hold of them, it's like, like you know, immediately. So to go definitely check them out. Uh, Luno Technology, again, platinum sponsor of the conference. So thank you to them for being part of this. Uh, in addition to, you know, all the different devices, and if you go into their booth, you can learn all about them. You know, we've been doing a series of webinars for them, too, on OD Wire, discussing their tech and their equipment. And I think one of the, the big benefits of what they have and what they do um, you can see the webinar here. It was all about dry eye screening that we did. And we did one just this past week that we're going to show you guys. Um, we have an archive of it that we're going to play today. But it was all about, um, you know, the, the modern way to refract, right? So not hunched over for opter. This is something that you can refract even remotely from a tablet. And, you know, especially in the era of COVID, this is incredibly important, right? Keeping your distance from patients and... This was a really cool lecture because it was talking all about the you know the system that they have that can do it um, and how it actually worked in a, a you know fairly typical private practice in Chicago an urban practice and a suburban practice so you can sort of get a sense of how it might work if you implement it uh, in your office um, you can sort of see what the tablet looks like there curious thing that I, I learned actually from that webinar was that tablet of course is a regular Samsung tablet. Um, cause my, my big question from this stuff is always, what happens if you drop it? <laughs> what, what, seriously, what happens if you drop it or if the battery starts dying? Cause we all have iPads and we know what the deal is, right? Over time, things get worse. Um, apparently they use sort of a, a bog standard Samsung tablet and they can get you a new one rapidly. You know, in fact, the speaker had a problem with his, I think he said he dropped it and they got him one the same day. Um, and in fact, in desperation, there was a case where you could actually just go get a Samsung tablet from like Best Buy and then the company will work you through getting the software onto it so you can get it back up and running. So I thought that was pretty And neat. if you're really anal, just, just have backup in your office. You always can use a tablet someplace else so, or even bring it home for you as a uh, yeah, so, you know, private use. So well, their recommendation, not that expensive yeah, their, to, to their, maintain. Yeah, their recommendation was just when you buy their system, right, the tablet's the cheapest part of it. You have a couple spares in your office. Just leave them in the box. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, because yeah, I mean, that's, that's the easiest way to go, right? Um, so what I really find fascinating about all of this is that the companies are leveraging what consumer tech is really good at, right? They're not trying to reinvent the wheel. 
um, they're using all the power of these tablets and investing most of their resources and their R&D into the optical side of things, right? So leveraging what the companies are bringing and at, you know, at the same time, putting most of their resources into stuff that's important for your office. So I think that's, that's really neat, using this commodity equipment where it's appropriate and then you know saving the resources for the actual equipment itself so um so yeah so we'll play that webinar for you guys later in the in the show today um so they have a whole bunch of programs going on if you go to their website lunotechusa.com and slash uh you can you can check out all of them in fact i'm doing a webinar for them uh this coming week i guess on the 17th as well um, again, looking at their systems and how they're used in two different, completely different kinds of practices. One is a surgical practice. Um, you know, it's a single location with a surgeon and a bunch of ODs. And the other one is an OD who runs 11 locations around Chicago. Um, <laughs> 11 locations with like three ODs. So it's an optical, but she's able to virtually run all of these places and not necessarily be in, in all places at once. So it's an absolutely fascinating uh, webinar because it shows you two very different kinds of practices where this can work. So anyway, looking forward to that show this week. Um, so Hog, makers of the octopus. Again, we were just talking about technology and how things have gotten smaller. Um, so these guys, the octopus, you know, this is one of the first, right? They were innovators um, in this kind of perimetry. And look at how much smaller this thing is now uh, and more compact versus the way it used to be. So definitely go check them out and what and you know what they're up to and you know talk they're going to talk about the evolution of their tech over the years as well in their booth so pretty cool stuff if you're looking to replace your perimeter Neurovisual Neurovisual Medicine Institute so this is an actual physical place that you can go to in Michigan just uh, it's in suburban Detroit about maybe 30 minutes from the airport uh, in the suburbs. And uh, it's a place where you can come and learn all about the identification and treatment of patients with binocular vision dysfunction using fractional units of realigning prism. Um, so using prism to treat a variety of conditions. Uh, and they, they teach you not only the clinical aspect of it, but also how to integrate it into your practice, right? So, you, so how you become expert in this and how you can promote it to patients uh, and use it to build your practice. Uh, I was on the phone with them yesterday, and they wanted to sort of reassure everyone that the clinic is up and running. Obviously, they they practice uh, social distancing and so forth uh, to, to try to minimize the spread of virus, but they are there, and they are working, and everyone's healthy. Um, so if you're interested in this, uh, definitely check out their booth and give them a call. Uh, tear care makers uh, of a device for meibomian gland dysfunction, and you can see um, when these systems can, it uses heat, as you might be able to see here. You you can see uh, you apply heat across the lids to open up the glands, and as you can see by looking at the picture on the screen, these systems are now much smaller than they used to be. Um, it's literally an order of magnitude cheaper than the original devices that came out. Um, I know that it, these used to be six figures, right, when the initial technology came out. Uh, and this, like, I've, like I said, is an order of magnitude cheaper. So it's inexpensive enough for an office okay. to try to give it a shot, even if uh, dry eye isn't their, their sort of primary focus. Um, the idea two is... Other points, um, yep. Two other points, the disposables, the actual doing of the treatment is much cheaper than the more expensive devices. And I believe a side-by-side -side study was done with this product versus the more expensive ones, and they came out equal, which is, uh, so if you're getting something that's cheaper, uh, less disposables, and that does the same job, well, it's a slam dunk. Correct. I think that was called the Olympia study that came out this past summer, I believe. Correct. And yeah, they, they showed equal efficacy to the other more expensive devices. So um, definitely something to check out if you want to get involved in, in treating it. And frankly, if you treat any sort of dry eye, having a device like this one or another competing one is crucial, right? Because I know, Steve, as, as we've spoken yep. before, you use different modalities on the same patient to try to get the best effect. Sure. And, uh, I mean, at the beginning, before these devices came out, or before when they were too expensive, we actually were doing uh, just heating the lids with Brutamass and then using one of these um, uh, 
devices, the, the pliers that you see here to squeeze out the glands. It worked, but uh, it didn't work as effectively, and it was kind of painful for the patient. So now uh, it's become easier and cheaper, sure. You, yeah. have, you have to have something in your office, and there's no reason why a general practitioner can't have this. You don't have to be a, a dry eye specialty clinic. Yep, and apparently patients like it. It's a very relaxing thing. You sit there, it doesn't hurt or anything, and you can just kind of chill out while, while this is being done. So... Um, uh-huh. Yeah, and, and I think the thing, other reason that patients like it so much is that the, you know, the, the effect is tangible, right? Like you can see what the, the, the junk that comes out um, when, you, when you do these treatments, and I think patients sort of like that. Oh, so you, you know, it's, it's, it's something where you can visibly say... You can show it, and then actually in the testing... Yep. Like, for example, if you do a, a, a tear breakup time afterwards, and you compare it to before, and you happen to have anterior segment uh, photography, you can show them how their tears are uh, not evaporating as much because they've got that nice uh, mybome coming in yep. that, was, that was all clogged up. So it's immediate self-gratification in terms of what you're showing the patient, and they should feel a benefit. I mean, they always will say they feel better right away, but they're in an office. It's not a, a challenging environment. But when they go outside and they come back in a week uh, as a follow-up visit, you can really uh, see a difference. Yeah, absolutely. So definitely everyone should check them out um, and give them a shot. So VTI Natural View, so the makers of the Natural View uh, multifocal one-day lens. So Steve, I know you use this lens as well. Uh, a lot of people use this for myopia control, um, even though it's it's an off-label use. Uh, but people are using this lens for, for myopia control just because of its design. Well. Well, essentially everything except for the MySight lens that was recently approved for Cooper Vision is an off-label use. Orthokeratology, uh, vision therapy, um, uh, multifocal glasses, etc. This has a profile, though, that seems to work in terms of what the signs wants it to do. So it, it stops the uh, peripheral hyperopathy focusing. You don't have to remember what that does, but we started using it because it seemed to do, do the best of all the multifocal lenses. It's a good multifocal to begin with, just for your presbyopic patients, uh, but for myopia control, it's our go-to lens now at this point in time, um, even with the MySight. Yep. So definitely check them out. Check out their booth. They usually run specials, um, you know, and I don't know <laughs> don't know what they are today because I haven't actually spoken with the folks, but go into their booth and see. Uh, Zeiss. They're very easy to deal with, so oh, yeah, no they, problem. Yep, they're, they are definitely easy to deal with. So, so Zeiss. Uh, makers of the equipment we all know, know and love, including their OCT units and their new wide field camera, the Claris. Um, so thank you to Zeiss for sponsoring the conference. They've been with us now for the last several years, and they're always great to work with. Zeiss, you know, they, as the pandemic started, Zeiss really um, tried to move all their operations virtual, right? So they have a huge number of educational resources on their website. So if you go to Zeiss.com, you can actually go to this this uh, this one page that they have, and I'll pull it up later so people can see it, where they have all information about the pandemic, about how to sterilize your equipment. Um, they have shields that they have for sale, so you can get these these clear plexiglass shields that will go over uh, various models of equipment, not just Zeiss's actually. They have like slit lamp shields and so forth that, that work on a variety of models. So they've really sort of gone above and beyond when the pandemic started to give people the resources they need to get their practice back up and running. So definitely check out Zeiss. Also, if you haven't seen the Claris camera in action, you should definitely check out a few pictures of it. It's kind of amazing. Um, again, this is yep. another another one of those cameras where, you know, in the old days it was huge and took forever to get an image, and now it's tiny. Um, we have some footage here, actually, of people who use who put the Claris out in their parking lot <laughs> to do socially distant <laughs> pre-testing, and um, it works. And kudos for them. They were the first to come out with the shields for the slip lamp, giving them to the ODs and ophthalmologists uh, for free at the very beginning of the pandemic. They were great. They they got it up and running within a couple of weeks, I yep. believe. Yeah, kind, kind of amazing that they were able to, to work so quickly. So kudos to them. So AB Max, so you, uh, you can tell this by looking at the picture here. This is sort of the next generation device uh, for treating anterior blepharitis. Looks like a little Dremel tool. Um, and that's kind of <laughs> kind of how it functions. Um, I'm not sure what their specials are today. I, what I can tell you about the AB Max, though, is that it's much cheaper than the first generation device, and the consumables, I believe, are about half the cost. So even if you're using a first generation device, which, by the way, you know, has fewer modes of operation and so forth, even if you have the first generation device, it may even be cheaper to acquire an AB Max if you use it a lot, because the consumable consumables are so much cheaper than the old device. Um, 
That's exactly what we used, did in our office. We had the first device, and we segued to the AB Max just because consumables were so expensive. Plus, the device is slightly different in how you do it, and it's actually a little bit easier to do. It's um, uh, a fun uh, experience for the patients. They experience a little tickle. Um, so now we, we're using it 100% of the time, and the old device is now um, a planter in the middle of uh, the office. <laughs> right. So definitely recommend it. And they're very easy to deal with. Um, if you um, go to their booth, I'm sure they have show specials. They always do. And the, in fact, the owner of the company was the original developer of the original device. So he knew what it was about, and he made it better. That's true. He he held the patents actually on the original device. So yeah. So mm -hmm. you're you when you when you deal with him, you're dealing with someone who actually knows you know the the ins and outs of the thing. Um, they also train you can train your staff via Zoom sessions, um, and give you a cute little certificate at the end that people can then hang up in your office. Because the idea is that you don't necessarily want the doctor doing this. I mean, you can right. But it's easy enough and, you know, simple enough that your staff can do it as well. And you don't have to worry about hurting the patient because, as you mentioned, Steve, it doesn't really hurt. It just tickles a little bit. Yeah. What we did at the beginning is the doctors were doing it. We felt comfortable. It was an easy technique. And the, we segued to the staff. And they now do it. It's almost like a um, phlebotomist taking blood versus the doctor. They're better than I am because they do, you know, more of them a day. Yep. So NeuroLens, so they are, uh, they make a device, as you can see it there, to measure misalignment between the two eyes and then develop custom lenses with contoured prism uh, to try to treat a wide variety of conditions, including headaches and eye strain. Uh, so if you've never seen this in action before, the patient essentially sticks their head in that thing um, and then they do a series of automated tests. It's kind of, kind of cool. They get these patterns that they look at um, and then the machine spits out a prescription that then NeuroLens can fill in their own lab. So they have the special lab that can make these lenses uh, with this contoured prism. And you know, I have a pair of them here. They, they work really well. I actually have an office pair um, that, that just has some prism built into it and not much else. And, and maybe it's like a, a quarter diopter. Um, so sort of a computer lens for me. And you know, the optics are great. So you definitely want to check them out um, and see if it would be useful for your patients. And they had a, a special, you know, running last year about no payments till the end of the year. I'm not sure what they're doing right now uh, because I haven't been in contact with them. But uh, you might want to go into their booth and see what's happening with them. So Oculus, makers of a wide variety of devices, including the Pentacam, which many folks are now using to, to fit scleral lenses, and the Keratograph. So if you're dry eye practice, this is, again, another Swiss Army knife that you can use. That's the great thing about their devices is that they, they most of them are multifunction. Um, and the, what I really like about Oculus is, you know, they're a large company, but they're a small company. They're a German company. You know, you, you think that they're this big and personal company, but the reality is their U.S. unit is right out, headquartered out here in Seattle. You know, the CEO of the company is, is there setting up their booth at all the trade shows. Uh, they're very easy to work with, and they take feedback about their devices very seriously. You know, we know many docs on OD Wire who work with Oculus's devices every day, and when they offer feedback to Oculus, you'll typically see that feedback integrated into the software. And software patches come directly from the doctors who, who are using this to try to help them, you know, perhaps make a better scleral lens. Um, so definitely check them out as well. Um, they have an open box sale on the Easy Field S. So $59.95 plus six months warranty. Um, it's funny, their service center is right again out here in Seattle. Um, so you're not dealing with stuff that's coming over from Germany. You know, you're dealing with what, what very much feels like a local company here in the U.S. You know, incredibly easy to deal with and, and to get a hold of their executives if you need them. So, so definitely check them out. And, the, and their field tester is not just a secondary field tester. You could, it could be your main one in your office. It could be uh, the secondary one. Uh, you could treat glaucoma. It has all the bells and whistles that uh, some of the more expensive devices have. We, I, we have in our office as a secondary one, but we use, it was primary before. We just needed the second unit because of the amount of field testing we do. But for that price and for the portability, you could even take it to a nursing home, or you can take it to a person's house if somebody is, is bedridden and, and do a field test. Yeah, this this picture actually doesn't do it justice. I wish I had a better picture of it because you can see it's tiny. I mean, for especially for a field tester, it's small. Uh, and you can do it in daylight, yep. which is kind of cool, too. Probably weighs about 15 pounds, if that. Yep. So it's really easy to move around. Yeah. 
Okay, so science-based health maker of Hydro Eye. So this is a supplement for dry eye. So they make a wide variety of supplements, but we're going to talk about Hydro Eye here specifically. Um, so they are an interesting company because, as their name implies, they look at all the latest clinical research before they formulate um, a supplement. And as the research changes, they'll update their formula as well, just based on the latest research. So when you work with them, you sort of know... When, when you look at the ingredient list, you can get a real sense of the fact that they're up on the latest research and will make changes based on that. So uh, you can sort of safely recommend this to your patients that, that at the very least you know that they're going to use the latest and greatest science to go into each one of their supplements. So check out Hydro Eye and check out their booth to see what the latest specials are um, on their supplements as well. Covalent Careers is so the largest job site uh, in eye care, and so if you're looking to hire an optometrist, or maybe you're looking for a new job, or you're looking for an optician, this is a place to put up your listings. Um, the way it works with Covalent is that, you know, the question always is, well, who's going to see these things, right? The answer is the way Covalent works is you you put up an ad with them, but your ad goes elsewhere. So, let me give you a concrete example of this. So on OD Wire, you can see that there's a jobs link here. When we pull this up, this actually goes into Covalent Careers engine. You can see here, so they're actually stuffing ads from their engine into OD Wire. And they do this in a variety of outlets, not just with us. Uh, they do it all over the place. So that's how you know your ad's gonna get the maximum amount of visibility. Um, you can see here they have a million ads uh, looking for uh, optometrists. Um, so you can actually go to them right now, and, and if you want to place an ad, you can get 10% off monthly job listings. Just go to odwire.org slash jobs, click that link, and you'll get 10% off when you list with them. So definitely check them out. And... A lot of sponsors. We do. I mean, yeah, it's, it's been a crazy year. So I care live. So uh, makers of a telehealth platform specifically for eye care. So now we're getting to the point in the pandemic, as you know, things have matured, this has been going on for a long time now, where the government is and the insurers are now going to get to a place where the Wild West is drawing to a close. Um, the idea that you can just, you know, do telehealth using Zoom and nothing else that's drawing to a close. People want more thorough documentation of these visits and a platform like I Care Live gives you automated ways to document your visits um, because they give you an entire platform for doing telehealth so instead of just randomly using Zoom you use a tool like I Care Live which documents everything because you know you will eventually get audited right this will happen whether it's the federal government or a private insurer, people are going to want to know that you're actually documenting these exams properly. And a platform like iCare Live gives you that functionality. So whether you go with iCare Live or, or another platform, the idea that you can just randomly do telehealth without a platform behind you, I think those days are drawing to a close. Makes sense. And look, it saves the insurance company money. Patients are uh, not as reticent to do things online as to go into an office nowadays, and who, who knows how long that's going to last. Right. So I mean, definitely uh, consider it. I mean, here in Oregon, of course, we now just had a so-called freeze, right? And I'm sure this is happening everywhere in the country now, too, where, you know, we were trying to sort of ease back into something that resembled normal life, and now that's totally stopped again. Um, so what that means, like I know that um, elective procedures at all of our healthcare facilities are on hold. So for all you LASIK doctors out there, I feel for you. You're going to go on a little vacation whether you wanted to or not. Um, but, you know, what that means for routine care, again, I think a lot of people are going to try to stay home whenever they can, at least for the next, they told us here, at least for the next month. So, you know, I'm certain it's happening elsewhere. Well, based on vaccines and treatments, I think it'll be most most likely three or four months yep. before things start getting better, if they are. Yeah. So anywhere, pl anywhere, a platform like iCare Live is really something you should implement. You know, if you don't do this one, something similar, because it, it will be, you know, it'll pay you back in spades by having it, especially as, you know, we're navigating sort of this new normal. Uh, so I Care Pro, so they make websites and social media platforms uh, specifically for I Care. So they understand exactly what I Care websites and social media presences need. And basically you outsource it to them and they handle all of the nonsense. And I say nonsense because as someone who runs a website, I know that there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that you actually have to take care of. And if you're not on top of it constantly, 
it can overwhelm you. I mean, you, you know, your site could have problems or in this particular case, what they've been focusing on a lot are your, your reviews like in Google. So if people pull up a map like an Apple Maps or Google Maps and they're starting to list businesses on there, if they see that your business has like a three star review, people are just going to you know, pass right over. They're not going to even give it a second look. So iCare Pro can help you manage those reviews to make sure that you're not getting the three stars, right? That you're not getting crackpots posting reviews, that you're not just getting disgruntled people posting reviews, right? That you're getting your, your happy patients to post as well because you need that to balance out the reviews and give people a, a more realistic picture of what's happening in your office. And so iCare Pro can help with all of that. So definitely go check them out. So Lacrovera makers of punctal plugs, uh, among other things, and they have a huge laundry list of show specials. I believe the special's still good. You can look up on the screen and see it. Uh, punctal plugs, it's funny, they went for a while out of fashion. Now they're coming back into fashion. <laughs> Um, you know, yep. as, as people have gotten better at determining who is actually a good candidate for plugs, right? There was always that subsection of, sub, you know, subsection of patients that were, right? But they were difficult to identify. Um, and now I think people are also, getting better. Also, at we're it. getting better. We're getting better with our treatments. And we used to plug people up when their tears were not what they should be. And now we're getting the tears uh, into better confirmation with uh, pharmaceuticals and treatments. And now the plugs will work better when you have nice tears that you're keeping in the eye rather than crummy tears, for lack of a better word. Yep. So so definitely check them out. they got a lot of stuff going on and a lot of discounts for wire folks. So optometry time. So Gretchen Bailey, I don't think can make it here today. Hopefully she'll show up, maybe. Um, but you mm -hmm. know, so optometry times, practical chair side advice. So, you know, you, you may have read their journal. They have these little bite sized articles that they have. They don't have any sort of grand, you know, 20 page long. <laughs> You know, these, these scientific types, types of articles, no. Everything they have is practical. So practical chair side advice. Short articles meant to be bite-sized. Um, as Gretchen likes to say, her journal is meant to be read and then thrown away. Um, it's not something that you're going to keep for 30 years on your shelf. And the all, advice is all designed to be practical. So definitely check out their website, optometrytimes.com. Uh, and you may also, of course, have seen the, the print journal as well. Although, you know, between yeah. all of us, I'm not sure how print is doing these days versus digital. Um, it's, been a, it's been a while, actually, since I've even seen a print journal now, since I haven't been going to any trade shows. <laughs> uh, well, they all come. A view of optometry, optometry management, the, uh, optometry times, they all come still. And uh, let's face it, their business is selling advertising. So yep. um, that's, I think in print, you get uh, a little bit more bang for your buck. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yep. Yeah. I've saved a few of them because uh, there's some famous authors that I look at when I uh, read. Them. <laughs> yeah, like like Silverberg. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. I forgot about him. Yeah. <laughs> So Optometry Times, check them out. Vision Equipment Inc., this is Leo Hadley's company. They deal in refurbished equipment. So especially now, uh, Leo's got a pretty good inventory of very lightly used equipment that he then refurbishes and resells. So if you're looking to expand now, and, you know, people were laughing. They're like, what do you mean expand now, you know, with the way things are going? Well, the pandemic will end. Um, this, this really will come to an end. And, you know, this might be a time to actually take advantage of everything Right. If you have a lull right now, especially if we're going back into a period uh, across the country where things might be slowing down or getting you know, locked down a bit more, this may be time to reassess. Uh, and if you're looking to expand or, or you know, build out a new lane, you, 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 know, you may want to consider using refurbished equipment instead of something that's, that's brand new. Um, and if you are, you might want to check out Vision Equipment because Leo thoroughly refurbishes everything he sells and, and backs it 100%. Unfortunately, the beginning of the pandemic, there, there'll be trade-ins. Right. So with Leo, he's he's been with us now as a, a sponsor for well over 10 years. Yep. Never a complaint about Leo. But more important, uh, if you buy something from him and you have old equipment that, uh, you, you know, what, what are you going to do with it? Uh, Leo uh, will take the trade-in yep. and he'll refurbish it for someone else. Yep. So with the... Everybody wins. Yep. 
yeah, so definitely give Leo a call. He's really easy to work with. He, and again, as, as Paul mentioned, no one's ever complained about him, which is amazing in the 10 years we've been working with him. Um, you know, he's he one of the veterans of the industry of refurbishing, certainly. I know he got his start in edgers. And boy, you want to talk about complicated pieces of equipment. Uh, it was kind of amazing, actually. He's got some, I think, some videos on YouTube or uh, even on his own site where they show how they strip down these edgers and it's kind of amazing to watch how they refurbish them. I don't know. I find those kinds of videos relaxing where people tear apart uh, machinery and then put it back together. <laughs> Your mileage may vary. Um, okay. And finally, I, way, want, mm -hmm. I just wanted to add that when you're buying an edger, um, technology is good, but the support is, is, imperative to get because often they go down and if you have to wait two weeks for somebody to come to your office uh, so uh, be careful when you're buying that you make sure they're going to give you good support yeah you know what i think that's good advice for anything that has a lot of moving parts mechanical systems um i think you know people yep. tend to downplay it but support in those situations is so so vital right because anything with moving parts is going to require service at some point and especially edgers because they are really complicated machines so absolutely and i know leo by the way has no. a huge inventory of these things so and he's an expert so you yep. might want to go check it out okay and i would be remiss if i didn't mention this so <laughs> despite the fact that everyone loves ce wire 2020 it is drawing to a close um, and it's been going on way longer than we ever thought it would. And once we finish in December, we're going on hiatus uh, and we're creating CEY 2021, where we're going to have 60 all new lectures, right? Totally brand new. Um, so four live events and one low price. So the idea is that according to Arbo, and this is what they told me, um, these rules where you can do live CE online as live, those rules, these temporary rules, are going to revert at the end of June. Now, I don't know if that's true. If they're going to continue it further, I guess it's going to depend on how the pandemic goes. But as of right now, um, by the end of June, these rules are going to disappear. And again, you're going to need to do testing online. It's not going to count as live credit. So what we plan to do for 2021 <coughs> is have four live events for CEY 2021, March, April, May, and June. So to give people the maximal number of credits that they can get before the rules revert. Um, so it's going to be four live events and one low price. Again, you sign up for one and you can attend all four. So you can try to maximize the number of credits that you get. And yep, you should be able to take all 60 with the four um, events. Yep. And so more information will be coming very soon about the actual dates. We're going out of our way not to hit any holidays. <laughs> <laughs> not to hit any sporting events, not to hit any other conferences, because there are major national conferences that are now claiming that they want to have in-person events in May and in June. Um, I don't know. <laughs> you um, know we're, yeah, one of them is, uh, the Vision, well, we can mention the Vision Expo East yeah. in New York, and I don't see, they, they usually come in March, in the March, but they postponed it until May, and I'm an hour outside New York, there's just no way the governor, if, if it's anywhere near what it is now, is going to allow the Javits Center to open and to have 10,000 people milling about, even with masks on. Uh, so um, I'll take that under advisement whether they have the live conferences. Yeah, because I mean, you know, there's there's the other ones like SECO also, which is scheduled for in Atlanta, what was that, at the end of April. And again, I just don't know. Uh, it seems like it's a little too, I don't know, too soon. Uh, depending on how quickly a vaccine yep. can get out there, I just. But anyway, we're going to respect their dates because they have they have published dates, and what we're going to do is stay away from those dates, uh, on the assumption that these events will happen. So we're not scheduling CUR for any of those weekends. Um, so you can you know feel confident if you sign up for it and you still want to go to these other in-person events, you can. We're not going to interfere with those at all. Um, the AOA I think has pushed their meeting to June 24th to 26th as well. Uh, and so we're going to yep. do the final CUR 2021 earlier in June. So again, we're we're going to miss that. But so. you, just to be complete, go ahead, Star. Go, go uh, just to be complete, I'll, I'll just finish up. Um, the one low price includes <laughs> the on-demand version of our um, event 
in between the live events. So you can take from March through June and the June things on demand or go to the live events also, depending on what your state uh, board requires. And so you have plenty of time to take all the courses for both credits and for education. Some of these courses are just great educationally if you just want to have a, a lecture and it's there for your, your taking just for that one low price that we're going to uh, put up in March. Yep. For March. Yeah, that, yeah. That's, a, that's a good point. And, and just, just, mm-hmm. Yeah, also, also just, to, just to remind everyone, state boards have a change of heart based on uh, current events. So you, it may be that your state board is going to change their mind and allow more credits for the next six months going in from January to June. So keep checking with your state board to see what, what's allowed. But while we're, we're here, uh, through 2020, remember that uh, the booths are open right through December 31st. And there's two things you should consider. Number one, the uh, the vendors have gotten a tremendous bargain uh, to allow exhibits for four shows. Uh, so they've saved a tremendous amount of money on setup and on payments to us, which should uh, change convert into a low price for you. So go to the vendors. Don't be afraid to say, is that the best you can do, <laughs> as you do with a car dealer, <laughs> and see what sort of price you're going to get uh, from the vendor. Uh, so, uh, and, and also, don't forget there's a new administration coming in uh, if, for the federal government, and you want to take care of it. To take every tax benefit you can this year because you never know what 2021 will, will be as far as tax benefits. So buy as much as you can this year. That's true. That's I mean, my little advice. Yeah. So, you know, you have the certainty, you know, the tax laws are right now. So if you're thinking about buying, this may, may not be a terrible time to do it um, because it's not really clear what the tax situation is going to be going forward. So just something to think about. Yep. I think that will be determined by the two um, uh, Senate elections in Georgia. If one of them goes um, uh, red, then I think the tax laws will be more stable than if they both go to Democrats, and in which case, um, I think <laughs> well, I paying think, a lot more capital gains. I think, I think, and I think it's going to be challenging though to figure out, especially with the pandemic, right? I think that's going to factor in a lot as well. I think the situation is so unclear right now because we don't know how bad things sure. are going to get over the next couple of months. Um, and what it's going to do to the economy. So I think we're all just in a holding pattern. You know, my, my I'm hopeful that we can kind of beat this thing back a little bit here during the winter. And now that the governors across the country are, you know, getting a little more serious in places, just saying, hey, you know, we got to slow down and hopefully a vaccine will get out there. You know, it's, it's kind of like a race now, isn't it? Between how quickly this virus can yep. spread versus how quickly that vaccine can get out to the community. So I'm just going to keep my fingers crossed. And if you read one e-zine from somebody who's nationally famous today, uh, he was of the opinion that a coronavirus vaccine will work, but only temporarily so, based on the science of flu vaccines, which are coronaviruses. So that's a little scary, that they'll come out with vaccines that work, that uh, do a good job, but this can be something you have to take every year uh, to keep it under control. So that's yet to be determined, the science, but it's... Um, he's a pretty bright guy who mentioned all this. Well, you know what's fascinating? You read the e-zine today? Yeah, what's fascinating to me, though, about this entire thing, not only the speed with which they've created these vaccines, is the type of vaccines, right? That Pfizer vaccine, that's an, it's an mRNA vaccine, right? It's something that's never been done before. Yep. <laughs> so It's I'm, amazing. Yeah. That's why I lectured on genetics, and this, the other two vaccines by Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca are um, AV vector vaccines, where they put the virus in the... Um, in the basically adenovirus and that gets incorporated into the genome rather than getting very complicated i like the first two approaches first with the uh, messenger rna it seems much more safe um and it stimulates the body to produce antibodies to the coronavirus the second two i'm a little bit scared i, I might not take that vaccine but the first two approaches uh, the first two that are coming out look um a lot safer than me just my opinion well, you know what's amazing As to the, me, too, about the mRNA. Yeah, I mean, the mRNA vaccine, you can tell me, but it seems like if this approach actually works for this coronavirus, this could be used for a wide variety of viruses going forward. Literally, and, you could stamp it out for almost, yeah, almost yeah. every virus, yep. Yeah. And you could stamp it out and get things approved quickly. And because it's so safe, because what it's doing is not going to create the disease in your body, if at, at worst it won't work, 
at best, it'll work, and you don't have to worry about safety profiles. Yep. But you think so about the number uh, of, of coronaviruses that are out there or other viruses that are similar, and it's kind of amazing to think about. They, Pfizer, in, in fact, could have like a, like a machine literally set up, right, to handle so many mm-hmm. different viruses just using the similar technology. So pretty cool stuff. Right. And even mutations of the coronavirus and other viruses, it could, uh, I mean, it'll be expensive to switch gears, but they could make another messenger RNA incorporating the, um, the sequences that they need to uh, circumvent the new virus. So um, that's going to be a whole new field of virology that might help us in various other diseases. Uh, there's uh, human papillomaviruses, there's various other viruses that are devastating to and, and cause cancers, etc. So uh, hopefully this will be a new paradigm that coronavirus might actually become a benefit rather than a detriment yep. long term. Yep. I mean, it, it accelerated so much of the research. So I'll, I'll just keep my fingers crossed that, you know, Pfizer can do this, get the vaccine out there, because uh, I'm really curious to see what's going to happen. I guess I guess they, the plan is to get it out to healthcare professionals first and then the rest, the rest of the population. Yep. But meanwhile, wear a mask, wash your hands yep. and stay away from crowded places. And take advantage of, you know, I was so happy to see that Costco is finally doing home deliveries. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, not only that, but I was able to get that 495 chicken home delivered. Here we go. From Costco. <laughs> so, so take advantage of it. Stay out of those crowded it, places. It always comes back to the chicken. <laughs> yeah, but no, no. Also, the these 50-pound boxes of logs. <laughs> Imagine taking those those pre-made logs. They weigh about fifty pounds in a box and have to carry that home. And so let somebody else. Did you have do to it. get twelve chickens, though. Paul? You have to get twelve chickens. <laughs> no. Nope. Well, really? Now they have, have bulk. Believe it or not, my wife ordered ten boxes of logs. With uh, I think there are twelve logs in each box. So we're set for the winter. Great. <laughs> with pre-made logs. Oh my God. <laughs> You know, the only question is how how who's going to carry them up from the, the storage in the garage? I, to I the think fireplace? I think I know. Unfortunately, who's going to get that job? I have a feeling. <laughs> no, 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 no. We have. <laughs> I don't want to give you a hernia. Yeah. We're going to hire. <laughs> Uh, we'll have Reed do the whole Tom Sawyer thing. There you go. <laughs> Make him think it's fun. I mean, I'm just waiting for him to go He's through. Pu- I'm waiting for him to go through puberty so I can hand off all of these tasks to him. Like you know, just uh, anything that requires physical strength. So, yep. Uh, man. All right. So hopefully, uh, this gives everyone a sense of what's going on here today. Um, you know, at at the show. Uh, we have a bunch of webinars here too that I'd love to show people. And Steve, by the way, is everything going okay at the show right now? I think everything's uh, smooth as silk. Um, people know how to get their credits. Um, a few people asked about when they don't have OE tracking numbers from Canada, especially, and answered their questions. Uh, the speakers are fine. Uh, one speaker does speak low, and uh, I explained <laughs> his headphones and. He or she will agree that she, she has a whole new setup next year for uh, microphones, et cetera. So she's aware of the problem. So Good. spoken a uh, young person. Yeah. So. Um, again, no, this move is still now, More people are anticipated. There's about 400 in the rooms now and coming, okay. coming, because uh, the West Coast is yeah, still too early for them. It's now one minute past the hour. So if you want to get credit, get to that course right now. Don't yep. wait. Yep. So, and by the way, I just want to show people the schedule here again. Let me see if I can uh, bring it up just to show people. Um, so you can sort of see what's going on here today and tomorrow. You may have noticed that we have fewer classes in this particular November session. Uh, there were a few people who couldn't make it this time. And so, you know, they, they just, because you think about it, we've done this like eight times or whatever it is. So we, sometimes people can't make it. So we had a few speakers who couldn't make it. But every track, you know, there will be a class going on every hour on the hour, no matter what. Um, sometimes though there are a couple of hours where there's only like two lectures running at a time, um, so you can check. It's that also out. understood people are back to work now on Saturday, especially so they what they could make before when we were all closed down they can't make now. Uh, but we have 95 percent of our lectures, and uh, I don't think it'll be a problem getting what you want to uh, do in terms of what your educational needs are. Yep, and again, we're going to be back in December. I'll try to make sure that, you know, I'll, I'll beg and plead for people to show up or try to, you know, flip our schedule around to adjust for what people need so we'll get the full schedule going one final time uh, in December. And please, we've tried to listen to the audience. Uh, people requested narcotics lectures. We have them up. 
Uh, people requested lectures on orals. We have pretty much uh, a lot of states satisfied. Uh, we're going to have a, traf a trafficking lecture, which a couple of states require also. So if there's any other needs that a specific state requires, please let us know, and we'll be glad to get a speaker who's an uh, uh, expert in the field of that particular part. Yep. Okay. Okay, so. let me get um, in all the rooms here putting the information again so people know what to do. Good. Excellent. Yeah, no, things things are looking pretty pretty good, like they're uh, working pretty well. So um, for right now, then, what I think I'd like to do is maybe we can show people a little webinar while we take a little break here. Perhaps I can show them uh, the Jones webinar that we did last week. I don't know if you guys were able to catch that. I think, Paul, you saw it. Um, all oh, the yeah. Lunar Technologies' uh, latest, uh, div you know, devices for social distancing and refraction. So kind of a cool system used in a variety of settings. I think it would be pretty interesting for people to see. So I think what I'm going to do maybe is put that up on the screen so people can see it. Um, and then we'll come back in about, uh, what time is it? It is... Nine o'clock our Three time. Past the hour. Yeah, so this is about forty-five minutes. So we'll be back in about forty-five minutes, and then we can pick things up and see how things are going. So uh, see you guys in a few minutes, I guess. Okay. See bye you bye. then. Bye. Hey everyone, it's Adam Farkas. Welcome to another OD Wire webinar. Thank you for uh, coming out. You know, I know that the pandemic obviously is still raging on across the country, but as we've seen on ODYR, people's practices are, are rebounding in a lot of different ways, depending on your location. Uh, and we have a lot of folks on the site who tell us that they've never been busier, in fact, because there was so much pent up demand. At the same time, people are also telling us, you know, their, their gross has been dropping a little bit, even though the demand has been high, perhaps due to slowdowns in their opticals or because they're starting to get these holes in their schedules when people are canceling. So the rate of cancellation has been higher for a lot of people across the country. So, you know, there are all these new challenges that we're all facing, you know, adjusting the way we work during the pandemic. And that's really what uh, the show tonight is all about. It's all about how to, you know, transform your practice using new digital tools and try to run more efficiently, which everyone sort of has to do now. Uh, in the era of COVID. And specifically, we're going to be talking about a, a digital refraction system, the, the Visionics of VX65 by Luno Technology. That's, you can sort of see the picture of the tablet up on the screen today. Uh, and we have you know, a special guest here who actually uses the system. And he's going to talk to us all about how he's sort of transformed his practice using technology. Before I introduce our speaker tonight, just a reminder to everybody, you can see on the right side of your screen, there's a box that says questions. If you have a question throughout the webinar uh, tonight, just type your question in there. I'll hold it aside. And at the very end, I'll ask the speaker uh, the questions so we can have a little back and forth at the end. And I guess that is about it for now. So let me introduce our guest tonight. So we have Dr. Jordan. Jones, who is an optometrist and director at Wear Eyewear in the Chicagoland area. Their practice uh, actually has two locations. So there's one in Chicago proper in the downtown area, uh, and then one on the south side in Orland Park. So his practice is a full scope optometry practice with sort of a high-end optical at both locations with two ODs and six opticians. So his practice might look very similar to yours. Um, so I think it's a really great thing that we can actually talk to him about how he's using this technology to improve his practice. And the fact that he has two locations, I think, makes it even more interesting. So with all my blabbing out of the way, Dr. Jones, why don't you take it away? All right. Thanks, guys. And thank you, everybody, for kind of joining us today. As Adam said, uh, we will be talking today about specifically Leno Technologies and the Visionic VX65. But I'm also going to kind of just generally and broadly kind of overview how and what we have done to, as you can see, kind of future-proof our practice and try to stay ahead of the curve, which in this case with the pandemic has actually served us pretty well from the jump. The agenda that we'll go through tonight, we'll kind of start obviously with the introduction, go through kind of our journey as, as, as our optical and as our practice into an integrated patient experience, kind of rethinking the, the usual, kind of the, the old school, new school thought, if you will. And then moving forward in our, our air quotes, again, our new normal, whatever that is, and as it's ever changing day by day, and how I believe that kind of this, the advancements and the technology and everything that we have with, with our Visionics uh, equipment really allows us to do what I think is the most important thing, and that's really work on the patient education, allowing us to have more time for that. And then how that translates into 
helping the bottom line of the practice, which we all need and want, especially in the eras of shutdowns and everything else that we have going on. We'll finish with the recap and then go through the questions that you all have. That's me or a younger version of me when I had a little bit more hair. As we go through this, I was 12 years in practice. I graduated from ICO in 2008, stayed in the Chicagoland area. Um, as Adam said, director of eye care at Wear Eyewear. We have two locations. Again, one right downtown in the heart of River North and one in a uh, southwestern suburb, which is far more kind of family practice. I'd say the River North practice, a little different than the, the, the far south side and the suburban practice. So again, I think we have an interesting perspective on things. And then just about me, I, I truly am passionate about educating the patients about their system and kind of the overall health. And most importantly, I'm a full-time dad, 24-7, literally up until one minute before this phone call. I was changing diapers and making dinner. So that's how life is. Our personal journey into an integrated patient experience. We started, and I'll say again, kind of the, the, the global we, before I was even involved with, with the practice and with where I wear, it was started by two opticians. And they were under the guise of, again, kind of the high-end optical, no doctor involved. Let's get outside scripts and, and let's fill that and just kind of be the go-to place for a high-end optical in River North in Chicago. Um, as kind of the year one turned to year two, they started to realize that people were asking to have a doctor in the office. Like, hey, can I get my exam here as well? And they realized that they were missing out a little bit on something. So as basically an afterthought, they, they decided to add a doctor part-time, you know, kind of as many of us do with, you know, a day a week, a couple hours here or there to just try to start seeing where that went. Had basically free donated equipment that they got through, you know, networks that they knew, old stuff, again, everything that, you know, barely still worked, but someone was willing to give to them. And the doctor started kind of practicing out of a closet and, and doing the very basic, basic kind of bare minimum with the old school technology. I mean, we're not talking she tonometry, but pretty dang close to that. I came into it and was, you know, kind of wedged into that closet and had just graduated in 08 and kind of had seen some of the newer stuff and saw what was out there. And, and I really kind of pushed to say, hey, you know, as we're going here, if, if we're really going to make this into, you know, an optical as well as a full service kind of in full scope optometry practice, we really need to kind of upgrade. And rather than upgrade into just kind of a new manual kind of setup, I wanted to push and kind of, again, future proof us and move us into the, the technological era and say, hey, if we're going to do this, we might as well spend a few more bucks and, and get the latest and greatest and kind of have what everybody would want to have and what would make us stand out. We went through and we kind of evaluated some new tools and, and in the programs to just kind of overall improve the patient experience. And again, my experience might be very different than yours, but again, I have partners that are opticians that are not doctor background. So for me, everything is kind of that, that hard sell of saying, hey, I need the technology that we all need and want. And they're looking at me and saying, well, how is this going to improve our bottom line? And can't you do it? You've been doing it in a closet with, you know, manual keratometer and a ferropter that barely works and a slit lamp that only moves to the left, but you've been making it work. You know, how can we move forward from here? So for me, it's always kind of a, a hard sell, but I feel that that, that gives me a, a, a good view, again, from like practice owner side and doctor side of why we should do things and really, really evaluate what that's going to bring to the table. The kind of overview, if you will, you know, kind of our traditional approach, what, what we've learned in school, you know, if you're like me and you're 10 years plus out or 20 years plus out, I mean, everything is done by you manually from keratometry, from refraction, from slip lamp exam, from, you know, literally every single step of the way, you're collecting data, you're having to write down data, you're having to transfer the data over, and you're wasting a lot of time kind of getting that data collected, putting it in. If you move to kind of a screening model, again, now you have text doing some of that stuff. But even there, you know, again, in the past, it was limited on what they could and couldn't do. Now we're seeing, again, with the ability with everything that we have, and especially with, the, you know, we have the full Visionic suite from Leno Technologies. But even from the very basic stuff, you can go from start to finish with very, very, very quick and efficient kind of processes that will pipe right into your system, that eliminates the transcription errors, that moves you from spending time collecting data and entering data into what I think, again, is the most important thing, and that is having that time with the patient to explain, to go over, to let them really know what our value is and how we can make things better for them and what we can do outside of the exam room, really let them know that we're listening to it. I mean, 
if you look at spending, you know, 5, 10, 12, 15 minutes of collecting data and entering data, you're turned away from the patient. You don't have the time to sit and look at them in the face. You don't have the time to ask them questions about their work setup, their home life setup. You might not even be able to elicit the question, the correct question that would really make a difference in their life. And I think, again, that is going to help you create those kind of lifelong patients by just looking someone in the eye and really addressing their needs. This is the new approach, if you will. And this is the approach that I think is the right way to do it and the best way in the kind of the current setup. On the far left, you basically see the VX40, which is the Visionics version of a auto lensometer. You put it on there, it will read it, it will show you progressive zones, it does wavefront analysis. Literally, put it in, drop it, go. Very little training, you get the data, it's out kicks over to your system, you go into your next box, your VX100, 110, 120, 130 with the varying features there. Again, will allow you to screen from everything. It does topography, you can have tonometry, you have wavefront analysis, keratometry, pachymetry, everything all in one and in about a three minute span, you have all of that data. More than most of us collect, generally speaking, because we're not doing topography on everybody, usually, but now you have it. Pachymetry on everybody, not usually, but you have it all of these things that allow you to have all of the data in front of you. And then again, you can kind of parse through and see what's important to you in this case versus in a, not important to you, but you have all the data at your disposal in no extra time. Kicking over into again, what we're talking about tonight, the Visionics VX65, the autopharopter, everything pipes in straight in, again, no entry, nothing there. You automatically have the wavefront data. You automatically have the previous lensometry. You automatically have a without correction all set up for you at the touch of a button and ready to go. Again, you can see how much quicker that process would be and all the data that you collect, which again leads us to that greater time to educate the patient. The workflow efficiencies, the less time spent on the data entry, our reduced risk of transposing data, you know, that more time to spend, again, leads us into everything that we want to do as doctors, and that is treat the patient, not collect the data. Kind of again, rethinking the usual and finding out what works for your practice. As Adam mentioned, as I kind of said off the jump, we have two very, very, I would say, unique and different practices. Our River North practice in downtown Chicago is much higher volume. It's, it's younger patients. It's young, working, urban professionals that are popping in and out between lunch breaks, that are able to come over for 30 minutes, break away from what they're doing. Most of them, again, are contact lens wear, so a lot of kind of anterior segment stuff that we're dealing with. We had, in the past, always done everything with the doctor. So even though we had all this integrated equipment and we were using it, we as the doctors were still collecting the data. Again, although it only takes three or four minutes to do it, we were still collecting that data. And my initial belief was by us doing that, we were creating a patient experience that would elevate over a different practice. Someone who says, hey, I'm gonna pipe you from room to room to room. And I know, again, a lot of us have those setups. Some of you maybe don't. Maybe you have you more setup like what we have with one exam room and patients come into one doctor. We are now in this time where, again, reimbursements are glowing lower. Time is of the essence. We need to shorten exam time to make the same kind of bottom line at the end of the day. We have to spend more time cleaning. We have to have time in between patients now to clean rooms and disinfect. With that, we have now implemented in the last couple of months pre-testing outside of the exam room. So we now, in our downtown River North location, we're running one model with pre-testing outside the exam room with the doctor actually not collecting the data, more your traditional kind of medical model, versus again, what we're doing in our suburban location, which is still the patient walks into the exam room, they sit down and they have this basically one-stop shop of everything done in front of them in three minutes. I'm explaining what's going on through it, kind of showing them the value add of what they're getting and how it's different than the alternative of where they've been before. We're going to kind of reevaluate when the, the beginning of the year comes in. And I've been in touch, you know, again, we're keeping doctors separate at this point. So I'm only in the suburban location. My other doctor is only in the downtown location. And just kind of get a feel for, you know, what are we gaining? What are we losing? You know, are we losing our personal touch? Because we believe, again, 
that our personal touch is what is our differentiator. And having the doctor explain and have the time to do that is that differentiator. We do not want to have to go to, you know, five minute, 10 minute exams, you know, well eye checks or whatever the case may be. But can we still get that same experience and that same feel in 15 minutes if it is 15 minutes solid of the doctor doing it and we have a well-trained staff collecting the data on the front end versus our traditional model that we've been doing for the last five or six years? The digital refraction and kind of the, the huge benefits that that have worked in the new normal are absolutely apparent and right in front of us. Um, my own story, this is kind of pre-pandemic, and one of the things that was a big deal for me is I have chronic back and kind of shoulder pains. I played football through college. I actually had a, a spinal fracture that created some drama for me. And as such, sitting all day long and reaching across often created some issues. So from that standpoint, again, I know a lot of us, we have some neck and back pains. When you have this setup with the Visionics VX65, you have an untethered tablet. It literally is an iPad type or Samsung Galaxy tablet type that you can hold anywhere at any place with perfect ergonomics. And again, move and adjust yourself into a position where you're not going to have that repetitive stress type injury. There's none of the awkward angles or spinning dials. You're not leaning over the patient, which again is different for now too. It's very important. We'll get to that. And again, from the standpoint of at the end of the day, I feel better. With the ease of use, there are two modes with the Visionic VX65 by Leno. The autoferopter mode, which again is the screen that you see in front of us. If you've ever worked on an autoferopter of any kind, this is more of the screen that you're used to. It's run through, you know, kind of a jog dial as well that you could run if you want to, or you can run it on the tablet as it looks in front of you. Again, there's a learning curve with it. Once you get used to it, it's very quick. It's very efficient. Again, it just goes, goes, goes. To your eye off the jump, it might look different, especially if you've never done anything like this, and it looks intimidating. I promise you, again, if you give yourself a couple of refractions through it, it becomes very, very easy, and you will really, really enjoy kind of and, and the speed with which you can do things. With that being said, again, they have lots of support. They kind of will work with you through it. I personally like this mode better. This is the mode that, again, five years ago, I started with, with our, our Visionics equipment. And as you can see, it looks like a Feropter. It's in front of you on the tablet, exactly as you've seen, as exactly as it's been there before, but it's now sitting on you and sitting in front of you on a tablet. Where you would normally spin up, you spin up. Where you would normally occlude, you would occlude. If you want to twist a dial, you twist a dial. You literally just touch where you would normally touch, and it responds in the way that a Feropter would respond. There is absolutely little to, I shouldn't say absolutely no, but there is little to no learning curve. And again, kind of as a side note, we recently had to have a, a fill-in doc at our downtown location. And our, our doc literally spent 10 minutes on basically a Zoom call with him and said, this is how you do it. And within 10 minutes, he was up and rolling and did 16 patients that day, having never seen the equipment in his life. So it really kind of it takes the scare factor out of going into a, a digital format if you're used to the kind of the manual mode of everything. It is seamless and efficient and easy. Here we go, our COVID, six feet or more. I used to joke with patients when I first got the Visionics VX65 that you know, I didn't even need to wear deodorant anymore because I didn't have to lean over them and didn't have to be so close to them. Some would laugh, some would be appalled. Again, some are still my patients, probably some are not. But in this era, again, where we do need to keep and be cognizant of that six feet or more to not only keep ourselves healthy, our patients healthy, but just to respect that space and to make everyone feel comfortable if they're coming into your office, that you're doing your part and that you can do it safely and efficiently. This is a huge thing that you can broadcast out to everybody and say, hey, listen, the old school way of people reaching over you, not at our office. We can literally run this from a tablet and be in a different room if we wanted to, but I grab my tablet, I slide back to the other side of my room, I'm 10 to 15 feet away from the patient, I can still see exactly what they're doing, I can judge you know, facial expressions, everything else that we do as we're going through our refraction, but I'm six feet or further away. It is a huge win. You know, that untethered tablet the, you know, during this pandemic has been huge, 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 and again, you're not within that six feet. So the whole concept of, hey, I'm 15 minutes or more and this, that, and the other, 
you will absolutely be well under that. So if you have patients that are concerned, you have the ability to really quickly kind of put them at ease and make them feel comfortable that you are doing your best to keep them safe and yourself safe through it as well. The staff side of it, again, if we go back to the kind of that, that screen earlier that you saw with, with the other Visionics equipment that does auto refraction, wavefront, keratometry, topography, again, it is one button push operation. The patient sits in there, line up, you're on the other side, you push one button, you step back. I am not within six feet of my patients, even though my room is only 12 feet across. Basically, for much more than you know, a minute or less when I'm doing a slit lamp exam, everything else I can do from six feet or greater away. If you have staff that is doing kind of the pre-testing, the same thing will hold for them. Single button push, away they go. You can kind of see again from just this slide, that whole concept again, you can imagine, you know, if we were sitting there with trial frame, you're up in their face, they're touching, they're moving, they're shaking. You go to manual refractions we've done, again, the joke of they could smell your armpits. Well, from that standpoint, again, we're right there. With the Visionic VX65, you have that ease of use, you have the efficiency, you have the safety, you have the patient comfort, you have your comfort. Again, win, 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 win. It's, it's almost too easy to just look at it and say, well, of course, why wouldn't everybody do this? To my favorite part of this whole thing and why I was able to convince our practice to go forward with it, again, was that idea of elevating patient education. Built into it, and again, you can kind of see this screen, this right here is the screen that you would see that will show you an objective, a lensometer, a subjective one, a subjective two, and an unaided. Literally with one button push, you can flip between any one of these and within 10 seconds or less, five seconds or less, you have every lens switched over to their new prescription. Again, it is absolutely amazing what you can do when you show someone you know, that quick and easy from, hey, this is your subjective today, you know, and this is what you have in your current glasses from your lensometer that like, oh, is it really? I can't tell you how many times patients will like pull their head out from underneath the slit lamp, or excuse me, from the thoropter, try to grab their glasses and put it on because they don't believe that it's that significant of a change. And then they look at it and they're like, huh, yeah, that, that is, yep, that's right it really kind of just slams the door on that, hey, there is a difference, we need to make a change. I personally use that subjective one, subjective two a lot of times for varying levels of say an intermediate versus a near or trying to explain to someone a progressive, you know, say, hey, listen, if I fix your distance, you're gonna get this. If I fix your near, you're gonna get this. You know, what happens to your computer? For that person that's kind of on the fence of like, well, I don't really need a progressive or I don't really need that intermediate pair you can show it to them instantaneously and have that wow factor right in front of them. And again, it really, really reinforces everything and allows that patient to kind of be involved in their own kind of care, if you will. This screen right here, again, also very quick, very easy to kind of see. With the, the VX130 and the VX120s, you'll get this screen that is a simulated no correction view versus a simulated like lower, at, or lower order aberration screen. The main one that I use this for is for my pediatric patients. And not necessarily to show the pediatric patients because they know what they're seeing, but more importantly to show the parent. When you have that seven-year-old or eight-year-old, or for that matter, five-year-old, who is plus 50 minus 175, and they can fake their way through the chart and they get down to 2025 20, ish and they're missing their P's versus their F's. And the patient's, the patient's parent says, Oh yeah, they're still learning their letters. You know, they, yeah. And they try to, you know, brush it off or they try to coach their kid. Come on, you know, that letter, you know, it, it's, it's, it's P it's P it's right there. You can see it. You can show this to that parent and they get a much better sense really quickly of, Oh man, well, I, I don't want my kid to see that. Versus hearing their kid kind of read through it and half-heartedly kind of get some of the questions right. Again, that patient-parent buy-in, letting them kind of really see through, quote-unquote, their own child's eyes, it, it, it puts that pressure on them to, to make a decision. And, and again, what I would again argue is the right decision. Don't make your kid work harder. Give them the tools to succeed. And in this era, 
with remote learning, I have prescribed and had filled more plus 50 minus 75 prescriptions than ever before in my life for eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds. Because now those patients are coming in and saying, holy smokes, I have a headache. I have strain. The sheer volume of near work, what they're doing is exposing it. You know, in a normal school classroom, that patient slides right through 2025. We write it off. They say, good enough. Now when that 10-year-old complaining of a headache at the end of every day, this really, again, will help kind of the patient and the parent understand and reinforce that buy-in. The value selling. Basically kind of been hitting on that. But the big thing here is when you are educating your patients and they see what they're missing out, it's easy. It's no longer a sell. And I know a lot of us don't like to feel like we're selling. I don't feel like I'm selling. I feel like I'm educating. I'm showing them this is the best. This is what you could see. Why would you want to see less than that? I try to, you know, again, elicit from them. You know, do you have headaches? Do you have strain? How do you feel at the end of the day? Do you have any difficulties when you, you've been staring at the computer and you look back up across the room? You know, do you have delays in focus? Do you feel like there's anything going on there? Having this time by having things automated, it allows you to have the time to explain through to the patient, to really dive into it and again, address the needs. If you think back to you know, one of your first kind of days in clinic, you're supposed to address the chief complaint. Oftentimes, I think we lose that. You know, sometimes we start kind of going on our routine and we go through it, we go through it, we go through it, and we will maybe address the chief complaint, but we're not trying to elicit that secondary or tertiary complaint, and the patient might not even know until you show them or explore them. They might just think, that's what I'm supposed to do. Having that little bit of extra time, whether it's four minutes or six minutes more, it will allow you to educate. That absolutely will translate into sales. I can promise you for sure. And that is how I was able to, again, no pun intended, sell my other co-owners on this technology. It was translating into sales in our, in a, and when we go out into the optical. It's now the optician reinforcing what the doctor has said, not the optician trying to feel like the upsell is going on out there. If you as a doctor say, yeah, you need a digital progressive, you know, and, and or you need a secondary pair for, you, you know, you're a trader. You've got four monitors in front of you. They're all at 32 inches and they're at eye level. A progressive isn't going to work for you. We need to do something different. Your life is different than everybody else's. Let's make you a pair that, you know, an office lens, a computer lens. It's good for that and allows you to be success, successful at what you do. Those things now are in the patient's head. They've seen it. They've been able to see the differentiator of it before and after with versus without. When they go out into the optical, the optician is basically helping style them. They're not having to reinforce any sales. It's just happening on its own. In recap, just in summary, uh, again, I think you can tell that I, I'm fairly passionate about this technology. And again, the, the whole suite of technology, not just the VX65. I think the VX65 uh, right now is, is huge and it's really, really, really great in this era from the idea of that six feet social distancing. There's no way that you can do this with, you know, the manual for opter. If you have that in your office, unfortunately, you're forced to be right there in their face for that period of time. I literally am sitting 10 feet away. I'm running from a tablet. Not only do I feel safe, the patient feels safe, the patient feels comfortable. Your patients, again, will feel that kind of that wow factor that, wow, this is, this is different. This is not, I've never had that done before. Well, shoot, you're doing the same exact thing. It just feels different to the patient. You elevate your overall patient experience for them as well. And they're really, really wowed by it, which again, will translate out to kind of that, hey, we got another sale. You know, we're moving things in our right direction. We are having that integrated workflow and kind of just moving into the new, kind of the usual of what we do, right? What, how could you do it? How are you doing it currently? I was laughing the other night. We had a lovely little rainstorm here in Chicagoland, and I had to go downstairs and check on my basement, make sure my sump pump was still working. And lo and behold, down there, I have a manual keratometer, my old foot lamp, it's sitting there, you know, collecting dust without a camera on it, an old manual for opter. I'm thinking, wow, that's, that's how I used to do it. And now it is literally sitting in my butt, my, my basement as kind of a relic. And I, and I feel like those things are kind of relics at this point. When we have these tools out there for us, it is a really, really, really nice thing to have. And again, I think that 
you know, Leno Technology and Visionics have it hammered down and just that full kind of experience that allows us to do what we need to do, educate the patient, counsel them, get them where they want to go. And again, you can be the best advocate for the patient, which will again, breed loyalty, further patients, one leads to two, leads to four, leads to eight. And that's what we all need right now is to have those patients come back, fill our opticals, fill our exams, and be good patients that are loyal for us going forward. It is that foundation for value selling as we kind of hammered on. You don't have to sell. It isn't a sell when you're telling truth. You know, when you are showing them what it is, it shouldn't feel like a sale. It should just feel like you are trying to give the best to the patient and you now have the time to do that. You're not having to pick and choose your battles. You can have the time to kind of have that foundation for them. With that, I think it's time to turn it over or turn it back to Adam and see if you guys had any questions. Again, you can see the website right up there from Leno Tech, uh, Leno Technologies. Again, if you go here to this website, they will have plenty of other information up there, way more than what I would have. But again, I have kind of the firsthand experience of working with it for five, six years at this point. All right. Well, thank you, Jordan. That was really cool. So let me uh, pull up these questions here. Let me see what we what we have going on. Let me get the tab open and we can go over here. So, uh, so here's an interesting question, marketing question. So, uh, you know, obviously you mentioned that you could stay six feet apart from the patient. Do you let patients know that even before they come in? Do you do you like tout that or advertise it in any way? So, so we did. You know, when we first started back. So we, we were shut down from March 20th through May 2nd, uh, again, I think as most, right? And we were able to go back May 2nd when elective procedures were, again, reallowed here in Illinois. Um, with that, we basically kind of had changed our website around and tried to kind of just tell people what we were doing. Um, we did send out questionnaire or a questionnaire that's, you know, kind of your COVID questionnaire and what have you. Our staff was doing a really good job of just kind of, I would say, aligning the fears of people. We didn't overly harp on it, again, in the sense that a lot of our patients already knew. Um, for new patients, we definitely do let them know, like, hey, listen, you know, we are doing things to keep you safe. You know, it will be different than what you're kind of used to. You know, you won't have people in there. And some people, you know, again, as, as everybody, we have some that are concerned and some that absolutely are not concerned at all. But we definitely, with the, with the new patients, we did, you know, the good thing is at this point, we've been doing this for, you know, five or six years, six years, I think at this point with this technology. So our patients are, you know, kind of aware. And again, that word of mouth, as I was speaking of, you know, this trickles back. It, it is absolutely, you know, a patient comes into our office, they go back into their workplace after being the first time in there and they tell them, listen, the dude was running it from a tablet. Like, you got to see this thing. I mean, I feel like I'm in the future. And so again, I don't think that we did necessarily a huge market, but I think you absolutely could. And especially if you're bringing this in, I would, I would be sending out blog posts and everything else, you know, throwing it up on Instagram. We do show our things on Instagram. We do show it, you know, on Facebook. We have Facebook videos. We've talked through that. So again, people get a feel for what they're going to go through before they even get there. Right. Cool. So another uh, real 2020 style question here. Um, people wearing masks, how do you deal with, with fogging or are there any fogging issues? Yes. Yeah, so, so we do have fogging issues. Um, I, I, you know, again, I try to have people keep it as tight around their nose as every, you know, as we can, you know, have patients, you know, kind of press and pull back, you know, pull back on their ear straps, things like that. I do keep a cleaning cost handy. You know, as, as many, I, I joke with people again, if you're old enough to get this joke, I'm like, here's my sham. Wow. I have a very, very large cleaning cloth that I'm kind of, you know, constantly wiping down. I do kind of preface it with the patient because, again, sometimes patients won't let you know as well. You know, hey, listen, this has a tendency to fog right now. If it does, please let me know. Don't just say I can't see either or, you know, just make an arbitrary decision. If it was good and now all of a sudden it's really bad, let me know. But we are definitely still, you know, we're still fighting the fog battles, if you will. Right. Um, question here, I guess it's an Internet question. Can these exams be done from a different location? Yeah, so this is, this is an interesting one and a great one. I, I didn't mention it, but um, speaking with Melissa, who is kind of my close contact at Leno Technologies, she told me, she's like, you know that you can run this, you know, from your home if you wanted to. And I was like, well, I guess I kind of assumed you could because you guys have remoted in on TeamViewer to do updates and things like that, but I never really had kind of processed that as a way. But you absolutely do have the ability through kind of a, a team viewer type thing to run absolutely everything. As long as you could get a patient 
seated and in front of there and lined up. So if you had a technician, get them in the chair and put them there. You could run everything remotely as long as there was kind of an audio feedback back and forth or some kind of a video feedback back and forth. Yes, you could. Wow. Um, question here: Does the device check for prism? Yes. So it does have it does have a prism. Um, basically, prism dial on there, just as you would your you know your Jackson cross cylinder. Versus again, flip the dial the other way. Again, when you look at the kind of the, the manual thopter looking mode that I use, um, you ju and again, you just kind of kind of spin the prism up, spin the prism down. As far as you know, your kind of standard you know binocular balance, you can program it to automatically have it in with you know three up, three down, whatever you'd like to do there. So again, I have mine kind of set that way. So when I do binocular balance, I hit one button, flip, boom, it's there. I hit one button, flip, out, done. Um, but that does have prism, just as you would have on your manual thopter. Right. A uh, question here. This is interesting. So you mentioned that you used, um, you have different setups at your different locations, right? You have one where the pretest is outside and you have yep. the other one where everything is all in one place. Do you have a preference for either setup and have you noticed that any one is more efficient than the other? So the unfortunate thing with this COVID is I have only been at the location that has everything in the office. So I have personally have not yet been able to experience the outside of the, uh, of the exam room, as well as outside the exam room, you know, kind of the pretest area versus in the exam room. I have spoken closely with, with my doctor, Dr. Wozni down there, and literally day one, when we set it up the other way, she texts me after like patient number three, and she's like, I absolutely love this. You need to switch over to this mode right away, right? So she absolutely prefers the outside of the exam room and then have the patient come in. Um, like I said, we're trying, you know, kind of it was, it was the start back up, if you will, um, to do that. I'm a, I'm a little bit torn. Like I said, and I, I can't harp on this enough, I truly believe in educating the patient. And I feel that, again, my time with them is that's the value. That's what I'm bringing to the table. That's what differentiates us. So I kind of like part of it. I do like being able to talk the patient through hey, as this is going on, this blue light is doing thickimetry. It's measuring, you know, the thickness of your cornea. We can look for swelling. We can look for these things. Now this bright red one where you feel like you're a Pop-Tart in a toaster, this one is looking at, you know, kind of the corneal curvature, and we're going to look to see if there's any astigmatism, any irregularities there, and kind of talking them through those points. Not, again, that you couldn't have a tech do it, but I don't like necessarily the idea of a push button per se and have the patient just feel like their cattle being moved through. Again, I think if you train the text the right way, it could be good. Dr. Natalie is absolutely over the moon preferring that other mode. Again, I've been doing it the other way for, you know, 12 years and for six years automated. Maybe, again, I'm more, I guess, old school in the new school, if you will, right now. But I, I, I guess I could, re, you know, relinquish some of that control. Maybe that's the control freak in me, too. <laughs> right. And you mentioned, of course, techs handling a lot of this in that one setup. How much yes. did it actually take to get the techs up to speed, to, you know, to work well with the device and, and to get the tests done accurately? So I would say literally 50 seconds. I mean, if you let them run through it once with, with the equipment, it is, it is that push button. So if we're going back to, you know, the, the whole suite, if you go from the, the lensometer, the auto lensometer, to a VX120-130, into the tablet mode, again, it is place the patient, it's auto align, it does everything. Now again, are there, you know, sometimes where, you know, the patient moves this, that, and the other, yeah, there'd be some problem, you know, problem solving there that, you know, they'd have to learn some of those. But I think again, for the most part, if you have a pretty good patient base, you could get them up and running and, you know, hey, get them there, put their chin on it and, and go. And then after a couple of times, you could show them, hey, this is, if this happens, I need you to retake that, you know, that doesn't make any sense. You know, one eye showing up at minus 26 because the patient moved in the middle of it. One eye showing up at Plano. That's probably not truth. Run it again for me. Don't have them automatically come into the room. The beauty of the suite, though, is, again, that everything feeds forward into what's called the VX box, which is kind of a local area server that's right there built in. And then that data is automatically piped into your VX65 in your Feropter. So you see all that data, whether it's collected in the room, out of the room, wherever. You see it all in front of you. And again, that data can be integrated and is integrated with push button into your EHR. So, you know, the tech doesn't have to do much other than line them up, sit them there and hit end exam. And at that point, the system's automated. It kicks everything through to you and you're ready to roll. And now all you're doing is a quick, you know, kind of 
go through your refraction and educate. It's it's that simple. Right. Oh, person clarified his question here. He was asking about the auto lensometer. Can that check prism? Oh, yes, yes, it absolutely does. It, it does check prism. Um, it checks prism. And again, it's a wave front lensometer. So it's, it's different in the sense that, again, you will actually be able to see progressive designs, where corridors are, the width of a progressive on one versus the other, which again, from that standpoint is, is really nice and kind of, I would say, good for your engineer patient. You know, the person who's still complaining after you've given them the best and the widest and everything else. Well, if I look way off to the left, I'm getting some peripheral blur, you know, like, hey, that's the limits of human technology that we have right now. But it will literally show that. And so you could even put it on there. And again, it, it's interesting that, you know, if you do that and you kind of go through, you could see, hey, here's a Shamir lens. Here's a, you know, a, a Verilux lens. Here's a stock progressive from my local lab. You can see those variants right there. So you can check prism zones, everything right there. And again, single, drop it, auto aligns and goes. Right. Here's an interesting question. This I wouldn't have even thought about, but you, you know, you're using a tablet all day. What's the battery life on this thing? Has it ever croaked out before you got to the end of a patient day? So yes, yes, it is. Absolutely. It, it has um, the, the newer version, the newer tablet that I have has been good. I mainly leave it plugged in, um, you know, in between patients for sure. If you shut the screen off, you know, in between, which is totally easy to do. I mean, you just turn the screen off and on, you'll be able to get through a day. You know, you, at the end of the day, you, and when I say a day, it depends on your day, but my day is basically, you know, usually about a nine to 10 hour in the office, you know, from the time we start it to the time we close it down type of thing. You'll be able to get through a day. And if you plug it in, you know, periodically or over a lunch break, for sure, you'll be able to get it in. I just try to make it a habit that I plug it in in between. Um, we have a stand that we have put it up, you know, like a tablet stand that has sat, again, pre-COVID, that sat on my desk right next to it. So I was just kind of running it from there. Now, mind you, at that point, I'm not six feet away. I'm probably three and a half feet away. Hello, I'm back. But that way, it stayed plugged in the entire time. Now, in COVID, I'm pulling, plug, unplugging, and scooting back a little bit. Right. And I guess the, the follow-up question to that one then is, you know, over time, I think we all have iPads here. We all know what happens, right? The battery life starts getting shorter. What's it like? Have yep. you had to replace any of the tablets yet? Yep. So, uh, again, I've had the technology for six years. Um, I've replaced the tablet one time um, at each location. Uh, the most recent tablet malfunction was a uh, Jordan Jones malfunction, most likely. Um, <laughs> Uh, so again, I can't, I can't blame anything else, but I, I, I dropped it and that usually doesn't work out very well for you. So the, the screen kind of opened and then that caused the battery to start swelling on me, which I didn't realize that's what it was. I was like, Oh, what's this pushy, flushy thing in the back of it? And then when I sent it over to the lovely folks at, at Leno Technologies, they're like, it looks like your battery is about ready to just explode on you. And I was like, Oh, that's probably because I dropped it. My bad, you know, but again, to, to their credit and to, again, Rewind it back one thing, you know, one of the reasons we chose Leno Technology and Visionics equipment was for us, they were there, right? We had had, you, know, you can see up at the top, right? I mean, they do Brio, they have some of those other things. We had had their edges. We had worked with them in the past. And so we had a good working relationship with them. And we knew that they stood behind things. We knew that they were responding to things. We knew that if we needed something, they were going to be there for us. And I can tell you, again, that day that that tablet broke for me, it wouldn't work. I, and again, I'm in Chicago, so they have facility here. I had a new tablet in my hand within an hour and 45 minutes. Now, we drove up there really quick to grab one, but I called Melissa. She had their staff get it ready and typed in ready for me, gave me, had all the stuff in so that, again, my staff went and grabbed it, came right back down. I literally missed two patients. That was it, and I had it. Now, you can have a backup tablet, and that's probably a wiser thing to do. And again, if you did have that issue, all you have to do is basically authorize that other tablet, which again is just one phone call. They, only one is authorized at a time, kind of like a single user license type of situation. But you could call them and they quickly, again, that could be a phone call in 30 seconds. Say, okay, this one is down. I need this one up and running as a, a replacement backup. And the tablet, again, was it's a Samsung Galaxy tab. So it's not a, you know, thousand dollar tablet. You know, it is a more, you know, more basic tablet. And it's not crazy costing if you do need to replace them. Right. Do I even dare ask, since it is a Samsung tablet, could you actually procure one and have them set it up for you in a, if you were in a hurry? <laughs> yes. 
Yes. So that the first time, that is exactly what I did the first time. I, I reached out to, to kind of the head and I said, hey, listen, you know, here's the deal. I feel like my tablet battery life, you know, the, you know, the plug in is going bad and, and I feel the end is near. And I don't want that end to happen on a day where I got 16 patients rolling through the door type of thing. And they were kind enough and they sent over and they said, hey, go try to find this, you know, Samsung Galaxy Tab A or whatever it is with this model number. And I, you know, was able to get it off of Amazon and had it there for me. And then again, download the software, which is in an app and then get the code from them and it will, it will work for you. So, I mean, it is possible. Um, I will say again, it was, it was much easier to just get a tablet where they had everything already done for me. So in that right. case, it's always nice to be like, just, Hey, straight from them where they have everything done the way that they want to. And it, it's ready to rock right out. So it's just plug it in and go type of thing, but it is possible. Right. Hello. Right. Hello. Um, question here. What happens if the internet goes out? Can you still run exams? Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's Bluetooth connectivity. So you can still run everything again, just via the Bluetooth connection. Um, you don't need internet to run anything. If you were doing, you know, again, obviously a remote, like a team viewer type thing, you'd be, you'd be done. But again, so would everybody, but because it is a Bluetooth connection, it would work. The Visionics, the VX box itself, again, is on a local area network. So again, it's, it's local and it broadcasts its own signal to within those pieces of equipment. So they actually talk internally, not necessarily to the outside world. So again, it is secured within your system. And then the data again is extracted out. Um, basically at, at this point, they, they've upgraded to an XML version. So it's piped right out. And again, you just have to talk to your, your EHR provider. And again, give kind of the license to get behind firewalls to do it. But yes, you do not need internet to run it. Right. And you mentioned before team viewers. So the way they set you up, the, the company can actually come in and help you remotely. Is that correct? And then you can sort of do like a zoom kind of a thing. A absolutely. I mean, again, the, the, the staff for, for, for them will, you know, if, if I have a problem, they are able to, you know, with one phone call, come in, basically take over my system and get in there to the nuts and bolts. And whether it's an update that needs to be done, whether there's an error, whether I changed a feature that shouldn't have done and it's not connecting. And again, it's one of the, again, the Jordan Jones errors, which are, there's a lot of them. I promise. And my wife will tell you there's more, but they can fix all those things remotely, you know, and again, the, they know their stuff. I mean, they know how to get to the problem. They can quickly get in there and say, Hey, this is what it is. And if it's at all possible, they can do it remotely. If it's a physical thing, you know, again, if the head moved or something like that, yeah, you know, there's a different story there, but no, they can do everything remotely. I'm, I'm interested again. I'm going to just play with it. I want to try the, you know, the, the remote version again, it, it goes against everything that's holy to me of patient experience and being there and being able to see and touch and feel and talk to them. But I do, I do want to have that idea of like, hey, if I was out of the office on a day and a patient came in and just needed a quick refresh on RX chat Hello, guys. and they're leaving out of town, maybe I could, you know, pull over to the side of the road and quickly have my staff say, hey, have them sit down there real quick. Let's throw this up there. And if I do this or this, if I take that cylinder out, does that get rid of it for you? Oh, yeah, that fixes it. Perfect. You know, and be able to do it remotely. That might be nice for some of those type of things rather than trying to squeeze those in on another day. Absolutely. All right, great. Well, we're just about out of time, but you know, this video will be up on ODWire so people can watch the archive and we'll have a little discussion thread running underneath it. So Jordan, if you want to come back and, you know, maybe answer some more questions because I'm sure there's going to be about 50 million more. Um, you know, Absolutely. People, always, people, yep. people are always shy. It's funny. People are kind of shy usually on the night of, but boy, if you just put yep. up a video and then just give them a comment section afterwards, it's just all people just unload. So yeah, so I, I suspect yep. we're going to get a big conversation around it. I would be, I would be more than happy. And again, I, I can say that I think that all of us want to be safe. All of us, you know, need our practices to, to feel normal, even though things aren't normal. And I think this is a, this is the VX65. Again, it is, it's a really nice tool to let you feel that way, you know, and still upgrade your practice and do some things that will make you feel, you know, again, maybe, maybe revitalized and invigorated to, to do a refraction if you've just been tired of doing refractions for 25 years too. Absolutely. All right. Well, th Jordan, thank you so much for being here and thank you everyone for showing up tonight. And again, the Apple Watch raffle, uh, I'm going to be drawing that after this is done and you'll get an email uh, if, if you're the lucky winner. And otherwise, we're going to talk hello, about hello, it hello. as well hello, uh, hello. on ODWire. So again, thanks everyone and I will see you all online. Thanks, guys.
Alrighty, and so that was the VX65, and I hope everybody got to see a uh, get a good overview of it. And uh, I don't know if Paul and Steve are back yet. Let's see. Uh, I'm back. Ah, uh, you're back. Excellent. So yeah, so that was a webinar that we did last week, actually. Uh, hopefully, people got a good sense of what the system is like. Um, <coughs> I'm back. Hey, how's it going, Steve? Good, good, good. I don't know. With the number of webinars that are being offered, I don't know how optometrists can keep up. There's something going on almost every night. Yep. Yeah. yeah there it's is, remarkable. It is a, a lot happening for sure. And uh, I'm just glad that, you know, with ODWR, at least you have a platform to um, play it back, right? I mean, that's the one the one great part about what we have is that we have a central spot where people can come back and always watch these older webinars, which I thought was pretty cool. And the other good part is you give an award for people to show up. Yep. That's terrific. I don't see anyone else doing that. Yep. And people just simply can't make it at a particular time. I mean, we're giving them eight hours today, but if you have to be there at whatever, six o'clock on a Tuesday night and you just can't make it, then you can't attend. Yep. Um, and they don't put it on demand afterwards, which is uh, the problem is when you put it on demand afterwards, then it entails a quiz and a whole other uh, cope number. People don't realize that we actually have to get two cope numbers for our lectures, one for this live presentation and one for what goes on demand uh, again. So um, it is challenging for the uh, presenters. Yep, absolutely. So, yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm glad that we, uh, you know, are able to do this and have this platform where people can always come back and and watch so um so yeah so i i hope everyone enjoyed that last one so things seems to be going smoothly at the conference i was out there doing some support work and things you know seem to be going well the one uh problem one guy had was actually he had music the in between class music come up um during uh, oh. a lecture which i thought was pretty funny but all you have to do is refresh the page and it got better so um surprisingly few not... problems you know with the hundreds of people we have here right now Yep, and, and people, please don't put your OE tracker number in the chat um, form part of it. Um, it's not going to get accepted that way. They, they do it all the time, and I one by one I tell them, no, you have to go to the top, update profile, OE, and just do it once, and you're good to go for this le this um, whole weekend plus the weekend in December. Yep. And, and in fact, on demand also, in between. Well, Alexa is going well and good, and there is a, a large turnout. And usually, I would expect Saturday morning to be difficult because practices have opened up. People are working on Saturdays. It, it tends to be a busy day. Um, Sunday usually is the busiest, but uh, we have a quite a large amount of people because they want to get their credits, and hopefully, some people want to get education. Yep, absolutely. We do. Um, just so yeah. you, just so you know, students. This is a wide, diverse. Um, platform we have here and students can enter for free and, and listen to the lectures. They can't get continued education credits, of course, but they can listen to all the lectures and, and then go back and listen to it on demand and not, not have to take a quiz, of course. Yep. Right. And that, that holds true okay. for auditors as well. Not only students, mm -hmm. but some retirees would like to keep their, their finger in, in such, you know, staying up to date and they, they're coming on board as well. And as long as they don't need the credits, that they're getting it at no charge. Yep. Little public service. right now. Um, <clears throat> we we have uh, Ben Cassell talking about narcotics, which many states need now, and he he did a great job. And Craig Thomas is always um, both educational and fun. Uh, great lecture. So um, those are the two I'd like to plug now. But all, all the lectures are good. We try to vet everybody, but these are exceptional. Yeah, speakers are getting better and better. You know, uh, I think back years ago, uh, most speakers were deadly dull. They would start off with a joke that, was, that fell flat, and then what they would go on to, to start reading things off the screen. And uh, it was kind of boring, but the, the speakers now are, are much more vibrant. And uh, I don't know if they're taking courses in public speaking, but they're getting better and better. 
Well, I think also now they're getting better and better because that's all they're doing is um, remote webinars and, and live presentations remotely, whether it be Zoom or, or live interaction. And so they're getting better at this because they've done it so many more times in the, in the recent uh, uh, year or so, and they'll get better and better in the future. I know I've gotten better at um, over, over voicing my lectures as I've gone from, like you say, putting too much prose and text up there and reading it to just speaking off the cuff um, as you would to an audience. It, it's, uh, um, it's a learning experience, and I think um, our speakers are all A-plus. Um, the speakers are all uh, brilliant people that speak all around the country, mostly nationally known, um, but this is a form they probably didn't do very much beforehand. Yep. Yep. And speakers love to do it for us. Because it's easy, they can do it from the comfort of their home. So, yep. no, no travel, which is pretty we good. We have quite a few um, ODs um, who love it also. We have uh, a lot of um, uh, women ODs who have children at home and they can't attend uh, the national conventions, whether it be AOA, Academy, Vision Expos. Uh, Seco, et cetera, and doing it from the home is just great. And what Arbo has done is allow that to become uh, considered live. I, ho I hope they continue it. Um, there was an article actually on um, CNN about the world changing and people working from home, and this, uh, the economic implications are, are vast. And this is just a microcosm of what's happening in optometry, and I hope this just stays the way it is. And they realize that um, this type of education is great, Yes, you need wet labs. Yet, yet, yes, you need to be in, in person to learn certain things, certain techniques, whether it be surgical or otherwise. But for most of the book learning, just like telemedicine could be accomplished uh, virtually, uh, this certainly can be. And I, I hope the state boards open up even more. They have opened up to this, but I hope it up even more um, coming going forward. Right. Yeah. And the only proviso is that, that you really do need a, a quiz. You have to have some sort of system uh, where you, you time that people just can't uh, turn on the uh, computer and walk away and uh, or that's well, that's not good. I, I, I tested that out myself the other day and, and put on a, a, a program and I just kept it running yeah. <laughs> and that was it. And there, there was no a method of, of just checking to see ask, asking a, a question is the what color is the sky, for example, for every so, 15 minutes coming up with a question. So I think what's going to have to happen, I think Arbo is going to have to have a discussion, and I'm sure they are amongst themselves, about what things are going to look like going forward. Um, of course, you know, people's memories are short, right? Let's say that all of this stuff is over. The pandemic ends, people are back to work, and this is in the rearview mirror. The question is, will things go back to the way they were before? And... I, I don't know. I really don't. Yep. Well, you know, it's, it's uh, also a question of, of monetizing, following the money. You know, the, uh, these uh, courses, except for ours, where we, we're giving bargains away, they're cash cows for, for many state associations. So you just can't, uh, they have to find some sort of um, other income sources to allow for uh less expensive modes of uh, education. Sure, sure. But if you find that people, um, for example, are not going to attend SECO, Vision Expos, AOA as much, Academy, um, then they're not going to be able to run these conferences if they get a third to a quarter of the people. And they, the large conferences might go by the boards and become a virtual um, uh, platform just because it would be so expensive. I mean, the... the um, conference centers in all the various cities are not going to discount their fees just because uh, you have a, a, a less attendees. Um, as you were saying also, Paul, uh, I go to certain other educational platforms in optometry where you're supposed to, on demand, you're supposed to listen and take a test. Well, um, I have a half a brain, and sometimes I'll just click on the test, take the test, never even listen to a minute of the course. I don't need the credits. I've got plenty of credits. And pass and get um, um, CE. So they're not timing you. They're not making you listen to the lectures. And uh, I think Arbo should know about that. We try to be so compliant because we are the biggest, and I'm sure there's auditors here, and, and there's nothing to audit because we're doing everything properly. But you're correct. Other platforms, uh, just listening to a, a lecture. Here you have to attest. You have to say that you're in the room at the end. So um, it's not just turning on your computer and, and leaving it run. Let's, let's make well, that clear. Adam, you know, you've, 
you've been taking online <clears throat> courses for 20 years. Well, what does medicine do? Well, it's it's a little different. There's the there's testing requirement, um, but of course the tests are easy, and sometimes they even give you the answers beforehand. Um, it's a lot of self-reporting, so it's the the rules are definitely looser. And that that's that's for state licensing. I wonder if the various specialties have their own classes. You know. Uh, for, for example, does ophthalmology have uh, separate uh, online courses where they're much tougher as far as uh, the, the testing and, and attendance? Yeah, I mean, they, they do, for sure, um, you know, to, to, to be board certified. But, you know. Well, but he, even when, um, for example, I was speaking to a couple of ophthalmology friends, and there's obviously always new surgical um, techniques and new uh, surgical paradigms that come out. And they don't have to even go in person to um, um, see one, do one, teach one. Um, they watch a YouTube demonstration, and they, how would you like to be the first one to have the surgery done after that, whether it be a, you know, a implantable device for glaucoma or a new IOL, et cetera. So they, they, don't e they can watch a surgical technique virtually, Am I correct, Adam? Because I know that they've told me they've done that for um, various surgical um, uh, techniques, new ones and, and uh, old ones, refurbish, um, relearning them. And they don't really have to even be certified. They just, because of their own, their, op, their MD license, are able to just do it. Um, as you know, um, uh, a, a proctologist could also take out cataracts. It's a plenary license. Right. I don't know if we get hospital privileges to do that, but he, he can try. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's very different, you know. There's there's much less, in a lot of ways, much less regulation uh, than with what mm -hmm. we're doing. So, yeah. <laughs> and the state board falls back on the it's for the public good that they have to have live conferences. Well, medicine is far more vast than optometry, and if they can do it, we certainly can do it also. Right. Uh, and and now certain states are doing things uh, that we are nameless where. Um, you can attend CE, you can attend it online like we're doing here, and get live credit, but it has to be by a provider of a the particular state has to be licensed there. That That's just arbitrary, in my opinion, because, first of all, they're limiting it to the doctors in that state, and there's a, a far more vast, um, brilliant set of doctors they could uh, tap, if they, but they don't have a license in that state. So that's one of the ways, as you know, um, guys, it's always about the money. And um, you know, if they've lost can still sums of money by not having local and regional conferences. I used to go every month to my um, local county conference. I loved it. Um, it was a two-hour lecture, and you hop out with your friends, and they, they haven't existed since March of last year. And uh, each one, we had about 15 or 20 in New Jersey. Each one generated a, a tremendous amount of money. They don't exist now, so they have to make it up somewhere, whether it be raising dues on the local, uh, the state, and national level. Um, that I don't see any other way of doing it. Yep. I think so So far, uh, New York State is probably the best model where they uh, require on online live. However, they, they, they demand a test as well, plus the 15-minute hour. So uh, you can take all your, all your credits in, in New York State now online, but you have to go through that extra step. That was, of course, before the new ruling uh, because of uh, COVID. So, but then they may go back to that uh, afterwards. So we'll see. Yep. Okay. All the lectures are going on smoothly. Uh, again, the one o'clock. There were a few that went over from um, twelve to two. But the one o'clock lecture. There's an interesting. The new lecture that uh, Clark Chang is doing about collaborative care in the emergency room is to your chair is great and. Uh, uh, he has uh, a nice, large amount of attendance for it. I think people like that. Uh, I'm counting about a couple hundred there. So, um, and clock's in the room, of course. <laughs> we scurry around to make sure our speakers are in the room, because they have to be, to uh, interact, and uh, that's the rules of Arbor. And again, we try to comply um, uh, to the letter of the law. Yep, absolutely. Okay. And by the way, I did, for anybody who's listening, if you have topics, like I said, or requirements of your state, if you're something you're interested in, please send us a note and we'll uh, 
try to uh, accommodate your needs. Um, we're always trying to give you the best education, the most diverse, and also what's needed. Things change. Uh, a few years ago, nobody needed narcotics, nobody needed trafficking, nobody needed oral credits, uh, or some people need specific mm. credits in glaucoma. Um, now um, we'll be able to handle that as long as you give us enough lead time to get uh, the best speaker we possibly can in the subject matter. To, to whet your appetite, my next lecture, I'm, I'm always into the new things, new horizons in eye care, and I'm doing a lecture on the, um, this is in 2021, on all the new topical medications for the treatment and hopefully cure or, or amelioration of presbyopia. And uh, when I started doing the research and talked to various people, there's not one, there's not two, there's a plethora of things coming out. So um, uh, people with short, uh, uh, let's say arms that are short might not exist in uh, the very near future. So stay tuned. We can only hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, let me just swing back here and, and pop open a slide here so people can uh, see what I'm talking about here. So I just wanted to remind people, you know, thank you for being here. And, uh, you know, so at this point, you know, we're closing in on 6,000 ODs for all I know by the end of today. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're going to be there. We seem to have more people signing up as we're talking, um, uh -huh. I've noticed. So <laughs> thank you for coming. Um, so, you know, the show has obviously been big. More people showed up today than I thought would, you know, considering we've done this so many times now. So I'm glad that people are still able to come out and take advantage of their credits. There's going to be one final show uh, on December 12th and 13th, and, you know, we'll make it a big blowout. We'll have some folks to interview. We'll get on camera again. We'll do the whole the whole shtick. Um, before we on go camera, away. oh on boy! Camera. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on. You can, you can come on camera if you want or not. I mean, you can come over here if you feel like it, or, or feel free to stay at home. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think I might want to though. Just you know, one last big hurrah. Get our sponsors involved too, and uh, uh, sure. we'll see. Um, so again, if you haven't already, you know, you can plan your day by going and downloading the course schedule for today and tomorrow. It's online. Click on courses and then download printable course schedule. To download it uh, and figure out what you're going to do. Remember to enter your OE tracker number. Uh, again, Steve put up little reminders about how to do it in the chat room. If your OE tracker number is in and you watch a lecture and sit through the whole thing, you'll automatically get credit. Um, remember, if you watch on demand, of course, you have to take a test. So, Arbo's requirements, not our requirements. Um, also, and the be, tests are made to be passable. Yes, absolutely. So. Again, be aware that there are, Arbo is way behind in reporting credits. So we submit these things to them, you know, shortly after the show is done. So on Monday, we're going to gather up everybody's credits and fire them over there probably by Tuesday morning. I like to check the credit list to make sure that everything looks okay, that the tracker numbers look valid, right? So if somebody fat fingered it and put in a, a you know, a character that's not valid, I like to go back and check and make sure that it's okay uh, before we send it off. So usually, you know, Tuesday or Wednesday, we send off all the credits. However, Arbo is telling us that they are running weeks behind, two to three weeks at least. They just started processing our October credits this past week, if you can imagine. So uh -huh. they, are, they are under a huge delay because of COVID. And um, I don't think they were fully prepared for what awaited them when they decided to change their rules, right? Because they loosened their rules. And so people started flooding them with credit requests. Um, and so as opposed to having a CE wire where we will take like 4,000 credits or something and dump them all in one gigantic spreadsheet, what they are starting to see a lot of is onesies and twosies, right? Where people are taking these one-off webinars that are an hour long and these, these CE providers are dumping these small numbers of credits onto Arbo in small batches. And you can imagine what this is doing to them. <laughs> <laughs> because every time uh -huh. somebody tries to submit a spreadsheet to them, they have to go through it. And if you're talking about, as Paul mentioned, there are lots of webinars going on, you, you have these dozens of providers just constantly dumping small numbers of credits at them that they have to check over. So it's been a nightmare for them. And that's why they're running so far behind in posting the credits, if that makes sense. Um, so. It might be a terrible thing at the end of this year if, if uh, states, the states that run on a calendar or schedule, um, for example, we're doing a, a, an event 12th and 13th of December. Um, if they get all these things dumped at the end of the year um, and now a state uh, wants somebody to prove or they ordered somebody that they took amount of credits, 
it's going to be challenging. Um, they'll just have to um, keep track of their own credits, and, and hopefully by middle of January, the uh, ARPA will get everything up. But uh, you can always, at least in our particular format, you can always print out your own transcript, take a, a picture just to have a, a permanent uh, digital copy also, and eventually it'll appear up in ARBO. But you don't need the ARBO um, certification. You just have, you can print your transcript directly from um, the website for um, CE Wire. Right. So just be aware of that. And, and if you need it for December 31st, print it out in December, and that way you have it. And then eventually when it shows up in ARBO, you have a, a double um, whammy there. So one nice thing about us, obviously, is that we're not going anywhere, and we do centrally collect all of those credits for you and have them in your control panel versus if you start taking one-off webinars here, there, and everywhere, you might have a bit of a difficult time hunting down all those credits. Um, at least with us, it's all centralized. As, as they say, well, you have one throat to choke. If you have problems, you know, you know exactly who to find. In fact, the email address is right there, and when you type that in, that goes to me. So... Um, yep. You know, you, you'll, you'll always be able to get your credits here and at least print them out to show people that you did it if Arbo is lagging. And in fact, since we are doing a show in mid-December, they're going to be a little bit under the gun, right? So we're going to submit sure. those credits as soon as that show is done in December. And then they have, you know, maybe, what, 10 days until they go away on their winter break. So <laughs> we're going to have to hope that they start to catch up. But otherwise, we do collect all of these credits and we have them here. So uh, I, I would guess that we're going to be the last big show for the year in December. I can't imagine anyone sure. else is coming on just before Christmas. No, they'll close down. But if you want your certificate, just the upper right-hand corner in, in the uh, lobby, it says certificate. You just click on that, and everything should be there literally in real time. The minute you take a lecture, it, it shows up. In fact, yep. let me see what I have here. Uh, yeah, I have three courses for November. It's so surprising. <laughs> <laughs> we'll so, leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. That's um, an inside joke. Yeah. So anyway, so it, I, you know, people shouldn't feel like, oh, my God, I'm not going to get my credit. So at the very worst, you can always come to us and we can make sure your transcript looks good in the system and you can print it out for your state. So we're not going to leave you stranded. So. Yep. And there's only three of us, so you know who to blame. Yep. If you deal with a Vision Expo East or West or um, some other big platforms, AOA, you're going to have a, a whole bureaucratic um conversation before you speak to a human we're the yeah. um well we're we're artificial intelligence we're not real people but we're three of us <laughs> and we we pride ourselves in answering within 24 hours it's rare that someone will send one of us an email and not get a response very quickly and most of the time problems are resolved tw yeah, 24 seconds is more likely when we respond to it so but uh, certainly within a day or so yep yeah. Okay. Yep. So let me uh, forward this on. So sure. again, you know, thanks to our sponsors for for being here and uh, being part of all all this stuff today. Um, you know, but actually, before we talk about our sponsors, I want to just pull through here and mention to folks who might still be here. We've sp spoken a lot about 2020. Let me just whoops. Um, I want to just bring up the fact that 2021 is around the corner. And people have already been asking, and in fact, even some of our speakers are asking, what are you doing about 2021? Uh, and so the answer is this. So see why 2021 will be a thing after our December show. We're going to take a hiatus um, and we're putting together already uh, lectures for 2021. The plan right now is to come back in March. So it's going to be 60 credits four live events plus on demand for one low price. So essentially we're going to give you a one-stop shop to be able to get all of your credits in the first half of the year uh, and get it and get it over with. So we plan to go live four times March, April, May, and June and we're planning to avoid all the major holidays and other events that may or may not happen in person because uh, we don't want to interfere with your plans in case you do actually get brave and feel like traveling to New York or Atlanta or Anaheim. <laughs> and Adam's being too kind saying we're going on hiatus that's in terms of the live events there's a lot that happens behind the scenes uh, in the next three months for us to get this program up and running so while you think we're um, lounging around um, the beaches uh, <laughs> with, with so, a snow foot we're, we're, we're working to make it as good as it possibly can so um, uh, just be aware of that 
it right. takes I mean, a good three or four right. months to get a program like this together. Absolutely, because we have to actually pick the content that we want, get the lecturers on board, then get them to actually come up with a topic. We have to run all of the stuff through COPE, and occasionally they'll you know reject the lecture, and we have to have go back and retool it. Um, and when you have an extreme number of credits like we do with 60, it, it takes a long time to do this and to get everything in place. Even and you skip the step. Everybody needs a quiz generated, which has to be approved by, uh, we use Nova Optometry School to approve the quizzes, which then can be sent to Arbo. Um, so it's a long process. And then uh, with all these A-plus speakers, um, getting them to agree on a schedule, et cetera, and making sure they're there. And, uh, and, and then dealing with the sponsors uh, is another aspect to it. So there's a lot of logistics and a lot of work behind right. the scenes. but. Uh, every year it gets a little bit easier because we, we know what we're doing. I mean, this this year was particularly difficult because, for instance, like adding new speakers to CUR, people are always like, why don't you add more lectures to CUR 2020? Well, it's not that easy because when you add a lecture, as you mentioned, you have the testing component. Because we like to put our content on demand, that means that people who came up with a lecture and already have it approved for live use have to then we have to go and resubmit it for on-demand use and submit a test to Nova right so you submit the test first that has to get approved then you can go back to Arbo and resubmit it for on-demand use so we have a couple of lectures like you can see this one with Craig Thomas about um, you know MGD and, and heat and heat and that one is not approved for on-demand use and it's not because we're yet. lazy yet and it's not because we're lazy it's because it takes time he you know we were, you can rush this through arbo for live use that's easy because there's no test involved as long as the content is good and the reviewers say everything's a-okay then that's great but the other half takes forever getting a test drawn up that actually looks decent sending that off to nova and then they take a while to approve it getting it back then running it through arbo again so the whole process takes a long time um so people and might this ask, particular year was even Yep. So it was worse because Nova was basically closed for a while. Yep. So they couldn't approve quizzes. They were very, very slow. They, they were working with skeleton staff as they were figuring out what to do with the optometric education. So that made it even more challenging um, just to understand the process. Yeah. So we're, we're not going to be asleep for the next you know several months in, in December. We'll probably take a few days off just to regroup. But then we have to get back on the horse and get everything together again. I think it's going to be an interesting thing. The reason we're choosing to do it... Um, from March, April, May, and June is because Arbo's rules are reverting back to the old ways at the end of June, according to them. So based on, on what they are telling us, we're going to do our best to let you maximize your credits before those rules revert. So my hope uh -huh. would be if anybody needed live credits, they'd see this, they'd react and, and quickly um, sign up for it instead of, you know, at least you'll have it in your back pocket right now. You may attend these live in-person events that are scheduled in April, May, and June, but you can't really bank on the fact that they're going to be there, um, just knowing what's going on in the country right now. So our goal cool. was to provide at least a backstop if you can't make it to these other things. At the very least, maybe you can go virtual and, and get everything done. And the virus is going to do what the virus is going to do. So if you recall, first Arbo, I believe, made it through April 30th, then they extended it to May, then June, and then suddenly to the end of the year. Um, so very well, that June 30th deadline might be a hard deadline. They might go back to the original way of doing things, or it might be extended ad infinitum to the end of the 2021, depending on vaccines. Are they working? Uh, are people getting the vaccines? Are people good, safe? Are they going to live conventions? Are they opening up convention halls? Are the governors allowing them to? So with all that in place, June 30th is a, I think, still a soft deadline. Uh, very well might be extended, but it might not, but we don't know, and it's, it's beyond our control, of course. Yep. Yeah, so the question is, why, why 60 credits? Why so many credits? And so, uh, the, answer, the, the obvious answer is, you tell them. <laughs> well, so the answer is this. What, what we want, so first of all, what we want is variety, right? So everybody, no matter what state you're in, you need at least 20 credits, right? Probably more, depending on what state you're in. And we want to give people the ability to fulfill their entire requirement, but also have variety, right? Because some things you just don't care about and don't want to listen to, right? I mean, you know, some people don't care about dry eye. Right. Some people don't care about vision therapy and we want people to be able to not take those if they don't want to. 
Um, also, by doing 60 credits, what we can do, what it's allowed us to do is we're setting up four simultaneous tracks. So, and we're going to be running the, the lectures four times. So, in theory, you could actually get every single credit if you wanted it by just, you know, doing a different lecture each time you show up for the show. And many states right. do allow, if your state, for example, uh, if you need 40 in a particular state, they often allow you to carry over credits. So, if you've taken 50, you can um, use the remaining 10 for the next um, uh, licensing period. So, often you can do that and take advantage of that with the 60 credits. Yep. So we're trying to make it as, you know, to be as flexible as possible, to give you as much as possible. And frankly, even if you do show up for a live conference, you know, if assuming that they're going, it might be nice to sign up for something like CEWire, get a lot of credits done virtually. Then when you go to a live conference, you can do something other than sit in classrooms all day. Um, because that's, right. that's always the problem with those, right? Like you go and you want to see people and you want to meet people and go to the exhibit hall and play with equipment and do fun stuff. But then it's like, oh my gosh, I'm trapped in a classroom um, when I'd rather be outside doing other stuff. So this could be Correct. an alternative to get some of the credits, you know, uh, so when you actually do go live and you want to actually see people again, <laughs> you don't have to sit in a lecture hall and just listen to someone droning on. I know Adam and I and, and Paul um, have gone to large um, events and we go to dinner and to, to be entertained about by a particular company, particular piece of equipment. There's no CE, but we like to go to these things. And we now have, we would have the time to do that if you accomplish your CE goals in another forum like this. Um, the company, when, when a company presents a, an event, it can't be for continuing education. Uh, ARPA doesn't allow that because you're, you're plugging one product or one uh, particular area. So um, it gives you more time, like, like Adam said. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that that's our goal is to free up your time when you're in person. Because I know I personally miss going to these meetings. The very last one I went to, actually, it's kind of funny. You know, you, you don't you never know what's going to happen in life and when the whole world's going to change. I was in Las Vegas in January. Um, for the, the Especially Contact Lens Conference. And who knew that that would okay. be the last time I'd ever travel anywhere. <laughs> I've been stuck here since <laughs> January. And it's, it's just, it's really shocking to think, you know, that the, the normal life that you had in an instant, it's like that, gone. Well, that's why I think the, the May um, New York City event is really up in the air because um, New York City is still um, a hotbed number one, and the governor is very, very conservative number two, as as is the mayor. So um, let's see what happens. They could always keep on um, either combining Expo East and Expo West, like they tried to do this year, and that didn't work out, mm -hmm. or just uh, move the date up to June, July, whatever, and then move um, the West one to, to more of the winter time. Yep. But we'll see. Again, these are not things that are in our control, but. Um, Hopefully uh, you understand all the things that we work under, all the problems and all the uh, flexibility we have to have. Yep. Okay. And so right now it looks like it's t uh, 1030 here in uh, in the West Coast. And so 130, um, it looks like Craig, Craig Thomas's lecture is just ending up and Clark Chang and, and B. Ron are giving their spiel about the emergency room again and Ben Cassell is giving his narcotics lecture which by the way the narcotics lecture has proven to be incredibly well attended this year and I think it's because a lot of states are starting to really up their narcotics requirements um, so definitely that's a good one to go to because it's two hours long we also have a single hour one uh, tomorrow I believe it is Let me look that up see if I'm that's lying that's with Bob uh Dr. Joe Pizmente has yeah. a, a lecture on narcotics, which is a whole different slant, but both fulfill requirements as far as I'm concerned with uh, the yeah. state boards. I know New Jersey accepted them. Yeah, so that's that's the very last talk tomorrow. So that's not today, so that one, that'll be tomorrow. Um, so yeah, lots of, of interesting stuff going on, and we're looking forward now to 2021. You know, we're going to have many of the same speakers back, but what our requirement is for all of the speakers that we have back is that we want totally new content. Um, that's always our shtick here, right? We never recycle stuff year over year. Mm -hmm. We want completely new stuff. So, um, you know, a lot of the speakers might be similar, although we are going to bring on a bunch of new blood as well. As you know, we like yep. to rotate the yeah. speakers in and out. Yeah. And speaking of, speaking of speakers, uh, we do read those forms where you criticize or compliment the speakers. Yep. So fill, fill out those forms because a lot yep. depends on 
on that who, who we ask back yeah so we the the survey forms are obviously optional at the end of each talk we recommend you fill them out though especially if you have something important to say there's qualitative fields where you can there's a text field where you can just fill it out let me know we do read these things and we have huge data sets now from this this year obviously because so many people have taken the conference so we have a sense of what's working and what's not um, so definitely fill those out and let us know we will read all of them so. okay I think we should go through the sponsors again sure. give them some um, sure. give give them them some information about what's available yeah let people know what's happening and uh, yeah let's give it a shot here I will start from the beginning I guess it's always a good place yeah well, there was a discussion on OD wire about which uh, which equipment to purchase and that's always a question that's asked in our instrument forum asking uh, colleagues what what they uh, what are they happiest with because uh, a lot of companies are me too companies where they they have the same pretty much the same equipment uh, offered and some are, are more desirable than the others according to optometrists at least so uh, but you you should judge for yourself but by by visiting each of these uh, companies that you're interested in well you know it's a little yep. different too Paul, in, in your era, right? So if you had something like a four opter, this is something that you could look at quite easily. You could feel it. You know, these things were all mechanical. You got, kind of got a sense just by banging on it <laughs> of its quality. <laughs> these days, yep. things, things are a little bit different, right? Because there's so much high tech stuff built into these instruments that a purchase decision can be a lot more challenging because you can't see what's going on. It's not obvious. Um, so I think you really have to educate yourself into the ins and outs of each system and how you can integrate each piece of equipment into your practice. And into your software, number number two. And also, um, sometimes one of the biggest expenses is the service contracts to keep the equipment running. It's insurance, basically, and they're ridiculously expensive some pieces of equipment to um, to fix so you have to keep these service contracts active so that's something they that have to consider in the whole um, purchase price yep and again you know as, as one manufacturer once said to me the way the industry has gone now when you get a piece of equipment you really just need to consider it like like buying a German car no one really buys them right it's like you're, you're perpetually leasing things because the equipment will become obsolete you're not going to keep a piece of equipment anymore for 50 years at this point um, you know, you're going to be constantly running through them and you just have to think of it like a high-end German car where you know that this is going to be yours for the next five years or six years, but ultimately you're going to be moving on to something else. Um, and you just have to think about how that works in the context of your office. And the only exception is the Marco TRS systems, which last forever. <laughs> I could attest to that. Right. Those things seem indestructible. <laughs> shameless talk to Marco, but I, it's the truth. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because some, some of these pieces of tech, it's really alarmingly. The TRS, I guess, is one really good example where these things will not die to the point where the thing that kills some of these older systems is the operating system that they're running is no longer secure, right? So Windows mm -hmm. will Correct. obsolete yeah. something before the actual piece of equipment croaks. <laughs> I yep. think I think there Zeiss was, a lot was another of example too, was, right? Zeiss's old OCTs last yep. forever, but Windows, you know, doesn't. So yeah, <laughs> they ran off a Windows XP platform, and when that was not going to be supported anymore, you had to take it offline. You had to take it off the internet because um, you were um, uh, not you were not in compliance with the new laws. Uh, so you have to be careful of that. So sometimes you have to be. Uh, be aware that if the computer's within the device, it might not be as good as a side-by-side -side one where they can update it. Uh, and those, those are questions that you don't know to ask until it's too late. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So yeah, these are these are the issues that you have to tackle these days. I mean, in some in some respects, I kind of feel for people who are just starting up their practices and have to make these decisions um, because they they take you down a certain path just by making certain decisions that you may or may not be able to get off of easily. So you really have to do your research carefully. Sure. And you do make mistakes. Um, I, just, I bought something called a molding machine uh, about 20 years ago. It was able to mold lenses and make progressive lenses and very inexpensively. And it was a, it became a planter. Now it's in somebody's garbage can. Um, <laughs> so it was a bad decision I made based on the fact that I thought uh, it worked, but it was a very 
difficult thing to, to make happen in the office, and it just didn't work properly. And if I would have done better research, I would have found that out. Yep. So we all make mistakes. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's, it can be really difficult to tell. So just do your research and, uh, and keep your fingers crossed, I guess. I know Paul has made, in, in his day in practice, in fact, you know, when back in the 80s, I remember when computers were just a new thing in people's offices, I remember him trying to implement systems. And back then, oh, yeah, yeah, a lot of it was custom. And um, talk about mistakes, <laughs> expensive mistakes. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, things, things, things are not easy sometimes picking equipment. But, you know, we can talk about our sponsors, though. Marco, as we just mentioned, their TRS, which... <laughs> Is like an anvil and will never die. Um, so, so, I mean, Marco has always been known for that, right? This has been their their shtick. You know, Paul would have a Marco equipment in his office that must have been, I don't know, thirty years old or, or older. Um, so, so you know, their stuff lasts forever. So, thank you to them for sponsoring the conference again. Uh, they've been sponsoring this live stream since the beginning. Um, so, thank you for having them. You know, for 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 believing in us. You know, from the beginning. Without them, there probably wouldn't be a conference because they gave us a little impetus to go ahead and do this. So, thank you to them. So, Optos makers of wide field cameras. Again, we've spoken about them extensively before. We got several wide field lectures going on here today, which cover all the different brands of wide field cameras. Um, you know, what's funny about wide field is that it's becoming so common. I remember when it first came out, and people sort of waved their hands. Oh, we don't need this. Oh. You know, this is just a sort of an add-on. It's like frippery. But now, uh, I think, you know, most practices, if they don't have one, they're really con- starting to consider it. It's become very mainstream. Sure. So thank you to Optos for sponsoring today. Kona Medical, makers of a wide variety of devices, and they want to just remind you that they have deferred payments and six months no interest on approved credit for all devices. And there are tax implications for buying equipment. Um, in this case, iKinetics qualifies for Section 179, but also the ADA tax credit, possibly, depending on your situation. So that's something I think that people really need to start thinking about as the end of the year approaches, right? The tax ramifications of buying stuff. And that's why in our December show, we're really going to hammer this home. I'll have a bunch of the vendors come back here and talk to us a little bit about the tax ramifications of buying their equipment. Um, because I, I think it's an important time, especially by mid-December, you should have an idea of how your practice did during the year. Um, you know, for some, it was challenging. For others, apparently, it's, it's gone gangbusters uh, since many areas have reopened. So. so you and your accountant can determine what's the best thing to do in terms of if you do buy an expensive piece of equipment, whether to depreciate it all at once or do it over several years, and you can make that decision at the end of the year. Yep. So Mackey Health, makers of supplements um, containing lutein, mesozeaxanthin, and zeaxanthin. So, um, you know, Steve, you have experience with that. Their formula is a little different from the ARIDS formula that most people are familiar with because uh, it's got zeaxanthin in it. That seems to be more... Exactly. Uh, mesozeaxanthin. So we've spoken about it in the past, but um, it's a more effective product, and you could use it in, can- in combination with ARIDS, too and get a better result for your patients and, and make a profit in doing so. Uh, easy company to deal with. Um, you can stock it in the office. You can have the patients buy it online. And um, if you want to listen to a lot of the science behind it, uh, you could. John Nolan has given his live lecture. You can follow it again in December or um, go online, listen to it on demand. Just the education loan is worthwhile. And Luno Technology, so they're a platinum sponsor of CUR 2020. Again, makers of a wide variety of devices. You just saw their uh, refraction system that uses a tablet so you can socially distance from folks. Um, so we've done a bunch of webinars with them. You can see here there's a webinar all about setting up dry screening in your practice's office. I may want to rerun that one actually in a few minutes uh, just to show people what that's all about as well. Um, so Luno is one of these, you know, companies that makes a lot of high-tech devices. By the way, if you look at, at the, their little logo on the up, upper right-hand corner of the screen, you'll see that Luno is actually a tie-up of a bunch of different companies that you may be familiar with, right, including Brio Edgers. Um, so they, they're sort of a conglomerate of, of all these companies coming together. Um, so definitely check them out. Uh, you can see there the remote refraction system and so forth. Um, we have a, <laughs> I've got another webinar with them actually coming up on, I guess, Tuesday, um, talking about uh, this very topic about how to use these new digital refraction systems in your practice in a wide variety of practice settings, uh, which is going to be really interesting. We even have one 
doctor who has like 10 or 11 locations around Chicago. Um, but she only has like, I think three doctors or something rotating through all of them and using this remote refraction system, she can even um, do a refraction and look at the data over the internet. So physically, she may not even be in the same office as where the patient is, but if she needs to do a refraction or check somebody else's results, she can do that remotely. So pretty neat stuff. It's allowed her to actually open up all these storefronts really rapidly. And if you go to lunotechusa.com and uh, slash ZWire, you can see all the stuff that they have going on. Just to mention what's happening in the field, I won't mention the company's name because it's not a sponsor yet, um, but they're going to have kiosks and malls where they're going to have some of this high-tech equipment where you pay a certain fee and uh, you basically go through a, an eye exam of sorts. And then a remote doctor will um, review the findings and decide whether you have to go and have a real examination based upon retinal photos, OCTs, et cetera. So even that technology is going to be starting up. You're going to be seeing this company in a lot of malls. They're very well financed. Um, so just the, the world's changing. Absolutely. I think in the past, one of the impediments to doing this was that the machines were not smart enough to determine whether or not they could get a good scan. And I think the intelligence uh -huh. of the machines and the speed is such that they're doing a much better job of tracking and making sure that the scans are good so that someone who rel has you know, relatively little education in actually operating the device can do it properly and you can get good data out of it. I think that's probably the biggest, one of the biggest reasons that these devices are now you know, able to be used in that way um, and obviously being able to transmit the data really quickly. Um, it's just amazing. I'm, I'm looking into buying an, um, the iPhone 12. My I have a 6S Plus or something. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say. And um, the software that's in these phones to take a good picture is just amazing. So if uh, Apple can do it, I'm sure these other companies can do it also. The processing that goes on, the editing that goes on, when you take a picture that you don't even know has happened. It, it's shockingly different. In fact, I have a 12 mini that I got yesterday sitting in front of me. And... Um, mm -hmm. I was really surprised by the quality of the camera compared to my old, you know, basically a 6S. Right. It was shockingly yeah. different and able to... Have pick you tried up. the low light level? Well, that's the thing. I mean, it can pick up inc an incredibly low light. That's surprising to me. And it unlocks itself, you know, with your face, but it can do it in the pitch dark. And, and I, I just, mm -hmm. I'm just shocked by it. Like when I, when I woke, because this is the first day I've had this thing, right? I'm used to my obsolete piece of garbage phone. This one now, when I woke up this morning and picked up my phone, it was pitch dark outside because it's Oregon and it's November. And it was able to unlock my face in total darkness. So I keep wondering, wow. how did it do that? And, you know, what, what else can it pick up? So you're right. The amount of technology crammed into these phones now is remarkable. So you can imagine that a purpose-built device right. for eye care you know, like the one you're talking about in the mall kiosks can have all kinds of logic built into them. So yep. pretty neat stuff. Exactly. A little caveat here just for a second, guys. Um, Craig Thomas is finishing up his lecture, and he's an excellent lecturer. So somebody wrote, love your sense of humor, Dr. Thomas. Normally these lectures are boring, and I can't stand them. <laughs> Thomas wrote, boring is never going to happen here with me. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> if you ever listen to him, that is absolutely the case. Yeah, he is He's very interesting, and he practices what he preaches. He eats his own dog food, which I love about him. He, When you get a lecture from him, what he's telling you is what he actually does in his practice every time. Um, he's not going to talk about anything theoretical or stuff that he wouldn't do. You're, you're getting the, the truth as he sees it, which I really love about him. <laughs> On the other hand, just to uh, divert, um, we had a lecture, a prominent national speaker, um, on CY the first or second time, and he'll go nameless or she'll go nameless. But uh, every time I attended a live lecture, they they happen to have this case show up that week in their office. <laughs> and after a while, you realize that <laughs> these, these things weren't happening in their office, but they were being made up just to present the point, which is okay. It's education. Um, but uh, Craig really does and practices what he preaches. Yep, and if you've ever seen his cases on ODY, yeah. or he'll document a lot of them. He'll just whip out the camera. He's got a really great camera uh, attached to a slit lamp, and he'll document everything that he does, and uh, really fascinating stuff that he sees in his office. Yeah, here's a little flash that just came in on ODY. Uh, it may be worthwhile just reading it so we can answer it once and for all. As these questions keep coming in. I have read the information about the 63 COPE approved credits that was written on May 19, 2020. 
I just need trust but verify that for this cycle in these states, especially Texas, it is approved for the CE Mario 2020 November and December dates. Okay, so we can say it's approved, correct? Yes. We know Texas okay. for sure is, yes. The information does include, include listings on the Arbor, Arbor CE tracker transcript. Does it also include a digital sort of certificate for each course that I can also copy? So what, and, and also email to the state board for renewal of license. Yeah, so what you, get, does, yes. what, what you get with us is a listing of all the courses in one transcript, kind of like a report card that you might get from school. So we have a control panel that you log into uh, when you're part of CEY, and it lists all the courses that you've completed, their, their COPE ID number, and the number of hours for each one, if that makes sense. And all the stuff about the event ourselves, the administrator, uh, the company doing it, when it took place, et cetera. So all that information is the digital footprint you need, I think. Yep, I think so. I, I've never heard it otherwise. I mean, we've been doing this now for uh, how many years? Oh. Six years? And uh, we haven't gotten any pushback. Six, so. seven years. Yeah, it's been, it's been a while. 18, 19, 20, yeah, six years plus a lot of other individual events, um, which we might mention. Um, we're doing an event in January uh, through um, ISVA and February. Society February, yeah, no, they, they've, they've, February, they've February, 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 February. They want to avoid the Super Bowl completely, so they're going to be going in late February. <laughs> so, yeah, if you're a sports vision company, you want to avoid the Super Bowl, I think. Yeah, so, but yeah, that's going to be a great one. So this this one looks super fun. So it's all about sports vision, and they've expanded sports vision to include esports. If you look at the uh, the syllabus hasn't been published yet, actually, we're going to have their website up next week hopefully late next week, and we're going to be publishing sort of the, the topics they have planned, and, and they're really interesting. Um, you know, I didn't think esports would be included, but I guess if you think about it, that, um, you know, it's important, especially for, for younger folks these days. That, things like Xbox, etc.? Yeah, so esports, you know, they have sports leagues for various games now, um, and these are... Madden... Well, no. So uh, games that you probably would not have heard of, um, you know, games like League of Legends, okay. um, where you know the, you have what they call these, you know, these leagues, these esport leagues, and they have huge prizes if you win, millions of dollars. So this has uh -huh. become a real thing. And, and you know, before the pandemic, people used to show up to stadiums to watch people play sports, which seems a little odd, I think, if you you know are of a certain generation. But this is what kids are doing now. Um, and so uh, this lecture, I think, is going to be all about training people in esports, probably a lot to do with dry eye, I would imagine, because people don't blink, and mm -hmm. probably trying to get their reflexes faster as well. Um, so, and to be clear, these, these lectures are all going to be COPE approved with two numbers, both to take it live and online, and will satisfy your state board requirements in, in the areas that you need to be. Yep. So, um, again, another uh, little iteration of CY, a small conference so that's focused on one particular um, area. I did see somebody won like $3 million or something because he was the best in a football game um, <laughs> online. Did, yeah. Did you see that? Yeah. So, so uh, what, what, That was the big one. So, I mean, you, you know, you, you'd be shocked to see the amount of interest that there is. Like, for instance, I know the, the old owner of the Mets, I know they were cheapskates and chiselers and so forth, but they had purchased any sports team for something like $20 million. So people are starting mm -hmm. to pay very serious money to, to buy into successful esports teams. So this is a real thing. This is not going away. It's not some, you know, frivolous thing. Um, so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what this talk is all about and how they incorporate esports. Uh, okay, here's a lot, here's a lot a of question. other stuff. A sure. question came in uh, that you might want to answer, Steve. To take a look at the chat. See the chat? Oh, oh yeah, I'm, going, I'm in the conference itself. Let me go down to the oh, chat. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, yeah, I was... Uh, no, I'm, I'm here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the question is two different COPE numbers for the same course? Yes. Same talk. Uh, the first COPE number... I wonder probably the first COPE number is yeah, the live one, and the other one is the on-demand? Yeah. I have to look. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you which one. Adam's looking now, but basically to the person, I'll, I'll write an, a written answer. But we need two COPE numbers because an on-demand lecture where you take a quiz has to be designated differently than the live lecture, which you're watching live with the, with the speaker interacting. So Yeah, I'm not sure why two. the number would be different there. So it's the same. Stringham has given the same talk at, at all the events, so that number should be the same throughout. Mm -hmm. And 
if it could be that whoever coded this today fat fingered it when they entered in the Arbo ID number, uh, but we'll definitely take a look at it to make sure that it's right. Yeah, the trouble is it's a lot of numbers are different. It's not like a, a three two to a two three, but whatever. Yeah. We'll, we'll we'll rectify that. Not yeah. a problem. Yeah. Thank you for bringing it up, Jeff. Yep. But in general, when you take a course live, theoretically, I think you could take the course on demand also because they're two different club numbers. I don't know if anybody would want to do that, but um, theoretically, it's a different course. This is a weakness of Arbo's system, of course, and as far as I know, they have no way of actually preventing that from happening, unfortunately. Um, I think they don't really the see the title. System. Yeah, they don't see the title. They just see the number. So, uh, it, you know, it's. I, I hope that people don't do that. I don't know if Arbo has a way to check it, though. This is a weakness in their system. So what are you going to do? So that applies across the whole field of optometry. It's not us. It's not generic to us. No, no. Anybody else is doing a, a live event and also on demand. Yeah, when we submit to Arbo, the only fields we give them is the, uh, the COPE ID number and then your OE tracker number. Like, literally, this is, a, um, this is something that people should also appreciate. Those are the only two fields we give them when we submit a list of credits. We don't even give you give them your name. We don't give them your grade, certainly, if you're taking a test. We don't care about that, and they don't either. As long as you pass, you pass. So we pass the minimal amount of information back and forth uh, be between us and them. So, yep. Anyway, let me uh, get back to the sponsors here. So where were we? Oh, HOG, sure. so Makers of the Octopus. So again, uh, you know, sort of the leaders in perimetry. Take a look uh, at the octopus and how much smaller it's gotten over the years uh, and how the industrial design has changed. So if you're looking for a perimeter, go to their booth, check it out, see what deals they have. I actually don't know what deals they're running today, but you might want to go and see. The Neurovisual Medicine Institute. Um, so they identify the uh, you know, patients who have binocular vision dysfunction and they use fractional units of realigning prism to treat it. Um, so this is a place where you go physically. It's in uh, suburban Detroit. It's about a half hour from the airport, um, and you can you take a uh, multi-day long course describing what this issue is, how to fix it, and then they give you materials on how to integrate this into your practice and become a local expert in treating this. Uh, and then they have a referral network as well that you sort of get to be part of. Um, so definitely go check them out, see, see what they have to offer. The Institute is up and running. I spoke with them yesterday. Uh, you know, they're following a variety of safety protocols to make sure everyone's okay. Um, but they are, you know, functional and running, so you might want to check it out. So Tear Care, makers of the device for uh, my bone gland dysfunction. You see it looks kind of like a hockey puck there. It's very small, rechargeable, um, and most importantly, inexpensive. So the first generation of these devices cost six figures this one is an order of magnitude less i think i don't have the actual prices today but i think it's around ten thousand um, dollars yep get, about get, that yep to get started and then you get also the uh you can see there the actual things that go on to the uh, lids themselves those are the consumables and the consumables are also cheap whoops which is what i, I should also mention um the you know one of the drawbacks of the first generation devices with the consumables were, were hideously expensive um, so even if you did invest in the device itself, the consumables would also be priced high enough that it would be very difficult to you know turn a profit on the machine because you'd have to charge so much to patients. So this thing is like an order of magnitude less in cost, and because it is so much cheaper. And you know there was a study that was done this past summer, which showed that that you know this device has similar efficacy to some of the more expensive ones. So what this means is that general practices now can take a risk and get involved uh, in using a device like this. So tear care. Absolutely. Yeah, so you might, might want to go check them out, especially if you haven't ever used heat before. This, this might be something to try in your practice in conjunction, obviously, with other modalities as well. So VTI Natural View, makers of a custom multifocal uh, one-day lens. Uh, one of the great uses of this lens, off-label use, of course, is for myopia control. Uh, but as Steve, as you said in your practice as well, you also use it as it was meant to be used as a multifocal. Yep, and that's a nice profile in terms of the plus in the periphery, so people get a, a lot of reading help, and uh, its profile for myopia control seems to be better than some of the, one of the approved products, my site, in my uh, professional opinion. Um, but it was the first one that we really used extensively um, 
the, the D-centered lenses, meaning the distance vision in the center, seem to be the signs that would work better, and they have a D-centered lens. Uh, other companies have them also, but they weren't designed um, in such a way to be as uh, advantageous with a better outcome than the natural view lens. So recommended for multifocal fitting and certainly for myopia control yep. in your practice. And Zeiss, uh, the instrument manufacturer we know and love. Uh, so Zeiss has been incredibly supportive of the conference, so thank you to them. Uh, for sponsoring it again go to their booth to see what discounts they're offering today of course they have devices like their octs um, and the the new claris uh, wide field camera which is an amazing device you know when you look at it you know unfortunately most people can't get to see it in person now because there are no trade shows going on but it is tiny um, for a wide field camera just absolutely shocking um, how small it is and how far the technologies come. So definitely go check that, that out and check them out. Um, and again, Zeiss has also been at the forefront of helping practices deal with things like social distancing and cleaning their equipment. They had and still offer um, shields for slit lamps and other instruments. If you go to Zeiss.com, you'll actually, uh, there's a site, if you type med support now into Google and Zeiss, uh, you'll get to the page where they discuss all of these things to help your practice get back to some semblance of normal. And some, thank goodness, are free. So yeah. uh, great for Zeiss doing that. One of the the funny things, too, about Zeiss, and we mentioned it before, I started talking about Luno and their Samsung tablets. Zeiss also, if you want to socially uh, distance yourself from the patient with their OCT units, Zeiss's machines use industry standard cables like the kind you order off Amazon, like HDMI cables and so forth. And they give you instructions on their site on how to install all that stuff yourself. So you don't have to like have somebody from Zeiss come out to help you, you know, work these devices remotely. Um, you can it's literally a, a DIY situation and they'll tell you what you need to order from Amazon to do it. So that's pretty neat too. Um, there's no waiting around to actually get it done. You can do it yourself. You know, it's interesting to see Zeiss. They've been around a long, long time. If you ever go to the contact lens uh, museum, you'll see some Zeiss stuff from probably from the beginning of the 20th century that they've been doing. So they've been in business for a very, very long time. Yep, we got to see and Zeiss is always synonymous with quality. Yep. Well, yeah, we got to see the most painful looking contact lens I've ever seen in my life. Those Zeiss scleral lenses from the 1920s. Um, <laughs> I don't know who was wearing those things, but yeah, they were very brave. Okay, so it's AB Max, makers of this device for anterior blepharitis. Looks a little, lot like a Dremel tool. Um, and you, many people have or have heard of the first generation device. I won't name brand names. This is a, a second generation device, and the, the founder and creator of AB Max also created the first generation device. He actually held the patents on it. Um, so he sort of went back to the drawing board and came up with a better design and most importantly a cheaper design where the consumables cost about half as much uh, as the first generation device. So even if you own a first generation device, you may want to upgrade uh, to this. Not only does it work better with more modes, but um, the consumables are, are so much cheaper that if you use this thing at all, um, you're going to make back your money relatively quickly. That's precisely what we did in our office, and we the first device is no longer used. Yeah, and the other thing to know about this is that they'll help train your staff uh, via Zoom um, to, to get your staff up and running on how to use it, because the intent is not that the doctor will use it, uh, but that the staff will take over ultimately and do it themselves, because it's not a painful procedure. It just takes a little bit of practice to do, and it tickles a little bit on the lids, and then they'll get a little um, certificate as well when they're done training. You can put up on the wall so it can make the make your uh, tech feel good and make the patient feel good as well. So Neuralens, uh, this is a company that builds a device that measures misalignment between the two eyes and then they, uh, and you can see the device there on the screen, the patient, basically it's an automated exam, the patient sticks their head in and they follow instructions. At the end, the device gives a, a prescription out and you use that to create custom lenses with contoured prism from Neuralens's own lab. Uh, turnaround time is quick. The optics are good. We actually, I have a pair of neural lenses here that they made up for me just with a, it's about a quarter diopter just to help me read at the computer. And then it has that prism built into it. Um, and it definitely, at least from, from my eyes, you know, it, my eye strain feels a bit better using it. Um, so you might want to go check it out and see, see what they have to offer. Um, they had a deal where you, you didn't have to make any payments through the end of the year last year. I, I don't know what they're doing this year. Uh, go to their booth and I'm sure you'll get more details on it. 
So Oculus makers of a wide variety of devices, including the Pentacam and Karatograph, and most importantly for today, the EasyField S. So this is a perimeter, and you can see they're offering um, a for $59.95 and six months of warranty um, on these sort of open open box sales on, on their perimeters. And what you can't see here is how small this thing actually is. Um, it doesn't weigh very much. You can easily stick it in your car if you want to use it in a wide variety of settings like nursing homes and so forth, um, or just have it around your office as a backup uh, to your existing perimeter. The coolest part about it, I think, is probably that it, you can do it, um, the room doesn't have to be dark. So this really yep. is the kind of device you can use any place. And we had one, or have one, and uh, use it all the time, first as a primary, then a secondary field tester, and it does everything the um, more elaborate brand names uh, do in terms of uh, threshold fields. It's not a just a screening device. It's a full-functioning um, field test that you can ma manage glaucoma and uh, neurological conditions, et cetera. Yep. And science-based health makers of Hydro Eye. So again, this is a supplement for dry eye. What science-based health does with their formula is if you go look at the ingredient list or their label, um, they take the latest research and that's what they use when they formulate how much of each ingredient to put in and what ingredient to use. Their website has like an encyclopedia of data about this stuff. Uh, and their staff is incredibly knowledgeable too. Uh, maybe for the, the, the grand finale, we'll get Zach Denning from SBH back here uh, to talk to us a little bit, maybe update us on what's going on in the world of nutrition, if there are any you know, new studies that have come out um, you know, around supplementation for dry eye, because he knows them all. So uh, pretty neat stuff. So definitely go to their booth and check it out. Covalent Careers, so they are the lar largest job site in eye care. So if uh, you want to post for a job application for, a, for, you know, for an optometrist or an optician, or if you're looking for a new position, Covalent Careers is sort of the place to go. Now, for job seekers, they don't go to Covalent Careers site necessarily. What happens is when you post an ad through Covalent, they post that ad across their entire network of sites uh, and places even like Odiwire, which you know I can pull up here and show you. We have a little part in our site that says jobs and then Covalent, our, our site essentially goes out and sucks this feed in from Covalent and you can sort of see all the listings that they have now. So you know if you post with them, you, you, they have this network of sites that your ad will be seen at in a wide variety of places. So pretty cool stuff. Um, definitely check them out. And if you want to post an ad, you can see if you go to odiwire.org slash jobs, there's a 10% off coupon uh, for job listings. So if you want to post something up, you can get 10% off just by going here first and clicking through. And I Care Live, makers of a platform for um, so, so sort of the, the e-health revolution, right, doing virtual telemedicine. Um, and this one is specifically for eye care. So instead of just using Zoom or some unstructured tool, you know, when VSP or the federal government or whoever else, you know, all the, all the different uh, plans start to come back and ask, why are you doing all this stuff virtually? How do I know what you're, you're actually doing, what you're saying you're doing? I Care Live gives you a structured way to document all of these interactions, which you're going to need because people will ask you for documentation eventually. It might not happen today, it might not happen tomorrow because the pandemic is still going on. But you know, once we're about a year into this, I have a feeling that the insurers are gonna start tightening up their procedures and demanding more documentation, right? Um, sort of the mm -hmm. Wild West days are gonna be over. And so I Care Life can give you a platform where you can document everything easily when you're doing these uh, these sort of interactions with patients online. So definitely go check them out if you're looking for a sort of telehealth solution. By the way, one thing I just have to say, it's fascinating how the market has changed in just a few months. Whereas before, if you said telehealth, doing virtual exams or whatever, what would people have told you, right? You're nuts. This that is you're a terrible thing. on the yeah. ice, yeah. <laughs> it's a terrible thing. How dare you do this? And now it's the complete opposite. It's how can I keep my patient coming back to me uh, in an era where I can't mm -hmm. really ever see them? So this has become a, a crucial tool. So I Care Pro, uh, makers of websites uh, for I Care, as well as uh, you know packages that help you manage your social media presence, which is something you may or may not want to do yourself because it is complicated and time consuming. The most important thing they're doing too is help you manage your reviews these days, which is critical. 
because the reviews are becoming integrated in other products like maps so if you go to Google Maps or Apple Maps you know you'll see your practice on there it gives you a star rating right so when someone pulls up your name they'll see your name and then stars right beneath you you want to make sure that rating stays high and they have tools that can help you do that right to solicit reviews from patients who you know like you and because usually as we all know the internet is a haven for crackpots and disgruntled people <laughs> running OD wire I can say that with some confidence um, and people tend <laughs> to like to post things when they get angry right when they're unhappy about something <laughs> it's much rarer for people to post you know when they have a neutral experience or a good experience um, and so what I care pro can do is help you uh, you know inspire those people to actually fill out reviews so that when someone sees your site online they get a much more balanced view of what you're all about they're not just gonna see the negative stuff and people yelling and screaming they're gonna get the good ones too and it's gonna help your rating so uh, I care pros expert at this you definitely want to check them out and maybe use them for advice Black Rivera, so makers of punctal plugs, and they are offering a huge number of discounts at the show today for, for folks who are, you know, wanting to get into plugs again. So you can take a look at the list here. Um, you know, I, I think that there was a trend for a while where people got away from this, but now people are sort of slowly moving back towards it again. Um, so yep. if you're looking... And we've discussed at, why, because we're yep. better at treating it and better at using plugs when they should be used and at the appropriate times. they got a bad reputation back in, the, I guess, the late 90s, and now they're, they're back strong. Yep, so definitely check out Lack Rivera. Uh, people seem very happy with their... By the way, so, mm -hmm. something I should mention, people are sometimes reticent to get the um, permanent plugs put in, so they make a really good collagen insert, and you can see over a month period of time if the person's gotten relief based on their reporting and what you see, then you can go to the more permanent plugs, and patients uh, accept that uh, readily. Right. Okay, optometry time, so practical chair side advice. So it, the journal you know and love, so you can expect that the content there is going to be bite-sized, easy to digest, and actually practical. Not a lot of theory going on here. <laughs> this is meant for the active practicing clinician looking for, you know, quick bites of information. And as Gretchen Bailey would say, um, this is the kind of journal that you read, you digest the information, and then you throw it out. Do not keep these journals lying around as like a, a shrine to optometry times throw them away recycle them they're 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 meant to be timely and topical um, and then go away so definitely check them out they're obviously on the web too all the stories that you see in print are also on the web so if you don't want to wait, wait around for the print copy um, check them out online it's actually kind of funny to me you know when I, I talk to Gretchen a lot and she's always talking about the print issue and having to get the print issue to bed and to me it's like wow <laughs> that's something I never even think about the idea that there's an actual deadline for content that has to go to print um, so used to living in a digital world where just as you have something you put it out there so it's a kind of a fascinating thing to see the print still lives yep when you write a journal article for uh, Gretchen um, she's terrible uh, not terrible she's a um, let's say very hard on getting your um, uh, let's say footnotes etc exactly right syntax right etc so she's a good editor but she makes you work oh absolutely and yeah no she she's great because she knows that people don't want to read stuff that's poorly written so she will she you know mm -hmm. she's and then, by the way if you want to write for optometry times Gretchen is always looking for good writers um, and she will yep. help massage your content if you know you're you're not the best uh, at grammar and so forth <laughs> she corrects me all the time which is hilarious because um, I, I don't even you know write for her but she'll, she'll still give me her two cents about how crappy my writing is and I I appreciate it <laughs> <laughs> and finally Vision Equipment Inc so this is Leo Hadley's company so he buys and sells refurbished equipment so if you're looking to outfit a lane you may not want to spend you know on the highest end equipment to start with when you can get something that's pre-owned that's you know 95 percent of what a, a new uh, item might be for for you know a deep discount particularly now we know in COVID a lot of practices went bust so there's an inventory of this very lightly used equipment that's out there um, so you might want to contact Leo and see what he has his inventory is constantly changing obviously uh, so you want to go to his site go to his booth and then it'll direct you to his website so you can see what he's got going on right now so uh, he's been really great to work with over the years never had people complain about his the quality of his equipment we know from experience when he gets a piece of equipment he'll thoroughly refurbish it um, 
he started with edgers which are you know incredibly complicated if you've ever seen the inside of one you just it's mind-blowing but he's got great videos up on his site of you know taking apart an edger and, and refurbishing it and what that whole process looks like so it's kind of an amazing thing to see so that is vision equipment inc and i think uh, that's it for our sponsors and again i just want to remind everyone that c wire 2021 is coming um, we haven't really spoken too much about it yet i guess this is the first time so as as the slogan goes here it's going to be 60 credits with four live events plus on demand and one low price you pay once attend as much as you want and it's going to be march april may and june so we hope that you uh With plenty of time plenty of time um you know to, to get all of your credits in we hope that you at the very least can register and use it as a backstop if you're planning on attending the physical events that are apparently happening in the first half of the year so expo east SICO and the AOA have all announced plans for their physical meetings, which they believe are going to happen. Um, but you may want to use us as a backstop. Sign up for it, and if the physical events happen to fall through, at least you'll have a backup. Um, we've scheduled CE wires to, for 2021 so that it doesn't conflict with those events. So, you know, you'll have plenty of time um, to do ours, even if you attend those other events. So. Yep, nor any holidays, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Easter, etc. Yep, we try, try to avoid everything. So, uh, yeah. So hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put on a good show for you guys. We're going to have 60 all new credits. So um, I should probably make that very clear that these old lectures are going away. We may have several of the same speakers who got good reviews, but we're going to ask them to provide us with totally new content as we do each year. So with new content, we're going to get everything COPE approved again with new numbers. Um, so you can come on back and get more. So. And we do have lined up um, more than several new speakers, high profile, funny, and uh, great content uh, already in the, in the works. Yeah, I mean, we don't want this stuff to be boring. That's, that's the thing. So we want the speakers that we have to be engaging. That, to me, is the most important thing because, you know, who wants to go to something that's boring? So each year we try to get a little more refined. We ask for your reviews so we can see who to bring back and who not. You know, we'd like to have, you know, more speakers like Craig Thomas, really interesting to listen to, or Mark Friedberg, who makes, you know, complicated topics super simple to understand. Um, mm -hmm. So those, those are the kinds of folks that we want to get back. And again, if you have speakers that you might want to, to participate, let us know as well. If you know of some really good folks that you might not have worked with yet, we're always happy to entertain new people as well. Because so, obviously we don't know everybody. <laughs> so, I think that's it for now. So, Steve, do you have anything to okay. report? Is anything, ter is anything terrible happening out there? or is No, uh, nothing at all. It's actually, um, the lectures are great, but the uh, my job is boring. It, uh, people seem to know what they're doing. Several people still keep on putting their OE tracker number in the chat boxes and thinking we're going to you know, like take that. And I one by one explain to them, I, I keep on putting up the uh, blurb of how to get your credits. But eventually they'll figure it out. And by tomorrow, I think uh, it'll be very soon. So uh, of the um, events, I think uh, we have a lot of returnees and a lot of new people also. But the returnees know the playing field. The, the software is actually, we um, looked at a lot of platforms. We're always looking at new platforms to, to increase our technology. And this seems to be the most easy to navigate for the uh, attendees, and that's important. So we don't want to make it so, you know, we'd love to have avatars and, and uh, holograms so you can kick the tires on equipment and things, but that technology doesn't exist. But going forward, we're, we're always looking to improve that also. So, yes, it's very, very smooth. Yep. Very few um, questions. Yep. Yeah. And CUR 2021, the software will look a little bit different. We're actually going to be improving the way the vendor booths look uh, and the way you interact with the vendors. Um, there's going to be a component of video chat if you want there to be with the vendors. So that could be an interesting thing for people. Um, we're also going to streamline the process of you getting your credits, right, where you're going to enter in your tracker number when you register. So you don't have to worry about it or think about it. 
Uh, and just, you know, in general, streamline the navigation a little bit. The software will look a bit better, too, across devices. Um, right now, you know, when you, you can use it on an iPad, and a lot of people do take classes that way, we want to make it look even better. Uh, initially, of course, it was never designed for, for the iPad, and so we're going to be making these changes as well. So slowly but surely, we, we adapt. Um, but Steve, you're right. The most important thing is that it's easy to get in and easy to get to the lectures. Um, we don't want to well, overwhelm people with, you know, so many bells and whistles that it gets confusing as to what to do. I was, I was actually on a webinar the other day with a, a platform I'd never used before. And like, there were so many windows floating everywhere and so much stuff was in my face. I'm like, wow, you know, this is just, it's great because there's so much functionality. But on the other hand, like sometimes you just want to show up to a lecture and sit there. <laughs> right. I mean, it's the old kiss. Keep yeah. it simple, stupid. Yeah. Um, yes, it does a lot of things, and, and some big companies with big conferences and, and breakout meetings and things like that want to do this sort of stuff, but we don't have the need or the desire to make it more complex to, for our attendees. It, it would be more of a negative than a positive. Yeah, so it's it's a definitely a balancing act, and we're going to, again, update the software as we need to for these little changes, but... I, I am definitely on the side of not making things complicated. When you do this stuff, you want it to work, and you just want it to be easy. Right. But believe me, behind the scenes, we're always talking to the hosting platform to improve things. And um, because we're such regulars, we've done 9, 10, 11, 12 conferences with them. I can't even keep track. Uh, we're good clients, so they, they do listen to us. Yes, they absolutely do, um, and you know they're they're trying to accommodate us, and we'll have some time between now and CUR 2021 to make all those changes. You might actually notice uh, the first set of those changes if you attend the ISFA conference, the International Sports Vision Association conference that we're running in late February. In a very real sense, that's going to be the first time that we make a lot of changes to the platform that will be visible to people. So that could be a little sneak preview if you're interested in going to a specialty conference. Yeah. Should be exciting, or I might pull out the rest of my hair. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> software is always like that, right? It's uh, <laughs> yep. you never know what you're going to get. So, but well, we beta test uh, day one, but uh, usually it works out. Yep. All right. So, I mean, I, as I can see, nothing's really going on here. Things are just super stable and smooth. So we yeah. may call it quits early here today. I might just want to put on a, a webinar for people on our way out, just so people can see. Um, you know, we have so many of them here that people haven't seen before. Um, so I could, you know, do a flashback uh, to, let's see, so Craig Thomas's ERG lecture, which was a pretty fun one, or Whitney Hauser and um, Sue Resnick's Sue Resnick's lecture on ptosis. I think I might want to do that one because that is very topical and brand new. Yeah. Um, you know, there's drugs now for ptosis, which is something that there was never adequate treatment before, if you think about it, um, other than just ignoring it <laughs> or going to surgery, which nobody wants. Um, but now, of course, we have a drug that apparently works to treat this condition. Um, so Sue's going to and, and Whitney talk all about how this works and the, the sort of mechanism. And it's really fascinating stuff. I haven't heard much. Have you, Steve, heard much about the drug? And you know, now it's generally available. Um, no, the, the insight, I've heard about it, I've read about it, but it's really hard to get a sales rep into the office to discuss it and, and hopefully to give you a little sample. So the answer is that yes and no, and I think it's just starting to roll out, and hopefully in the next couple of months we'll hear more about it and, yep. and get, the, get it in our hands. Uh, very similar to the, uh, the drug for uh, neurotrophic keratitis. It was very slow. Dompe makes it mm -hmm. overwrite. Um, and now it's becoming more complex. It's not, that's not as common as ptosis, though. Uh, what I used to do with ptosis, is, and you probably learned this also, you know, give them 10% phenylephrine, yep. it stimulates Mueller's muscle, and it would raise it up a little bit, but you don't want to keep on putting in 10% phenylephrine into the eye, uh, and have one people dilated, one people not. So this is a far more effective uh, <laughs> therapy. But yeah, so... so did that. Yeah, so, you know, it, it's just, it's fascinating to me that, you know, these, the drug, you know, the drugs for ptosis, um, I'm trying to look here and see... I'm trying to see that if, what their distribution looks like right now. Uh, let me just take a look here because I want—I don't want to misspeak. I want to make sure that everybody has access to it across the country. Um, mm -hmm. But let me actually see. As Adam's finding that, just know that I'll be around all afternoon. I'm watching the Masters um, after this, and I'll be here with my computer and help you out and support and be in all the rooms and, and make sure all your questions are answered. So um, um, don't worry, we're not letting you go. Yeah, so this, you know, it is generally available up NEEK if we can get people, you know, 
yeah that's really interesting so yeah i'm sure at this point since they're just starting out their sales force right they're probably just getting their feet under them um so if you haven't seen a rep yeah, that education would, yeah. yeah so all right so cool so why don't we i'll i'll do this webinar and uh, if anybody has any trouble also so steve will be around and i'll be around too um you know to answer questions so i'll leave the chat window open here as well on the live stream and if you have any questions you know i'll i'll be here so uh i guess that's that's it for today and uh um, I guess have fun, everybody. So here's the webinar, and yep. uh, and um, I guess the next time we see each other online virtually will be in December, where we have the big blowout. So that should be really fun. So all right, everybody. So yep. have have a great day and enjoy the classes. Bye bye, guys. Hi everyone. Welcome to our talk on acquired blepharoptosis. We thank C. E. Wire for the opportunity to present on this uncommonly discussed topic. I'm here today with my co-presenter, Dr. Whitney Hauser. I'll be starting off the discussion by reviewing normal lid anatomy, the changes in structure and function which lead to blepharoptosis, and an overview of the etiology and classification. Dr. Hauser is then going to take us through the clinical workup and conclude with an overview of current treatment and management options. These are our disclosures. Let's start by just reviewing eyelid structure and function. If you'll recall, the closure of the eyelids is facilitated by the circumferential orbicularis oculi muscle, which is innervated by the facial or seventh cranial nerve. The elevators of the upper eyelid are the levator palpebrae superioris and Mueller's muscle. The levator is the main upper eyelid elevator and is innervated by the ocular mo motor or third cranial nerve. It originates from the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone and becomes fan-shaped and it extends through the aponeurosis as it enters the eyelid. It penetrates the orbital septum and extends into the upper lid, fanning out across the entire length and inserts on the anterior aspect of the tarsal plate. Mueller's muscle is a smooth muscle. It arises from the undersurface of the levator just posterior to the fornix and inserts into the superior tarsus. Mueller's muscle is innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. The muscle is responsible for the over-elevation of the eyelid, such as when a patient becomes excited or feel fearful, and if the patient is fatigued or inattentive, it can lead to mild ptosis. So how do we define ptosis? Ptosis is an abnormal, low-lying or drooping upper eyelid margin with the eye in primary gaze. It's a common disorder. There are millions of individuals affected in the U.S. and worldwide. Severity is typically assessed based on the amount of measurable eyelid droop, and Dr. House is going to go into this uh, in more detail a little bit later on, but just as an overview, if there is a droop of one to two millimeters, it generally leads to limited visual impairment, two to four millimeters with mild to medium visual impairment, and more than four millimeters with significant visual impairment. Blepharoptosis can be unilateral or bilateral, and based on the age of onset, we categorize it as either congenital or acquired. Acquired is typically associated with aging. So mechanically, ptosis is linked to the dysfunction of the muscles responsible for eyelid elevation. Loss of tonus in either of them will result in ptosis. Because the superior palpebral levator is the main retractor of the upper eyelid, deficiency in its function produces a more significant ptosis. The levator receives its innervation from the superior division of the third cranial nerve. Denervation of Mueller's muscle, on the other hand, will only cause a mild ptosis of about one to two millimeters. So what about epidemiology? How prevalent is this and in what populations? According to the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery, eyelid surgery was fifth among the top plastic surgical procedures in the U.S. in 2018 at over 110,000 procedures. It is the most common surgical procedure in the 65 plus age group. This slide looks at the result of a retrospective chart review study on all patients referred for ptosis 
to the oculoplastics division at the University of Illinois Eye and Ear Infirmary between 2007 and 2010. The final etiology for each patient's ptosis was determined based on history, standard eyelid measurements, and ancillary testing. And then they categorized it as aponeurotic, neurogenic, myogenic, traumatic, or congenital. And the demographics, including median age and sex, were analyzed for patients in each category as well. The ptosis um, clinical findings that they used were measurements of marginal reflex distance, levator function, palpebral fissure, and they used ancillary testing. For instance, single fiber electromyography and acetylcholine receptor antibody testing was used to help in diagnosing myasthenia gravis. Neuroimaging was used in cranial nerve 3 palsy, and Horner syndrome was tested for pharmacologically and then further investigated with imaging. And they concluded that a significant portion um, or proportion of patients referred with ptosis had more serious conditions such as neurogenic or myogenic ptosis. Thus, we as clinicians have to maintain a high degree of suspicion and thoroughly evaluate all patients with ptosis. We want to properly assess for underlying systemic conditions, and we're going to talk more about that shortly. But just keep in mind that the congenital group had the youngest median age at 10 and a half years, and the aponeurotic group had the oldest median age at 62 years. So how does ptosis impact patients' lives? I think we're all familiar with patients who come in and express dissatisfaction with cosmesis, um, but there are other things that patients will uh, experience as well. And while cosmesis may be the primary concern for some individuals with ptosis, more advanced cases are associated with visual field disruption, eyelid strain, altered head position in an effort to compensate, and headaches due to forehead and scalp muscle strain, and all of this can decrease a patient's quality of life. I know in my practice, a lot of times patients will come in just complaining that their eyelids feel really heavy, and they are actually aware of decreased visual function. So let's talk now about the causes of blepharotosis, and we're going to start by looking at congenital versus acquired. Congenital blepharoptosis is typically caused by developmental myopathy of the levator muscle. Acquired, on the other hand, is most often caused by stretching of the levator or disinsertion of the muscle complex from its insertion on the anterior to superior tarsal plate. But it can also be caused by reduced nervous input to the muscles that elevate the eyelid, and we call that neurogenic injury, which is traumatic, excess skin or heaviness of the eyelid, which is mechanical. And then there are certain cases, they're not as common, they're quite rare, where there's actually primary muscle dysfunction, such as in certain forms of muscular dystrophy, uh, which we call myotonic dystrophy or myogenic blepharoptosis. So an overview of aponeuroticosis clinically, how do these patients present? You'll see a reduced MRD1, which we call margin to reflex distance. You will see a high upper eyelid crease. There will be near normal levator function, and there will be decreased palpebral fissure in down gaze. So as the patient looks down, the palpebral fissure actually reduces at a higher rate than somebody who does not have levator dysfunction. In myogenic and congenital ptosis, you'll see a weak or absent eyelid crease. You'll see poor levator function and again, eyelid lag on down gaze. So this is just a schematic um, on how to break down congenital versus acquired. You'll see that congenital will define as occurring or diagnosed at birth to about a year, and then acquired um, from a year on. And in both categories, we can further subdivide them into isolated and non-isolated. So let's first talk about congenital ptosis. It's ptosis that's present as bir at birth, as we said, or within the first year of life, and it's most commonly isolated, which means it's not associated with other ocular findings. In about 75% of the cases, it's unilateral. 
The majority of congenital ptosis is due to myogenic descent, dysgenesis of the levator muscle. It most often does not affect vision, but in severe cases, the drooping eyelid may occlude all or part of the pupil and may interfere with vision, resulting in amblyopia. Congenital ptosis may occur through autosomal dominant inheritance. So when we see a child with um, ptosis, we want to be sure we are finding any underlying cause. It may be a good idea to question the parents about other relatives having been born with a lid problem, and certainly we want to address it to prevent any potential amblyopic changes. To briefly review other possible causes of um, isolated congenital ptosis, there's something called synkinetic ptosis, which many of us will remember as Marcus Gunn jaw winking syndrome. And if you recall, that's a rare congenital ptosis, and it's due to an aberrant, aberrant innervation of the levator muscle by the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. So what happens is there's a brisk upper eyelid retraction when the person is chewing, smiling, or sucking, and often the parent will notice this right after birth when they're feeding the child. In aponeurotic ptosis, that's a congenital defect results from a failure of the aponeurosis to insert on the anterior surface of the tarsus from birth, and it can follow a forceps delivery, and the skin may remain, the skin crease may remain normal or high, depending on where the aponeurosis is affected. The levator function is generally good, and there is no lid lag on down gaze. And to review just a few of the causes of non-isolated congenital ptosis, that may be due to close embryological development of the levator and the superior rectus muscles. Congenital ptosis may be associated with superior rectus weakness. And then there is a congenital form of Horner's syndrome, which can occur in infancy, which also presents, just like in adulthood, with ptosis, meiosis, anhydrosis, and progressive heterochromia. Again, the lighter colored iris will be ipsilateral to the affected side. And the lesion may occur anywhere along the oculosympathetic pathway. So in these patients, it's important to evaluate for possible etiologies, such as congenital varicella, tumors of the neck and mediastinum, and vascular lesions of the internal carotids or subclavian artery. And then there's congenital third cranial nerve palsy, which may be partial or complete, and it may present with uh, ptosis together with other signs, such as the inability to depress, elevate, or adduct the eye, and the pupil may, may be dilated. So let's focus now on acquired blepharitosis, which is the main subject of our talk from this point on. Acquired blepharoptosis is typically associated with aging. A study of 400 patients in the UK found that blepharoptosis was present in over 11% of adults aged 50 and old, older. And if we extrapolate this to the United States population, this prevalence corresponds to an estimated 13 million patients aged 50 plus in 2020. Other known risk factors, either temporary or permanent, include ocular surgery, and this can include glaucoma surgery, cataract surgery, corneal strabismus, which can lead to temporary or permanent blepharoptosis. Contact lens wear, wearing hard or soft contact lenses, has been found to increase the incidence versus no contact lens wear, and one potential mechanism would be levato aponeurosis dehiscence due to the method of hard contact lens removal. And then, of course, we always have to be suspicious for underlying disease, <clears throat> such as myasthenia gravis or diabetes. <clears throat> as previously discussed, you know, similar to congenital ptosis, acquired ptosis may be categorized as isolated or non-isolated. The most common cause of isolated acquired ptosis is aponeurotic. It's most common in adults. The abnormality is in the levator. There is a dehiscence, disinsertion, or stretching. It can occur in younger patients as well. In younger patients, as mentioned, repeated manipulation of the upper eyelid during contact lens wear, and this can occur in both hard and soft lens wearers, may cause disinsertion of the levator. It occurs frequently after ocular surgery and following trauma. There are some other causes, though, and that can include eyelid trauma from infection or allergy, 
blepharochalasis, pregnancy, chronic use of topical steroids, and frequent lid rubbing. Mechanical ptosis is caused by excess weight of the upper lid. There are a multitude of causes that can easily be dis distinguished on physical exam. A few common causes are edema, inflammation, tumors, chalasia, dermoid cysts, neurofibromas, and amyloid deposits. And scarring from inflammation, surgery, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, or ocular pemphigoid can also lead to mechanical ptosis. Always perform orbital imaging in patients with an underlying mass or infiltrative lesion. Acquired traumatic ptosis can develop as the result of any trauma to the orbit. Traumatic ptosis can be neurogenic, aponeurotic, myogenic, or mechanical in nature. Iatrogenic causes account for roughly 50% of traumatic blepharitis. And traumatic ptosis has been reported to account for 11.2% of blepharoptosis in a tertiary care oculoplastic setting. And there was a study that showed 4% to 12% after cataract surgery procedures. And there's about 10 to 12% after trabeculectomy alone and combined trabeculectomy phacoemulsification. The causes can include disinsertion of the levator muscle or damage to the levator tendon with scar formation. Alternatively, cranial nerve 3 damage can also sustain damage leading to the ptosis. In severe cases that result in significant damage to the levator, patients may require multiple surgeries with a poor probability of restoring natural eyelid anatomy. Patients who are at increased risk for cranial nerve 3 involvement include those, include those with head trauma injuries, post-traumatic cavernous sinus thrombosis, orbital apex fractures, and nerve compression by foreign bodies. Patients with CN3 damage will typically resolve on their own with time and should be observed, observed for spontaneous recovery over a period of three to six months before considering surgical intervention. As we mentioned, rigid lens-induced eyelid ptosis is a well-established condition it's thought to be caused by years of mechanical traction from pulling the lids while removing the lens. Patients can typically resume wear of their lenses two to six weeks after surgery and are instructed to use a plunger. Some patients, however, may best be suited for a soft lens refit. An update in the contact lens parameters may be necessary after surgery due to the change in eyelid and lens dynamics, so you want to warn patients that their lenses may sit differently. They may have more problems wearing their lens, even if the lens is in exactly the same positions, and patients may feel drier and have more trouble wearing their lenses after surgery. Investigators compared the rate of hard lens wearers, lens users in ptosis cases with that in a control group, and then estimated the odds ratio. So the study you see here included all patients aged between 30 to 60 years who were seen with aponeurotic ptosis. And it was, ptosis was defined as a margin reflex distance of both eyes that was less than or equal to 1.5 millimeters. And the controls were subjects with an MRD of both eyes that was more than or equal to 3 millimeters. And the, the control subjects were selected from an age-matched group of female hospital employees. And they concluded that the pathogenesis what induced ptosis is aponeurogenic and is similar to the involutional changes that are associated with attenuation or disinsertion of the aponeurosis from its distal insertion in the eyelid. As we discussed earlier, before treating blepharoptosis, it's important to conduct a differential diagnosis to identify any potentially serious underlying cause. Because in some cases, ptosis can be a sign of more serious cause, a focused neurological exam should be carried out on patients. And serious conditions masquerading 
as blepharoptosis can include Horner's and myasthenia gravis. If Horner syndrome is suspected, pharmacological testing with eye drops such as hydroxyamphetamine um, and iapidine and imaging may be an important part of detecting the underlying cause. Myasthenia gravis is a unilateral or bilateral ptosis with upper eyelid position variability that is often accompanied by diplopia and or strabismus. And those with myasthenia gravis could also have respiratory compromise or a concurrent thymoma. A history of intermittent diplopia and worsening symptoms throughout the day suggesting fatigability should increase our suspicion for myasthenia gravis. And in 85% of patients with myasthenia, the initial symptoms were either ptosis or diplopia. The gold standard for diagnosis is serologic confirmation of autoantibodies to the acetylcholine receptors, as well as electrophysiologic studies. Um, so there are bedside tests such as edrophonium and prostigmine that result in temporary elevation of the totic eyelid. Also, cooling the effective eyelid with an ice pack for two minutes may also result in temporary reversal of ptosis. The sensitivity of edrophonium testing and ice pack testing is roughly 80% for each test. Treatment with cholinesterase inhibitor medication often improves the ptosis, and surgery may be considered when medical therapy fails. Other non-isolated neurogenic conditions include chronic external ophthalmoplegia and ocular motor or third nerve palsy. Chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia is characterized by symmetric bilateral ptosis and ophthalmoparesis, and the patients are usually in their 30s. A family history showing a maternal inheritance pattern, imaging studies to rule out other possible causes, and a muscle biopsy can aid in diagnosing this. It's a mitochondrial disease. Because, because CPEO may be associated with kern sayre syndrome, these patients often warrant additional workup for cardiac conduction defects and pigmentary retinopathy. Another cause of myogenic ptosis can be medication-induced, typically steroid or tenofovir. These have been described in the literature and, stre and stresses the importance of reviewing a patient's medication. Ocular motor nerve palsy is characterized by ptosis accompanied by ophthalmoplegia, diplopia, and poorly reacted dilated pupil, and can be a result of ischemic injury or aneurysm. CN3 palsy may necessitate imaging to rule out a compressive etiology. So let's just take a look at a couple of cases here. The upper image shows CN3 palsy. So just recall that the ocular motor nerve innervates the medial rectus, inferior rectus, superior rectus, and inferior oblique. It also innervates the levator palpebrae and carries sympathetic innervation from the edinger westphal nucleus. So dysfunction can result from ischemia, infection, compression, trauma, and demyelating disease such as multiple sclerosis. Some patients may present with any combination of ptosis, ophthalmoplegia, diplopia, and a poorly reactive dilated pupil. The ptosis may actually be profound. So when seeing a patient with um, CN3 palsies, you have to differentiate between complete and incomplete. Um, in other words, pupil sparing and pupil involved. Pupil sparing CN3 palsy is commonly due to ischemic injury in patients with vascular risk factors such as hypertension or diabetes. In older patients, typically older than age 55, giant cell arteritis needs to be considered. Pupil involving third nerve palsy often indicates a, comp a compressive etiology because the parasympathetic fibers supplying the pupil travel on the outer, more easily compressed portion of the nerve. And these should be attributed to compression from a posterior communicating artery aneurysm until proven otherwise. So therefore, they warrant urgent investigation. You want to send these patients out right away for computed tomography angiography or magnetic resonance angiography. The lower image shows Horner's syndrome with a classic triad including unilateral ptosis, 
ipsilateral meiosis, and anhydrosis. And since Mueller's mu muscle only contributes to one to two millimeters of lid retraction, the associated ptosis is mild. The syndrome results from damage anywhere along the sympathetic pathway, which can be divided by first-order neurons. That would be hypothalamus to spinal cord, second-order neurons, which is the spinal cord to the superior cervical ganglion, and the third-order neuron, which is the superior cervical ganglion to the orbit. So it's important to determine which order neuron is involved because Horner syndrome secondary to involvement of the first or second order neurons may be caused by underlying malignancy. The diagnosis of Horner syndrome is confirmed if a apiclonidine drop testing results in reversal of anisocoria. And then you use hydroxyamphetamine drop testing to localize the level of dysfunction the drop will result in pupillary dilation if the dysfunction is at the level of the first or second order neurons, while no dilation will occur if the third neur order neuron is affected. So now Dr. Hauser will conclude this section on differential diagnosis by talking about pseudoptosis, and then she'll take us through the clinical uh, evaluation of ptosis patients and talk about current therapies. Dr. Hauser. Now, what is our differential diagnosis for pseudotosis? Pseudotosis, again, you're having that upper lid droop and the absence of pathology of the upper eyelids. So what are our options here? Our causes can be dermatoshelasis, brow ptosis, superior sulcus deformity, microophthalmus, and hemifacial spasm. What we're going to do next is take each of those piece by piece and kind of unravel them a little bit and figure out which one of these may be impacting our patients. First, let's look at dermatoshelasis. Dermatoshelasis is redundant or sagging eyelid skin. Depending on what your practice is or where your practice is, odds are you're seeing this almost every day. The patient population that I primarily work with is patients, generally speaking, 50 and up. I see dermatoshelasis all day, every day. So it's an important thing to identify in our examination. Manual lifting allows for assessment of that positioning of the under eyelid skin. And the reason that's important is, and we'll find out later as we look at brow ptosis, it can really be a differentiating factor between true dermatoshelasis and more of a brow ptosis. Now the prevalence of this in individuals over the age of 45 is about 16% and it affects males more than females. Now, why are we seeing these changes? We're seeing this because we're living longer, and the longer we live, the more chronic problems that we have and more involutional eye problems that are identified. Now, with dermatoshelasis, there can be a couple causes to that. It can be the traction, due to the contraction of the orbicularis muscle over time, but there's also a second part, and it's the second part that really is, is not a friend to any of us, and that's gravity. So gravity can also play a role in it. So we're looking at traction and gravity uh, to play a role in dermatoshelasis. And eventually we're gonna see a change or a loss of that quality and quantity of elastic tissue in the skin that causes those lids to kind of droop. All these factors ultimately are gonna result in a lowering, particularly of the lateral one third of the eyebrow and that excess skin kind of weighting it down on that lateral corner of the upper eyelid. So the thing about dermatoshelasis, not unlike what I said about ptosis in the beginning, is dermatoshelasis has a cosmetic concern to the patients. The patients have those droopy eyelids and that, that dull appearance. However, they also can be subject to ocular irritation, and sometimes this goes unnoticed uh, clinically. So why do they have ocular irritation? It can be secondary to chronic blepharitis. They can also have dry eye issues. And sometimes misdirected lashes can also cause problems for the patient. Additionally, dermatoshelasis can cause a reduction in both superior and temporal field of vision and quality of vision changes as well. So there can be definite visual impacts both from how the patient sees and how the patient feels. Now, it's fairly predictable that you're going to see as the margin reflex distance measured in millimeters decreases, you're going to see an increase in the percentage of superior visual field loss. But this study proves that 
uh, point for us. So as you can see here, as the lid goes lower and lower, you see an increase in the percentage visual field loss. Now, what this study doesn't say, but other studies have found, is that you can also have a decrease in contrast sensitivity with some of these patients who have dermatostilasis. And there have actually been reports of significant improvement in contrast sensitivity of patients undergoing blepharoplasty surgery for dermatostilasis. So it actually can improve the quality of that patient's vision. Now, why does that happen? The proposed explanation is that that redundant or heavy skin that overlays the eye actually blocks some of the light entering the eye and can cause some level of diffraction. So having a surgical opportunity to go in and resolve that, it's not just an aesthetics component. It's not even just a visual field potential improvement, but the patient may actually have better quality of vision as well. Now, I mentioned brow ptosis a little bit. We're going to talk about some of the etiologies of that and then how you can evaluate for it clinically to see if your patient is suffering from a brow ptosis or perhaps dermatostilasis. So as you see here, there's several different etiologies. Number one, involutional changes. Number two, secondary to weakness of paralysis of frontalis. Now, what does that mean for us? You know, this could be patients who have Bell's palsy, maybe an acoustic neuroma, surgical trauma, it could be a birth trauma, or it can even be congenital. Now, I've had a couple patients that have fallen in this particular category. I've had a patient with an acoustic neuroma and one with surgical trauma who's ultimately had a brow ptosis due to those uh, two factors. The other possibilities there under the secondary uh, weakness of paralysis is uh, myotonic dystrophy. You can also have uh, myasthenia gravis, a lot of different options. You also may have patients who have brow ptosis associated with neoplasm, as you can see here, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell, uh, and so forth. Now, how do we do that differential diagnosis testing? This is, you know, really easy test to do in clinic, uh, requires no special equipment, but it's really valuable. And perhaps some of you are already utilizing this. But as you can see here, we have a patient uh, on the left. This is the same individual, but patient's image on the left is his natural lid posture. And you can see the, the brows look a little lower. Normal brow uh, is gonna sit above the superior orbital rim. So we do see that little bit of lowering of the brow. Again, male brows tend to be lower than female brows typically. Uh, but what we see in this, the second image, the image to the right, you have to kind of take a peek right up at the edge of the top of that image where you can see some fingertips that are in there. What we have here is the, is the patient's brow is manually being lifted. You're seeing it elevated. So it, maybe that front talus isn't fully engaged. And when we manually lift it and stabilize, you can see that there's a resolution of what appears to be an acquired ptosis. So we don't even have a frank uh, dermatostilasis in this patient. If you look at it at just face value in that image on the right, one may interpret that as a dermatostilasis. However, with elevation of that brow, you can definitely see that it's not exactly so much about those heavy sagging lids as it is the brow is not really fully engaged and lifting the brows as they should. Now with superior sulcus deformity, now this is not something that I personally see a lot of in clinical practice, primarily because this is gonna be a, a cosmetic problem in an anophthalmia patient. So as you can see here, our patient, uh, the, the left eye is, uh, posture has more of a, an anophthalmus is pointing downwards, and part of that can be because a lot of these patients are subject to orbital floor, floor fracture. They've had fracture, and this has been corrected. This is their now their posture or, or from a prosthetic. And as you can see, there's a different exposure of the lid. So she's got a heavy kind of hooded lid over on the right eye. The left eye, you can see, has more of a totic type posture. So not something, again, that I've seen a lot of clinically, but it's definitely something that you may encounter. Uh, and it can also have that displacement because there's just changes in the volume of bone and orbital fat. Um, Microophthalmus, again, as I already identified, many of my patients that I see are in that uh, older patient population, 50 and up. 
and I don't see a lot of pediatric patients like you see here, but just taking a look at this uh, patient's reflex, you can see that the MRD1 or that reference distance or reflex distance in the left eye is going to have us it's going to be smaller than it is in the right so measuring from the reflex to the lid margin we're seeing what appears to be uh, an atosis but may not necessarily be identified as that as we look at the etiology of microophthalmos frankly the the precise etiology of it really is unknown um, however, there are some factors that may play a role, and many of those tend to be environmental or hereditary factors. So what would those be? It could be the maternal age, if the mom is over 40 at the time of birth, multiple births, low birth weight, and gestational age. And it could be gestational acquired infections, which I'll go through here in just a moment, some of those specifics or exposures and deficiencies. So if you have a patient with microophthalmos, uh, you definitely want to get a good birth history and pregnancy history from the mom to see kind of what might have been risk factors for this particular child and, you know, what some of the gestational and acquired infections are. There's several of them. Uh, most commonly, you're going to see uh, risk factors like rubella, toxoplasmosis, and varicella. You may also see cytomegalovirus as a risk factor, parvo B19. Even influenza virus, which is definitely of all those that I've listed so far, probably the most common that we would expect someone to be exposed to, and Coxsackie A9. In terms of the deficiencies or exposures the mother may have encountered during pregnancy, vitamin A deficiency, fever, hyperthermia, uh, exposure to x-rays, solvent misuse, and exposure to other drugs like thalidomide and warfarin, as well as alcohol. So again, getting a good case history in these patients is really important to have better understanding perhaps the origins of their microophthalmia. Hemifacial spasm. Now, hemifacial spasm, and we're going to kind of go through this as it relates to our, our image there on the right. But first of all, a little bit about the, the patients that are most at risk. So more frequently in middle-aged women or elderly women, uh, more commonly amongst an Asian patient population. And, you know, really what happens first is the first symptoms tends to be an intermittent lid twitch that can ultimately lead to a forced closure. So this is above and beyond our typical myokymia that patients experience. So patient comes in with a lid twitch. We hear this all the time. And they say, you know, this started, frankly, it can be really alarming to a patient when they experience myokymia. And we're usually recommending things like lower your stress level, rest more, uh, decrease your caffeine consumption. However, for hemifacial spasm, it's really taking it to a whole new level. So again, you get that forced lid closure and you can even see that spreading of the, uh, of the uh, spasm into the lower face. And you, as you can see here in our, our image, the patient's mouth is drawn to one side. This can be related to nerve injury or tumor. However, many of them are without known apparent cause. So you may not know the, the etiology of this, and uh, which can be really tough for the patient because then sometimes it's harder to know when this could resolve. Now, as we look at assessing acquired blepharitosis, so from a clinical perspective, how do we not only identify our acquired blepharitosis, but how do we make quantitative and qualitative assessments of this? Now, one of my favorite tests for this is the marginal reflex distance, or MRD1. And we've talked a little bit about that already, but just to kind of circle back and, and hit on that one more time, as you can see here in the illustration, MRD1 measures from the corneal reflex to the upper lid margin. Now, MRD2 measures from the corneal reflex down to the lower lid margin. But in assessing acquired blepharitosis, we're going to be focusing on MRD1. Now, that marginal reflex distance, again, is really important because it's giving greater precision than measuring strict total fissure height. I know a lot of clinicians like to measure just fissure height, but you're really getting a, again, more clear assessment by measuring that MRD1. Additionally, in my own clinical practice, I'll use visual field testing, and we're going to go through those various types here in just a minute. Uh, I have not leaned as much on levator function and the eyelid crease height, which is used in superior sulcus deformity evaluation. 
With the levator function, what you're doing is assessing by firmly pressing on the brow and measuring the distance moved by the upper lid margin when the patient shifts from downward gaze to upward gaze. So just food for thought about how you might want to incorporate this differently into your practice as you're evaluating a patient uh, with acquired blepharitosis. As I mentioned, some different visual field types. We're pretty familiar with all of these, Goldman Visual Field, Humphrey Visual Field, and LPFT. However, you know, many of us in clinic are using the, the Humphrey Visual Field type of, of analyzer. It's, it's sort of a, a mainstay, if you will, of clinical care. One of the things that I would say in terms of a ptosis patient, I might potentially rely on a Goldman Visual Field in a few cases if a patient has some mobility issues, if they have trouble concentrating. Uh, you know, some of my elderly patients, and, and these folks are ones that are going to be more subject to that acquired blood protosis, they may need that little bit of extra time to get the precise measurements that we want. So, you know, I might kind of go towards a, a Goldman visual field for that subset. So all of these work for, for measuring what we need to do in terms of superior field, but they do it a little bit differently. Again, Goldman being our kinetic perimetry versus our static perimetry with our HVF and LPFT. Now, what about severity? You know, as you look at these illustrations here, the first one you might look at and say, no big deal right? One to two millimeter droop, assuming there's no underlying systemic issue and, and perhaps this is a function or cosmetic concern, that's not too big of a deal, right? It looks, it looks like a pretty normally positioned eye. Now, certainly I think patients uh, may be more aware of that one to two millimeter droop. It may pop out to them a little bit more than it does to us clinically. Even though there's limited visual impairment, patients starting to get that little bit of awareness raised when they look in the mirror. As we transition now to a two to four millimeter droop, now we're in that mild to moderate category. Patients definitely gonna have some awareness of it. We're gonna be noticing it clinically because now we're getting some coverage from the pupil. Uh, so not all the light is going in the way it should be. And now that's when we're gonna have to start that discussion. What are we gonna do? Is this something that we need to do more about? Is this going to, patient gonna become a referral to oculoplastics? It's almost a, a point of discussion and negotiation and really kind of feeling where that patient is living in terms of their motivations. Now, as we go into that four millimeter greater uh, droop, we're seeing significant visual impairment. We can see half the pupil is now covered by the lid not only is that gonna be a functional concern, it's also gonna be a pretty significant cosmetic concern for the patient. At that point, I think all parties on board are gonna be on board to make that referral to oculoplastics and get further evaluation and consideration for a blepharoplasty treatment or some type of repair. So we do see our, our discussions kind of change with patients as we see the, the worsening or severity of blepharitosis. So what are our current options for treatment? Now, I did talk a little bit about surgery as we're looking at those greater than four millimeter people with more of a severe acquired blepharitosis. So surgery is an option. The pro, the pro of that always is gonna be improved function and hopefully improved quality of life. Now, the con is, is that not all patients are good candidates and there are complications. Now, the complications that are listed here, bleeding, scarring, and infection, those are things that are almost ubiquitous across surgery. So these patients, you know, the risks, benefits, and alternatives need to be discussed with them before that referral is made. Now, if we look at different options, off-label medication or use of apiclonidine is another approach. The good news there is we're going to see an increase in that upper lid elevation. So we're going to see a change in posture. The con is some unwanted side effects may go along with that, like pupil dilation. So consider that you're almost trading one asymmetry for another if you're using a medication like that. So what you might notice is, again, elevation to a, a norm, normal posture for the lid, but now having that dilated pupil in that one eye is also not going to look perfectly, quote, normal. The patient may also be somewhat uh, increased risk for uh, contact dermatitis with the use of apiclonidine. Now, as we go into non-surgical options, 
mechanical intervention. These are probably my least favorite. Now, I don't mind mechanical intervention if I'm doing a, a visual field evaluation of someone who has a dermatoschelosis or a, a blepharitosis and whatnot, because we need that taped versus untaped visual field assessment. However, it's not a great long-term answer. Is this definitely a temporary solution? Patients, you know, if you're thinking about it from a functional perspective, we can elevate that lid, but from a, a cosmetic or quality of life, but you're certainly doing your patient no favors by recommending, uh, you know, medical tape to elevate their eye, eyelid. It is a conservative approach for sure, uh, and it can be done pretty quickly, but at the same time, it's very temporary and there are some associations with discomfort. So what is the current standard of care for acquired blepharoptosis? It's going to be surgery. So as we look at our surgical intervention, you know, this is going to really address the pathology or insufficiency of several things, the uh, posterior lamella. And you can do that via the anterior or posterior approach. Now it depends. We have to have alignment again between what the patient's objectives are from a functional and cosmetic perspective and what the surgeon thinks that they can do. And that can be difficult. You know, the, the lids surgery is, is very tricky and I don't even mean from just a, a surgical perspective, but just the balance and making sure we get that alignment. So when we talked about the patients who have that really mild one to two millimeter uh, differential between their two lids, you know, that's a incredibly tricky surgery. It's hard to go in and make those little refinements. As we get into your more moderate to severe patients, there's definitely that option to, to make an improvement. However, ideally, a lot of the patients that we encounter would probably prefer something a little less invasive versus having a surgical experience. But currently, our, our standard of care is to, is to approach that from a surgical perspective. So I know I would like to thank you for your time today, and I'd like to thank Dr. Resnick for contributing as well. Uh, we appreciate your time. Hope that you've taken away some pearls for how you can evaluate acquired blepharitosis in your practice. And thank you so much for being a part of CE Wire. Hey everyone, it's Adam Farkas. Welcome to another OD Wire webinar. And, and really, thank you so much for being here tonight. You know, I know that things have been kind of crazy, you know, across the country and across the world over the last couple of weeks. So it's really kind of nice to be able to, to come back on here into a space uh, that we're all sort of comfortable with, right? We've been doing this for a lot of years and, and it feels nice to actually get back on the air here with all of you tonight um, and try to get a, a sense of normalcy. Um, back again. And I wanted to particularly thank, before we get started, I wanted to thank Conan Medical. You know, as you all know, Conan is a small business. They're, they're based out here on the West Coast in, in California. Um, and as this all has been going on, they've adjusted their operations. So they're, they're still operating open for business and to continue to support their customers. And, and they're one of the organizations behind this webinar tonight, uh, along with LKC, the manufacturers of the, the RET eval. And, and I just want to thank them for going ahead with this tonight. You know, the, the thought is, well, do you, do, you, do you do a show like this tonight? The, the world is, is just so topsy-turvy right now. Do we go ahead and do it? Um, and the fact that they decided to go ahead with it is, is really gratifying to me. Because again, it, it speaks to a sense of normalcy that we're trying to give everyone here tonight. And just one other minor thing, just, you know, not to be too Pollyanna, but as I'm sitting here in my home office where I've actually been trapped for the last week, <laughs> haven't left the house, looking across my desk and I see on the wall behind me, my grandfather's medals from World War I up on the wall. And every time I look at it, I sort of think about what was going through his head back then during the war when the world must have seemed like it was falling apart um, and then to be shortly followed you know, by the, the Spanish flu. Um, so even though I'm sure back then it felt like the world was falling apart, obviously things still continued and it was just a temporary blip. So no matter how crazy things are, just remember it's all a temporary blip and we're gonna get past it. Um, and that's why, you know, having shows like this are, are so, so important and fun. So thanks everyone for being here. So before I introduce our speaker tonight, let me just give you the ground rules. On the right side of the screen, you'll see a box that says questions. Uh, if you type a question in there, uh, at the end of the show, once the presentation's over, uh, I'll verbally ask our speaker tonight 
um, the questions, and then we'll have a little back and forth in the Q&A. So feel free to ask whatever you want in that question box. So with all that said, I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. So Dr. Craig Thomas, I think is well known to, to just about everyone who's here tonight. Um, he's a private practitioner. He's been in practice uh, for over 30 years in Dallas. And what's really special about Craig is that he keeps on the cutting edge for his patients. He always keeps up with the latest science and the latest technologies that are made available. And tonight, he's gonna to talk to us all about how he's added ERG and VEP testing uh, to his practice and how you can do it too. We're gonna to discuss the clinical aspects and even some of the practice management aspects of it. So with that said, why don't I turn it over to Craig? So Craig, thanks so much for being here uh, tonight. You're welcome, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, you know. Everybody that's a, a regular uh, poster or, or lurker on OD Wire, you know, probably has heard me and and all the good and bad that that goes with hearing me. Uh, sometimes good clinical, sometimes good political, sometimes bad political. Uh, but I always circle back, no matter how bad our our disagreements are on the website, that we all are optometrists. I've said that a hundred times over the past ten years, uh, and just like when people are against us, when we have fights with ophthalmology and, and all of our, our other uh, uh, adversaries, we're all in it together. Uh, that's why I've always, I always said optometrists are my friends. I said, uh, when I'm attacked, when my livelihood is in jeopardy, uh, when my profession is being challenged, when my, my, my integrity and my credibility is being, being challenged for no reason, uh, the people that are standing next to me are optometrists. And it's always been that way. I've been practicing 36 years, uh, and it's always been that way, and it's probably, hopefully, always going to be that way. Uh, so we're all in this weird time together. It is pretty weird. I got to tell you, I've never seen anything like this in 36 years. Uh, we are under sh uh, a shelter in place here in Dallas, Texas, and we started sheltering in place uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, everybody knows that I stay pretty busy. Uh, I saw three patients today, uh, urgent patients, essential care. I think that's the term. Uh, I saw seven yesterday. I have two scheduled for tomorrow, and we're closing Friday. Uh, so I mean, to to go from you know slamming and bamming and and all of the stuff that I'm I used to do all, every day and have fun, and to what we've got right now, it's quite a change. And and uh, I guess there's only the only solace is I'm not alone. So, so I, I want to welcome everybody here because we we are in this together. And and the, the concept I'd like to have going forward, trying to be positive, because I am positive. Uh, you know, in my 36 years, even though I've never seen anything like this, I don't expect this to last. And I base that on my 36 years. Uh, you know, my experience counts for something, and, and I don't think this is going to last. Uh, I'm hoping it's going to be a month or two, maybe, I'm hoping. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a week or two. Uh, you know, we're all looking for a long, dry spell is what I'm afraid of. Uh, you know, we all have different situations and we can deal with it differently. Uh, you know, most of us are going to get through it okay. A few of us may not, but, you know, we'll come out on the end. You know, I don't know, happier or stronger or any of that stuff, but we'll come out on the end and, and we'll get back to seeing patients. And, and we're going to be practicing optometrists just like we all were two or three weeks ago. Uh, this is not going to last. Uh, what, I, what I'd like everybody to try to concentrate on is is how are we going to practice once we all start practicing again? You know, there's people listening tonight that are not practicing just like me. Okay, I'm not going to practice for two or three weeks. Okay, it's fine. Uh, if I don't, if I can't practice for a month, I'm not going to be happy about it. Uh, you know, but I don't, I can't control it. But I'm going to be practicing again, uh, and, and I'm going to be practicing this summer. You know, I mean, I'm going to be practicing. Uh, so, so what I'd like to do is, you know, as we go forward. And we're talking about how do you want to practice on the other side? How, you know, how do you want to practice post outbreak? Uh, do you want to try to differentiate yourself? Do you want to try to be special? Do you want to get ultra competitive? Do you want to try to take advantage of, of guys and ladies that have uh, been wounded by this? I mean, I, I don't want to be mercenary, uh, but, you know, they're just like the restaurants and everything else. There'll be a few people that may not survive this ordeal. Uh, and those patients are going to have to go somewhere, uh, and they may be looking for someone with some advanced technology, uh, and, and, you know, I'm telling you, it might make a difference. So let's get into it, okay? Let's let's talk about going with the electrodiagnostic flow 
after we get out of this outbreak, okay? <laughs> so we put signs on the door. We posted new hours. We're up at nine to four now instead of crack of dawn till till nightfall. And so we call it the outbreak hours. That's we so we we kind of our outbreak hours. So we're going to get out of this outbreak and go with the electrodiagnostic flow. That's what we're going to do. So we're going to primarily talk about some electroretinography. And I'm, uh, you know, I've, I've been lecturing on electroretinography since 2011. Uh, I was the first optometrist in the state of Texas to perform any electrodiagnostic procedures. Me and my buddy Joe Deloach had to get Medicare to turn the code on and get it approved for optometrists. So I, I'm pretty familiar and intimate and experienced with all kind of electrodiagnostic stuff uh, being performed by optometrists, and in particular in the state of Texas. Uh, so I was, I, you know, I'm, I'm the alpha. Uh, so I know what I'm talking about, and I've been doing it a long time. Uh, you know, the, in the beginning when we started talking about about uh, uh, electrodiagnostics, and I would I would always start my lectures uh, with this kind of joke. Y'all know I'm kind of funny sometimes, and I would I would say, you know, I am now a clinical neurophysiologist. You know, and I would strut around and, and poke my chest out and kind of, you know, you know how I could be. And I was like, yeah, yeah my mom was so proud of me. She's, she's got an optometrist and a clinical neurophysiologist all in one. And she's so proud. And, and when you start performing this testing in your optometric practice, in addition to being an optometrist, you're going to turn yourself into a clinical neurophysiologist. And what you're trying to do is the things you see on the slide. I'm not going to read slides to you. Y'all can read while I'm talking. You see the two things, what, what we're doing here with the ERG. It's getting a loss of retinal function and trying to differentiate or distinguish between retinal and optic nerve lesions. That's the big thing. And, and the big thing on the newer technologies that we're getting ready to talk about, like this handheld read, read eval device, is all the different protocols, the different test protocols that you can do with this very small device, uh, different than the earlier first generation. I consider this technology second generation technology. That, that's how I look at it. So this is what I'm talking about. This thing is so cool. Uh, I've had mine for about three years. I gotta tell you, I mean, I, you know, I, I, y'all know how I am. Again, I hate to say it, but I, I'm like a kid at Toys R Us. I've got every machine that you could get, every, everything that'll generate a code. I've got it in here. I, I, I'm on my third electrodiagnostic device. Okay, this thing is the bomb. Uh, you see how cool it looks. It, you know, it's this real small, portable, handheld. You go from room to room with it. It is really, really slick, really slick. So it's called Red Eval. And, and I'm gonna go back real fast. So you see the Red Eval. And, and when I first started doing electrodiagnostic stuff, you know, back in 2011, 2012, we were doing mostly PERGs, the pattern electroretinogram, primarily for uh, glaucoma indications, glaucoma suspects, stuff like that. Uh, and, and so the, the PERG was the, the primary ERG that we used to do, or that I used to do. Uh, and, and this light adapted, these flicker and flash ERGs, that was not something that I was into in the beginning of my electrodiagnostic journey. As the technologies evolved and we're into second generation technology, uh, now you've got stuff with more, more testing protocols. So again, you've got multiple ERG protocols and some VEP stuff. We'll talk about it just a little bit. This is, this is mostly an ERG kind of presentation, but this handheld device will do both tests. It'll do an ERG and a VEP, one back to back without unhooking them or new electrodes or anything. It is so cool. It is really slick. So let's keep going. So the big thing now that the, the, the most, there's two big things, I, you know, I don't know if one's bigger than the other. The first big thing is what's called the photopic negative response. That's kind of a new thing. It's, it's new in the literature. It's been out, the, the information talking about this has been out, you know, you know three, four, five years. Uh, you know, I started looking at stuff back in 2010, 2011, 2012, and I don't remember seeing this, this photopic negative response thing until just a few years ago. And you see my, my reference article is dated 2018. I always try to keep, keep current with stuff. I mean, these are the ICEF articles, the protocols. I mean, this is modern, real science. It's not just me making it up. It's not Conan trying to sell machines. You know, this is from the, from the guys that make up all the rules. So, the, so this photopic negative response is a, a new thing where it provides information about the, the innermost retinal layers, the, the function of the innermost retinal layers, the ganglion cells and their axons. So we're going to, you know, you got to kind of get that, that term in your head, photopic negative response, okay? Now, in addition to that photopic negative response, uh, the, the, the more 
the more traditional, if you could say traditional, about a device that's only a few years old. But the, the, the initial testing that we did mostly with this device was these flicker tests and, and these flash ERGs. Uh, and you see an example of what the output looks like here. Uh, this is just one of my patients. Uh, I, I took the name off. You see, this is a pretty normal looking one. Everything is color coded. You know, green is good, red is bad, yellow is suspicious. Uh, so even without, you know, I, I can't give you a lesson really on interpretation in this short time frame, but you see everything is green. Uh, so without knowing what you're looking at, hey, green is good, red is bad. Uh, so this is a relatively normal uh, ERG waveform uh, on this particular patient. So I just wanted to show you what a normal would look like. And you guys, again, can see the little bullets off to the side. You know, when we're doing a test like this, I want to get information about these cone bipolar cells. Uh, you know, in, you go back. That's why I put this slide up here. You know, a little bit of, of retinal anatomy and neuroanatomy kind of coming into play. All the, the, the layers of the retina forming these retinal cortical pathways going through the visual pathways of the brain back to the visual cortex. You got you to gotta feel that neuroanatomy a little tiny bit for all this stuff to kind of fold in and make sense. So I just wanted to give that little review there. Uh, you know, and we all had a, an electrodiagnostic class. Uh, I don't, you know, this is a nationwide lecture, so I can't harp on going to U of H, but anybody that went to University of Houston, you know, we were down there in the dungeon with Dr. Walters, you know, hooking up people and sticking contacts in their eyes with wires in them and taking three hours to do a test. It was outrageous. It was, it was, it was comical. Uh, and and I, while we were doing it, it nobody, it was, it was so ridiculous that while we were learning about electrodiagnostic technology, everybody looked at each other and realized that we would never be doing this again for the rest of our lives. And then once we got out of this room, once we got out of the dungeon at U of H, we would never touch a piece of electrodiagnostic technology again. And that's exactly what happened until 2011. I got out of school in 1983. Okay, so so this we we've moved up a notch here. So let me I digress. Let's keep going. So you see what the what the the flicker and the flash. Uh, testing is based on and and the parts of the retina uh, that you're evaluating with this test. So that kind of just a, hopefully a refresher for those of us that remember all of our electrodiagnostics. So again, another uh, just a picture of the device being used. So again, the thing is uh, the thing the device the device is called the Ret Eval. You see it there. Uh, it's made by this company called LKC. Uh, they seem to know what they're doing. It's real lightweight. It's not heavy. Uh, it's got a real short test time. Uh, from the time that 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 you start washing the lady's face with a lid scrub and putting the little electro strips on there and holding a thing up and saying look at the light uh, until you're finished and putting it up on my computer screen it's like five minutes I, I mean it's incredible uh, you know I I, I kind of would tell people ten minutes start to finish but ten minutes is five minutes to me talking uh, and then five minutes of the technician doing the work uh, so the test time is five minutes you know kind of start to finish just get the thing set up and telling the patient what's going on. You know, you might have a 10 minute run, but but actually the technician time doing it and, and displaying the info, it's five minutes. Uh, there's absolutely no discomfort. And you see the little electrode strip there, uh, you know, without me being doing any kind of comparative analysis, uh, these just, just suffice it to say, these strips are less expensive than competitive strips. <laughs> so I'll just leave it at that. So this thing's not real expensive to use. Uh, so this is what it looks like when it's being used real quick, real easy. Okay, so now let's keep going. Let's let's get into the, to, to some meat and potatoes here. Okay, so let's talk about some some cases. You know, the best way to learn to me is just talking about real patients being treated by a real optometrist that's practicing modern optometry and still and working in 2020. Okay, that's the best information. So that's what you get ready to get. So this guy here is and and this is. You know, with new stuff, so I'll talk about this new device. You know, it's new new if you don't have one. I mean, I've had mine three years. Uh, you know, so I'm talking about this new device. So to, to introduce it and kind of show you what it does and, and what it's capable of, it, I think it's best to just use a demonstration case as opposed to some case where you got to really figure stuff out and, and you're, you're, you know, really scratching your head and got to have the patient come back three or four times to make a decision. Okay, we're not going to do none of that. So this is a this is a demonstration case. This is like we're in fifth grade and you're the science fair judge and somebody made a volcano out of vinegar and baking soda. Okay, okay, we demonstrate a known physical property. Okay, that's what that's not we're not really experimenting. So this ain't no experiment. I'm just going to show you how everything blends together and how it works and the value of it. You know why you would want to do it and what does it add to the mix? You know why 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 would you be adding ERG 
technology to your practice. Okay, the, the, let me show you why. So, so this guy here, this is one of my regular guys. I got a thousand of them. They just keep coming in. I don't, I don't know what it is. Uh, so this guy comes in and he's 61 years old now. I saw him two weeks ago. Uh, you'll see the printouts in a moment. So I saw this guy, he comes in for, for a regular, I think it was a six month glaucoma check. I couldn't remember. Uh, but I saw him two weeks ago and, and uh, we had already started talking, me and, and Adam Farkas about doing this webinar. And I always, I never want to repeat stuff. I always want to use new stuff, no matter what. Every presentation is different. So as soon as he said, hey, man, let's do this webinar. Okay, I'm thinking, okay, he's telling me Monday, let's do the webinar. So on Tuesday, I'm like, okay, what patient can I find to do the webinar on? I don't want any, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get some fresh, fresh fresh blood. So this guy was like the first, the first guy there after I decided to do the webinar. And of course, he was perfect. Uh, you'll see why in a moment. So you got a 61-year-old guy. He's, he was, he's 61 now. I first saw this guy eight years ago. So he was 53 then. He's like a minus six. Uh, he works at UPS and he wears contacts. You know, he's, he's he unloads the trucks and all that stuff. He doesn't like wearing glasses. And when he came in for his first visit uh, back eight years ago, his pressures were 18 in the right eye and 31 in the left. Um, and for any of us listening tonight, that would be sufficient to, to raise some level of suspicion. <coughs> Excuse me. And you would think that the guy either is developing glaucoma or has glaucoma. Excuse me. So that's certainly what I thought. And, and I, you know, I mean, y'all know me. I mean, you know, I, I never met a glaucoma I didn't like. So I'm thinking this guy glau has glaucoma. And I performed a series of, of diagnostic tests. Uh, and I determined that he actually did indeed have glaucoma. Uh, we don't have the time for me to review all that stuff and, and go back to the beginning eight years ago and start flashing stuff. But I did want to show you a couple of things. Uh, here's a, 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 an OCT retinal image of this patient in 2016. So this is several years after I had initiated treatment. Uh, he was kind of spotty with his compliance. You know, I'd, he'd come in, you know, pressure would be 22, 23 in that, that bad left eye. You know, and, and I'd had him as high as 37, 38 sometimes uh, when he wouldn't use his drops. So this is what he looked like uh, in 2016. Kind of interesting on this OCT printout, and this will all blend in together in here in just a moment. Uh, you can see, you know, kind of the, this is a, a Cirrus 400 OCT. Uh, I bought it new. I mean, it's a really cool machine. I mean, I like it. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, you know, it's wrapped up in bubble wrap in my garage right now. But last year, when this, and when this guy came in, when this guy came in in 2016, that was my primary OCT. And, and I made all my decisions based on it, and I had no problem with it. Uh, you can see the deep cups. You can see the statistical analysis. Uh, you know, this guy has glaucoma. Okay, so you see what it looks like there in 2016. So he comes back. He's a good patient. He comes every six months, pretty much. So when he comes back, uh, I've got this brand new, that brand, I've had it now two years. Uh, I've got this, this OptiView, uh, AngioView, the, the OCTA with the angiography, and it is superior technology. It is simply superior. Uh, I circled the date here so we can see that I am discussing current patients with current information and current technology. So this guy was here on March the 10th. That's when I obtained this scan. It's two weeks ago. It's two weeks ago. Okay. Uh, you see the statistical analysis. It doesn't look terrible. It's not like he's going blind. Uh, this is a combination printout where you get the optic nerve head analysis, retinal nerve fiber layer analysis. You get your Tisnet curve profile over here. And you've got a ganglion cell uh, analysis, not the full deal. Uh, I'm just trying to save space and not have three or four slides. But you see this little little tongue of atrophy kind of scooting in on on the ganglion cell analysis complex uh, printout. That's kind of kind of interesting. And look how it's symmetrical. So here, uh, you know, we've got an OCT from you know almost four years ago. Uh, here you've got an OCT from two weeks ago. Uh, to me, you know, pretty symmetrical on the ganglion cell and, you know, pretty, the, the left eye showing a little bit more damage on the nerve fiber right here. You see it's in the red code. So, you know, it, it's showing that the left eye is a little tiny bit worse, but not a big difference, not, not a whole lot. And remember when I first saw this guy, excuse me, he had extreme asymmetry, you know, like one eye is 18, the other eye is 31. Okay. I mean, that's extreme asymmetry to me, a 99.5% chance of having glaucoma when you present like that. 
and clearly, you know, the, the, the condition is starting in the left eye before it crosses over and goes to the right eye. So I've got my, my OCT scans on this guy. And I'm an optometrist. I'm a regular optometrist. I'm just like everybody listening. Okay, the next test, almost always, is going to be a threshold visual field. You know, when you've got a patient that, that you either think has glaucoma or, or that you know has glaucoma. So again, I, I, I did a visual field on the guy. You see the date up here at the top, 3-10-2020. So it's all done on the same day. Uh, you, you see the visual field, the left eye. He's actually on his mean deviation is still showing a positive, although somewhat decreased reliability. I mean, I, you could, I could see he's not going blind. Uh, it seems like he kind of snapped to attention here when he did the left eye, uh, much more reliable. But you see on the left eye, uh, you've got your glaucoma hemifield test uh, showing within normal limits. So again, no severe damage. But here, your mean deviation, this minus 0.41 decibels compared to here, a plus number, I would say that that's clinically significant asymmetry where one eye is a positive number on the mean deviation and the decibels in the others are negative. It's not a big difference, but it's different. And, and, it, and it correlates with the initial presentation with the left eye having a much, much higher uh, intraocular pressure. So again, I already know this guy has glaucoma. Uh, you know, I'm performing diagnostic testing on him not to see if he has glaucoma, I'm trying to see, is it changing? Is it getting worse? Are, is the, are we under good control? Are we under borderline control? Or is the glaucoma uncontrolled? And I need to make a decision and change his treatment program. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm gathering information to try to see, is this patient glaucoma under good control, borderline control, or uncontrolled? I've got to make that differentiation and that assessment. And I use these tests to make that decision and, and I, in an ideal situation, and fortunately, this is an ideal situation, I've got previous test results to compare to where I could make an accurate and informed assessment. Yes, this guy's staying the same. Yes, this guy's getting better. Yes, this guy's getting worse. And I would blend all these test results to make that decision. So this visual field is essentially like the one that he did the year before. So based on the visual field test, <clears throat> I'd say that, that his glaucoma is under good control. So I keep going, and this was kind of weird. Uh, you know, I went ahead, once I decided to use this patient as my, my example on the presentation, you know, I told my staff, I said, all right, get, get, get all the diagnostic tests on what every piece of information we can gather. Uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily uh, need to make decisions with it. I, want to, I just kind of want to see what this guy's like. Uh, and I did a test that I had not done on him before because I didn't need the information to make a decision on him when he came in with the, with the 18 and the 31. And so I decided to check the guy's color vision and these are the results. And so again, I, once I make the decision to, to order some diagnostic testing, I usually you know, exit the building and let my staff take over. And then I come back in with their finished and all the stuff is flashed up on a big flat screen. And so I walked in the room and I looked at these color vision test results and I turned to my patient. I said, hey man, are you colorblind? He goes, yeah, I can't see a lick. I said, yeah, you can't, you got nothing. He says, oh, man, it's been like that my whole life. I said, why do you tell me that? He says, you never asked me. I said, I've been seeing you for eight years. You never told me you were colorblind. He said, you never asked me. I said, okay, that's my bad. Okay, won't happen again. My bad. Uh, so this is what it looks like when your glaucoma patient has a congenital red cream color vision abnormality. You see how it's almost identical in each eye. This is not some kind of acquired defect. I've seen a thousand of those. This is what it looks like when the guy's born with the, the traditional color vision deficiency that we all learn about in school, uh, where it's like, you know, 6.5 or 7% of, of all white males. Well, it's like 3.2% of black males and like 3.1% of, of Asian males. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, those are the numbers. So every once in a while, you're not going to be able to use color vision in, in your decision making. Uh, and this was an example of that. So I kept going. And of course, since we're talking about ERG testing, uh, I said, hey, uh, you know, I certainly want to get an ERG on this patient. Let me see what, what his retinal function looks like. Uh, and this is his, his test that was done again on March 10th, 2020. Uh, this is almost a perfect teaching ERG because you see the right eye is perfectly normal. And again, I'm not going to go through the interpretation that we, we could do that on the next seminar or, or, or webinar. Uh, but again, green is good. So all the waveform shape is normal. The, the, the peak time and amplitudes are normal. 
the photopic negative response measures down here are all normal. So the, the ERG response, the photopic negative response on this patient's right eye is normal you see clearly the left eye is abnormal and it's abnormal in two or three different ways. And it only takes one way to be abnormal, but, but it's abnormal in two or three different ways. Yeah, the first thing is the shape of the waveform and, and the shape of the waveform, this is called waveform perturbation. So it's disturbed. He ain't happy. This waveform ain't happy. He's not happy. He's perturbed. And so you got waveform perturbation compared to the normal waveform shape that you would have in a person with a normal photopic negative response, like it, like it looks like here. So you got waveform per perturbation. And the first thing here, the, the peak time, or what's called implicit time, you can go either way, uh, the, the peak time is, is not in the range. All these numbers is abnormal. It's, it's just not normal, okay? Uh, so here you have clinically significant asymmetry. And on this particular patient, it's not for everybody, everybody's different, but on this particular patient, which is why I used him, everything matches. So you see how the eye that should have more damage, because when I saw this guy eight years ago and the pressure was 18 in the right eye and 31 in the left, okay, the glaucoma started in the left eye. The left eye should have more damage, okay? You could see a little tiny bit of it on the visual field, just a little tiny bit. Uh, you can't see none of it on the color vision because because he doesn't have any color vision. You can't really see it on the OCTs. You know, not really. You can't, you know, here the, the left eye doesn't look a lot. The, the right eye looks worse on this one, okay, if anything. Uh, here the left eye is a little worse, but only by a few microns on that inferior uh, section. Uh, you know, the visual field, I mean, it, you know, it's a little tiny bit different. Uh, but on this guy, the ERG is like night and day. The, the ERG is the most sensitive test on this particular guy if you're trying to see is one eye better than the other and maybe if one eye is changing. You know, to now I know that this right eye is perfect. If I see any change on this right eye going forward, I know that my glaucoma is out of control. That is the correct term. My glaucoma is uncontrolled and I would need to get more aggressive with the treatment. So I, I will use, not can use, I will use the ERG test results on this patient going forward to make medical decisions. I'm not doing it to make money. I'm doing it to make decisions. You see how valuable it is and how I could get so much information here. Ordinarily, I'd get a lot of information there. Okay, on this guy, I couldn't get any information there. I got to get it another way. I could be dependent on this visual field test, but it's got low reliability. Uh, I, got, I got the best OCT in the world, and it's telling me that the eyes are almost the same. Okay, you know, I, I, I gotta, I can't go with just one test. I gotta look at three, four, five different things and blend it all together to make a decision. That's the best way to practice to me. And when you do it like that, this is what it looks like. So, you know, we, how, you do, how do you report this stuff? Again, you know, I'm not reporting this tomorrow because I got two patients scheduled, but in two months, this guy's coming back, okay? <laughs> and, and we all got to get this thing up and running two months from now or six weeks from now, or eight weeks from now, whatever, okay, it's coming back. And, and when it comes back, this is how you do it. So, you know, this is this is this guy's visit. And, and again, I, I'm not trying to uh, you know, boast or brag or this or that. I, this, I just want to show you how I do it, okay? The people still don't understand. I give lectures pretty regular, uh, whether it's clinical lectures, practice management lectures, billing and coding lectures. I did two consultations this month before the virus broke out. And and I, I'll go to an office where the guy's making $2 million a year and, and the, the, the billing and coding clerk will come up to me and because they will say, Craig, I want you to talk to my, my insurance my insurance person. I goes, yeah, sure. And, and like two minutes into the conversation, every time, every time. It's like, well, okay, now I, I know we can't do this with this and, and I know we can't do that with that. And, and I know I could do a OCT if I stand on my head and it's Monday morning and then I could do a color vision on Tuesday afternoon if it's dark early. And they start going through all these rules and, and these modifiers that don't matter. I'm like, what are you talking about? Stop it, okay? Stop it. And I, I mean, the most common thing I say when I go visit these offices and talk to the insurance person is I say, stop it, okay? Everybody's fixated on what we can't do and this don't go with that and this doesn't mix with that. I'm like, stop it, okay? That we can do whatever we want. <laughs> I'm getting ready to show you. Almost always, we can do whatever we want. Uh, anytime you want. 
for whatever reason you want, as long as it's reasonable and medically necessary. And we should stop with the scare stuff on the billing and coding and just do what needs to be done to figure out what's wrong with the patient. You know, this is what I did for this guy's visit. You see the visit, you see the numbers, okay? The only thing that's of any, <coughs> excuse me, significance, y'all got me excited. The only thing that any significance on here is that on occasion, and it's primarily some of the Medicare carriers, but you know, just to be aware of it, I just put it here as an educational tidbit. You know, on occasion, you'll have some of these uh, insurance carriers where they will state clearly that they do not want you to use electroretinography or VEP testing, any electrodiagnostic stuff in the diagnosis and treatment of patients with glaucoma. Uh, it's a lot of room for abuse. Guys have messed it up, doing a thousand scans a, a, a year. You know, so so the insurance companies got tired of paying for it, and they put a bunch of rules on it the past two three years. And so they say, hey, you know, you don't need to use an ERG to determine if a guy has glaucoma. All right, well, if that particular insurance company says that, and some do, some don't, you have to check your own local rules. This is a, a nationwide, you know, presentation. But I I, I went ahead and <coughs> excuse me, I checked. Uh, Texas's rules, and in Texas, you would do it like this, where if they say, you know, if you look up the LCD for, for electroretinography, and if it says, hey, we don't want you to use this stuff for glaucoma, okay, then don't. Uh, but if it says, hey, glaucoma to optic atrophy is on the covered diagnosis list, which is always is, uh, then, then that's the code that would be most appropriate. Because if you remember back at the beginning, the very first slide, what's the reason of an ERG? So you're trying to see, is there a loss of retinal function, number one, and if there's a loss of function, is the function primarily in the retina or is it primarily an optic nerve? So if you've got a person that can't see right or has got an abnormal OCT or whatever, some kind of optic atrophy, is it optic atrophy caused by glaucoma or is it optic atrophy caused by something else? You know, that's where you got to play doctor and figure that out. Uh, so, you know, this particular one, this is how you would report the service. Let's keep going. We're doing good. All right, number two. Here we are, number two, number two. I'm going to talk about some subclinical diabetic retinopathy. Y'all know that's a big thing with me. I've been talking about this for a couple of years. People are going to start learning eventually. I've got some people that's been learning, uh, you know, but but we got to keep going. And still people don't understand this stuff. It's like the, like the insurance clerks don't understand how to file optometric services and they make it harder than it needs to be. Uh, we still got a bunch of optometrists not understanding this subclinical diabetic retinopathy thing. Okay, so we're gonna keep, we're gonna talk about that. So what you got with the with the subclinical diabetic retinopathy is basically retinopathy you cannot see with an ophthalmoscope. That's the basic definition of it. Okay, so you look inside, you dilate them up, you're trying to see if there's something wrong with them, and you don't see nothing. They look fine. Okay, they look fine. So that's that's it. but they're not fine. There's something wrong with them. You just haven't looked the right way. Uh, so that's what's called subclinical diabetic retinopathy. Okay, and most importantly. Most importantly, for the, to the, the concept of this lecture, when this, when this happens, and, and, and people with diabetes, uh, when, when, you, when they get the diabetes, you get this, this relationship where the, the, you get neurodegeneration, and I can't really give a, a whole lecture on neurodegeneration. I'm supposed to be writing an article on it, but you get neurodegeneration that's caused by the diabetes, and, and neurodegeneration, like an example of that would be like people getting tingling in their fingers and toes. Where the, where the nerve endings, the peripheral nerve endings are all damaged and they get that, that tingling in their fingers and toes. Okay, that's, that's a clinical sign of, of neurodegeneration. Uh, so if you got peripheral neurodegeneration, you probably got you some central neurodegeneration up in your brain and your optic nerve and your retina. So they kind of go together. So I always kind of broach the subject with my patients like that. <clears throat> so anybody that's got tingling in their, in their fingers and toes because of their diabetes, man, they absolutely got some subclinical retinal neurodegeneration uh, whether they look normal or not, that's the I'm I'm working on that premise going forward. So let's let's jump into the subclinical diabetic retinopathy. So here's here's patient number two. There's another again, always my real patients. Uh, so this is a picture of this guy in 2016. Uh, so 58 year old black guy. He's diabetic. He, I, I'm sorry. He's a person with diabetes. I should he, he is a person with diabetes. He is not diabetic. So he's a person with diabetes, and he treats it with oral meds. Uh, and he's a knucklehead. He don't, he's not even trying. I mean, this guy's big as a house. He's, he's got, you can put a beer can on his stomach. It's that kind of thing. Uh, so he probably weighed about 280, 285, maybe 5'11". You know, you know, I, I said, are you exercising? He just laughed at me. I said, I'm serious. He said, no, I don't exercise. Okay. All right. Since you're serious. So he's, he's one of those kind of patients. I said, can you see? Okay. He says, I see fine. 
uh, you know, I'm here because my, my medical doctor makes me come once a year. You know, I'm like, okay, all right, <laughs> you know, I'll take care of you. So I had, uh, if you look at him, <clears throat> you see that in this 2016 picture, if you go way up here at the top, right above the macula, see the little three yellow dots, you know, the little tiny exudate. Okay. So to me, he had some mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy that I detected with ophthalmoscopy back in 2016. And I took a picture of it. Okay. Y'all see it there. Now, what's most important on this guy, besides his fundus looking pretty normal, is that <clears throat> he had 20-25 best corrected vision. So I could not get him to 20-20 and really not a good 20-25. Uh, you know, and I didn't see any real corny opacity and lenticular loss of transparency. He looked fine, you know. So I'm thinking, hey, how come this guy can't see? So you know, you know how I practice optometry. I launch. I mean, I go head first. I mean, feet first, head first, both feet. This, I got a fist up. I am doing a functional vision assessment on this patient, and I'm going to figure out <clears throat> how come he can't see. Because it's because to me, a 60, a 58 year old man, he should have 20 20 unless I can explain otherwise, okay, this ain't normal. It ain't close to being normal. Anybody says that's normal, they're crazy, okay? It's not normal. So you got 20-25 minus vision in a person with clear media, okay? They taught us in optometry school that wasn't normal. All right, so I don't think that's normal. So I'm gonna try to figure out how come that ain't normal and I'm gonna run a bunch of tests on it. And I'm gonna do a refraction with a $200 retina scope. I'm gonna do some fields. I had the ret eval here back in 2017, so this wasn't a 2000, all this stuff is in 2017, where this uh, th this first image was 2016. So you see this guy's uh, ERG findings back in 2017. You got a real normal waveform, uh, you got normal implicit times, this was a normal thing, slight color vision defect, uh, some kind of, you know, goofy visual feels, kind of non-specific. So I told him, hey, you know, I, I got some normal test results and some abnormal test results. Uh, I don't think we need to treat anything. There's no focal local treatment for this. We're not going to give you a shot. No anti VGF, no steroids, no no pred forte, no none of that. Okay, we, I, the the treatment is to get healthier. You big big person, you. And that's and that's what I tried to tell him. And again, he just he wasn't hearing it. He didn't want to hear it. And it was really frustrating. I remember and the guy's funny. And I was like, hey, man, you know, you're killing yourself. And he's like, yeah, I, you know, my daddy died when he was 60. I'm already ahead of that. I'm like, okay, you know, <laughs> that's a bad attitude. Uh, so this guy was hard to, to try to, you know, motivate. Uh, but I, I did the best I could. So you see these little bullets here talking about this neurodegenerative uh, form of the disease. So when you get this, this retinal neurodegeneration, it's, it's a, a, a loss of the ganglion cell, the nerve fiber layer, the photoreceptors, and it's called <clears throat> RDN, retinal diabetic neuropathy, okay? You got it. That's a new thing, but it's not really new. It's been around about eight, nine years. So retinal diabetic neuropathy, that's, that's like when you got thing, the tingling in your fingers and your toes, except it's in your retina. So this is the workup I did on the guy back then. Now, <clears throat> let's fast forward. Okay, why are we talking about this guy? So here we are, same guy. This is last summer, so 2019. So you see, I took some nice pictures here. Uh, I took these pictures with that uh, that uh, uh, Nexi robotic camera. You just hit a button and step away. It's step away from the vehicle. It's pretty cool. So you see, you know, pretty decent images. You see no obvious retinopathy. There's certainly no no vasculopathy like microaneurysms, dot blot hemorrhages. Uh, you know, there's no vascular beating. There's, you don't see nothing. Uh, there's, there's no areas of obvious ischemia. Uh, you know, no areas of obvious edema. Uh, and, and the guy had the same best corrected 2025 minus acuity in each eye on this visit in 2019 last year. So this is what he looked like. And, and if this guy was in your office, I would submit that every optometrist listening here tonight would fill out the little forms that they make us fill out, and you would check off the very top box where it says no apparent retinopathy. That's what you would check off. You would say, you know, this little yellow thing here, I wouldn't call that nothing. Uh, so I'd say no apparent retinopathy. All right, so I know that this guy <clears throat> has some problems because he can't see clear, and I've already done a workup on him. So I know what's wrong with him. And again, this is a demonstration kind of thing. So here is what retinal diabetic neuropathy looks like on an OCT scan of the macula. And so you see the retina is too thin. The, 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 the mechanism is theorized that the, the retina is ischemic, so you got poor blood flow 
uh, as the old people would say, you got post circulation. They got post circulation. So the, the, the poor blood flow uh, just messes up the tissue and the tissue starts to die. And as the tissue dies, it, it shrinks, it, it goes down. And so the retina is not as thick. And so what you see is retinal thinning, significant thinning of the nerve fiber layer. And on a Cirrus 400 OCT, it looks like this and it looks like this. Okay. Now, on this particular day last summer, this was before I wrapped up this bad boy in bubble wrap and put it in the garage. I actually had both OCTs sitting in the same room side by side, and I acquired images on this patient on the same day side by side. That's why I kind of used this guy <clears throat> because I, I, you know, I, ordinarily I would use somebody I saw last week, but this guy where I happened to have the OCT scans from two different technologies on the same day, I thought that was pretty cool. So here's what it looks like on that, that uh, OptoView, AngioView OCT. And so it's it, here, the, the thinning is represented by this dark purple. So these this this met is too thin. You see the shape is kind of okay. You've got some uh, vitreomacular adhesion right there. That's, you know, not clinically significant. So the foveal depression and everything is still there, you know, both eyes. So on a, on a first glance, it would look like it's okay. Well, that's that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that guy. But if you look at it real close, you can see like this hump is a little higher than that one. And, and same thing here. But the most important thing is just look at the numbers and the colors and, and the retina is too thin. So this is retinal diabetic neuropathy. The guy's retina is messed up because of his diabetes that he's had for 20 years that he won't take care of. Now, I've documented the retina is too thin. Since I, I went ahead and put this slide in here just for educational purposes, anybody that's getting ready to buy a new OCT, and I think you ought to buy OCT if you don't have one, if you got an old one, get a new one. Uh, this angiography is is the bomb. Okay, I mean it's like top of the line. You just you just can't imagine how how to how practicing optometry is different when you've got access to information like this at your fingertips when you're trying to figure out if somebody got something wrong with them. It's just it's just night and day. It, I just I can't really say it enough. Uh, so so here this is an OCT angiogram uh, of the guy and, and again without giving angiography lessons. Uh, the, the, the blood perfusion is low. The tissue is, is not well perfused. Uh, this guy has subclinical diabetic retinopathy in a vascular mode in addition to his subclinical diabetic retinopathy in a neurodegenerative mode. He's got it both ways, even though he looks totally normal. See, he, he looks fine. He looks fine. OK, you would check off no apparent retinopathy. But this guy's retina is real thin, and he's losing his capillary network. Okay, lots of problems there. So he's got lots of structural damage. I wonder if he has any functional loss of vision associated with the structural damage that I just detected with my OCT scans. And on this particular patient, the answer is yes. <clears throat> and you see here, again, everything's in red. Uh, without an interpretation, you can see that it's not normal. The, the, the amplitude is low. The waveforms are, are, are very shallow. And for this guy in particular, where I've got, if we go back, go back to 2017, these test results are for this patient. So this is this patient's ERG scan in May of 2017. <clears throat> and here, and just again, just look at the, the height of the peaks, the shape of the waveform, the the number, the, the the implicit time 32 milliseconds. I think that one's 33 milliseconds. And then you fast forward to a guy whose retina looks exactly the same with ophthalmoscopy, and who's telling you as soon as you ask him that he ain't even trying to stay healthy. He's almost trying to kill himself. He just don't care. And two years later, look how much worse his retinal function is based on this ERG testing. It's incredible. And it's not that the machine is variable. I've had this thing three years. I've done over a thousand of them. The machine is repeatable. You know, it, it's repeatable. Uh, I've done enough of them to say it's repeatable. Uh, you know, most of the time on most people. Uh, I don't think that I did a good one two years ago and then I did a bad one last summer. His stuff changed. So this ERG test picked up a decrease in visual function before the patient noticed it before it manifested as decreased visual acuity. So this test and this patient is a more sensitive measure of visual function than visual acuity. I kept going like I always do. 
<clears throat> I did my color vision test and his color vision, and you see the little factoids there about people with diabetes and loss of color vision. Uh, it's really striking. Uh, it's almost a coronavirus kind of, kind of coverage. Uh, if you have diabetes, uh, if you have it long enough, man, it starts to affect your color vision. You just got to have technology sensitive enough to pick it up. You can't be doing no color plates or pulling out some dots with a D15 test. I mean, that's not going to show nothing. You got to have some modern, sophisticated, computer-assisted, cone contrast color vision testing to see if your patient has a loss of color vision in the early stages. Again, if, if, if we're waiting on a D15 or some plates to see if the patient's color vision is normal, it's like wiggling fingers trying to do confrontation feels as opposed to a threshold visual field test. Okay, they're both tests, but you know they're not the same. So this particular patient has a slight decrease uh, in, in color vision on the right eye. And interestingly, uh, if, if uh, you go back, you know, just I, I saw this when I was preparing it, and I thought it was kind of interesting. When I go back to his first workup, and this is his color vision on that right eye back in 2017, look how it's exactly the same. It almost looks exactly the same. So this test is repeatable, uh, and his color vision didn't work, get worse. His visual acuity didn't get worse. His retinal appearance did not get worse. His ERG test results got worse because he's getting worse. Uh, and that's simply the first test that indicates it. And I told the guy, I said, hey, man, you're getting worse. You know, you got to wake up and act right or you're going to keep getting worse. And he says, I'll think about it. And I'm like, okay, I'll see you in six months. <clears throat> you know, you can't make people do stuff. So what I did, you know, I, I, here's my decision making. Uh, I talked to him about the whole shebang, diet, exercise, medicine. I do nutritional supplementation for people with diabetes. We use the diabetes vision support formula vitamins to try to you know, strengthen the integrity of the blood vessel walls. I showed him all these pictures. You know, I got the big flat screen on the wall. I'm popping all this stuff up. I did the best I could, okay? Best I could. And then I reported the services. Here's how I reported the services. So this guy, uh, he, he, he had hurt his back or something. He was on Medicare. So, I, so he, you know, regular exam, you see the visual field, uh, OCT, color vision, electroretinography. Uh, I've had some people that would say, well, how come you didn't bill for funders photography? Because the pictures were normal. There's nothing to take a picture of. Uh, so it's, a, it's not medically necessary to take a picture of a fundus that looks normal. Uh, so in this particular patient, the OCT was much more diagnostic. Uh, you know, 100 times more information and was the appropriate test to report. Again, there was no way to, to ethically or, or legally report funders photography. Uh, you see the diagnosis codes uh, for a person that has retinal diabetic neuropathy, where the retina is messed up from diabetes, but it looks normal. OK, there's a code for that. It's called diabetic retinopathy unspecified, E11319. I mean, I use it all the time. Uh, it generates most of the testing. Uh, you know, you've got to kind of pick it up either with your OCT or doing functional tests, but that's the code. Uh, this particular, and you see how I had to change the code. Again, I changed the code so I could get paid, but I'm not breaking any rules. I'm not breaking the law. It's not unethical. So I looked up uh, the, our, our Medicare carrier here in Texas, Novitas, I looked up uh, the LCD, the local coverage determination for OCT retinal imaging. Well, because they don't understand the science, uh, they do not have unspecified diabetic retinopathy listed as a covered code. Uh, yeah, it's an oversight on their part. Maybe we'll fix it next year, but right now that code's not in there. Well, if you look at the OCT scans, clearly <clears throat> they demonstrate optic atrophy. It's not primary optic atrophy, uh, like somebody born with a bad nerve. It's, it's all white when you look in there. So it's an acquired partial optic atrophy, and the code does not demand uh, what, that you determine the etiology. It just demands that you determine that there's optic atrophy. The OCT scan clearly showed there's optic atrophy, the, the loss of the retinal nerve fiber layer, the retinal thinning. So that code is appropriate, ethical, and, and the best code to use if you want to get paid and do it properly. Uh, the color vision, if the results are abnormal, uh, I always report the abnormality uh, where, where it's an acquired color vision deficiency. Uh, if, it's, if the results are normal, and you can report the test if the results are normal, I would simply use the unspecified diabetic retinopathy code. Uh, 
uh, like I did on the ERG test. And in this particular uh, carrier, Novitas, our carrier here in Texas, they have rules and regulations that govern the performance of ERG testing. And I looked them up today just to make sure. Uh, I, I knew it, but I wanted to make sure they hadn't changed it because they change them all the time. And as of today, the unspecified diabetic retinopathy is a covered diagnosis code that will generate an ERG uh, for our Medicare carrier here in Texas and probably most people's Medicare carriers too. Uh, for the people that uh, have their insurance clerks file claims, uh, you would append these modifiers uh, to these procedures since this is the one that generates the most dollars. But Medicare will do that for you automatically. If you don't do it, you'll still get paid. Everything will be the same. So this is how you would report this service or file this claim. You see, again, it's you can do what you want. You can mix and match. You can go here. You can go there. Uh, you can do whatever you want. So let's keep going. We're almost done. So now, <coughs> excuse me, I've been talking all day. So I put this slide up here. <laughs> this is a, I've never done this before. This I, I thought of this like four hours ago. Adam Farkas will tell you, I was, I was working on this thing at four o'clock and this popped in my head. And ordinarily, what you would do here when we're talking about this topic is you would say glaucoma suspect. He's a glaucoma suspect. She's a she's, she's suspicious. I think she might have some glaucoma. Okay, the raging glaucoma is coming. So ordinarily, traditionally, most of the time, when we're talking about patients in this category, we're talking about glaucoma suspect. I think they got glaucoma. I kind of want to change that narrative a little bit. This just popped in my head. See what y'all think. I'm thinking now, I'm going to start off primarily, I want to see if you are optic atrophy suspect, if you got some kind of optic atrophy. That's what I want to determine. I want to determine, does my patient have optic atrophy? Now, what I know from optometry school is that there's four or five different kinds of optic atrophy. You know, you got primary optic atrophy, consecutive optic atrophy, toxic optic atrophy. Uh, you got optic atrophy from, from myopic degeneration. And of course, uh, you've got optic atrophy from compressive lesions, pituitary tumors, uh, you know, the neoplasm kind of optic atrophy. And last but not least, you've got glaucomatous optic atrophy. So what I want to do is figure out, does my patient have optic atrophy, yes or no? And if they got some optic atrophy, what kind is it? Is it the glaucomatous kind or is it another kind? And I'm going to run a bunch of tests to figure that out. So, you know, think about it. You know, we, we, we've gone all these glaucoma lectures where they teach us, don't fixate on the pressure. Don't worry about the pressure. Glaucoma is a disease of the optic nerve. It is a neuropathy. Glaucomatous optic neuropathy is the term. If you look at the definition, got nothing to do with intraocular pressure. A skilled, modern, trained optometrist is supposed to be able to pick up an ophthalmoscope, look in the person's eye, examine the optic nerve head, and make some basic assessment. Does this person have optic atrophy, yes or no? That's what we're supposed to be able to do. Well, we all know that for most of us, the trigger is pressure when we're trying to figure out if somebody has glaucoma. But the more experienced I've got, and I'm really experienced, I got pretty good at looking at somebody's nerve and seeing if the thing looks normal or not. And if it don't look normal, I start ordering a bunch of tests. So, <coughs> excuse me, I don't need the pressure to be 25 to initiate a workup on a glaucoma suspect because there's almost no such thing he's an optic atrophy suspect and i'll figure out what kind of optic atrophy he is maybe on the second or third visit okay that's the way i'm looking at it now and i look at it like that a little bit because of the reporting of the services and trying to to make a living take care of my patients acquire expensive advanced technology and and stay in the rules okay that's you got to blend all that together so a person that, you know, we'll say glaucoma suspect just because we're used to saying it. So let's say you got a person that's a glaucoma suspect and you and you make the assessment. Let's say it's it's a it's not based on pressure. You just look in there and the nerve looks funny and you say, hey, man, your nerve looks funny. Yeah, you, you might be getting glaucoma. OK, I've done that in my career. I've done it more than once or twice. Uh, and you see the five pictures I put down here to play Jedi mind trick on you. Of course. Every one of those optic nerve heads is glaucomatous, and, and every one of those patients has glaucoma, okay? And you see they all look different, so I just, went, I just did that to mess with you, <laughs> okay? So here, <clears throat> you would do your, your exam. You see on the left-hand margin, the eye exam, the OCT, and so on. To me, that's a standard workup 
if I think someone has optic atrophy, okay? Now, let's say, and I put this, this if you see over here, these, these little asterisks, I put these on here. So to me, this is kind of a standard, I don't want to say cookbook, but this would be a common evaluation in my office for a person that I thought had optic atrophy or had glaucoma. Uh, you know, I, I'd kind of start with this most of the time. Now, if I could not make a decision on that first visit and I had to go to a second visit, this would be a typical or common second visit. And you see here, I've got these little asterisks. You, you may say, well, why does he have an asterisk there? So let's say that you, you did your exam, you determined that the nerve was funny looking. You did an OCT scan because the nerve was funny looking and the OCT scan was a little bit off. The ganglion cell complex was off in the, in the right eye. Uh, you did a visual field, it was normal. Uh, you did color vision, uh, it was normal. Uh, you did an ERG, it was normal. Okay, you got a funny looking nerve and a, and a, and a funny scan and everything else is okay. Okay, I might sit on that come back in six months, you know, to me, he don't have glaucoma yet. Uh, the same patient, same test. I do my visual field. My visual field comes out abnormal. I uh, do the color vision. The color vision's okay. Uh, I do my ERG. The ERG is abnormal. So I got a funny looking nerve, a funny scan, uh, unequivocal, that's normal. This is abnormal. To me, if your ERG is abnormal, you got the right to repeat it when you come back for a second visit. If your visual field is abnormal, you got the right to repeat it when you come back for a second visit. If the ERG is abnormal and I'm repeating the ERG on the second visit, now I want a VEP to see what's going on because now I'm curious now. Now I don't know what's happening. So if this is good, I'm done. If that's good, I'm done. If that's good, I'm done. If these are off, I ain't even close to being done. So it's a whole different thing. And until I put this patient on glaucoma medicine, he don't have glaucoma. And, and what I'm putting in the record is partial optic atrophy. Glaucoma could be on my list of differential diagnosis, and maybe on the seven, second or third visit, I'll make that determination. But on the first visit or the second visit, that's optic atrophy. And, and I'll put this in here again for those doctors that are concerned about following the rules using electrodiagnostic testing in the examination and, and diagnosis and treatment of patients with glaucoma or patients that you are suspicious of having glaucoma. Just try to think of those patients as being suspicious for having optic atrophy and not glaucoma because it really is the same thing until you get to the end and you finish. Now, if the, if the patient comes in and the pressure's 35 in each eye, okay, it's probably glaucoma. But that's not normal. And most of the time, you got to work to figure this out. So in conclusion, what I'd like to say is that electroretinography, to me, has an important place in the evaluation of eye disease. I've tried to explain why and how over the past hour. You see why. Uh, it's part of the functional vision assessment. We're supposed to assess visual function. We're optometrists. That's what we do. I'm real good at it because I use all these machines, and I don't just depend on a person's visual acuity to make some decision on how good their visual function is. I, I do all this stuff, and I roll it together. And this ERG test, depending on the patient, can help me make the decision. Is my patient getting better? Is my patient getting worse? Or is my patient staying the same? And then I make decisions accordingly. As the preachers say, govern yourselves accordingly. So that's how I do it. This is how I've added ERG testing to my practice. The, the handheld device makes it so, so, so easy. And once we all start working again in a few weeks, man, if you wanna differentiate your practice, you know, add this technology. If you've got first generation electrodiagnostics, man, upgrade to second generation. Uh, you know, I think I think the government's getting ready to hand us some loan money that we don't have to pay back. I'm gonna try to see if there's any machine I, I need right now. I'm getting ready to go get one of these don't pay back loans and I'm gonna give me some of that stuff. That's what I'm gonna do. So thanks everybody for listening. I know I've talked hard, but my voice is kind of hoarse. I've been talking all day, uh, but I, I, I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed giving this information out. I'm glad you guys took the time to listen tonight. Uh, I think we're gonna hang around for a couple of minutes. If anybody's got any questions, uh, Adam's gonna facilitate and, and uh, I will stand by. And for those guys that have to bug out or don't ask questions, I'll see you on OD Wire in the days coming forward. All right, well, well Craig, thank you so much for this. That was really great. And uh, we do have a few questions. So we have a few minutes here so we can uh, answer some of them. Um, 
the first question, which uh, and I don't know if you know off the top of your head, the approximate price of the Red Uh You know, I mean, they seventeen, eighteen thousand. You know, approximate. It changes depending on show specials and whether you get more than one device or not. If you if you buy like more than one thing, if you get like a Red Eval and a Color Vision testing unit, uh, then the price goes down. I do know that. Uh, but you know, I'd start with around 17, 16, 17, 18,000, something like that. I don't care about the price. All I care about the return on investment. Uh, the, the more appropriate question without me being disrespectful is how many tests do you need to do a month to pay for the machine? Uh, if, you know, to me, if you do one or two patients a week, you're paying for the machine. Uh, you know, in, in, in a return on investment mode, I simply ask doctors, how many digital field tests did you do last year? Uh, you know, a busy doctor may say I did 200. Uh, well, if you evaluated a patient's visual function 200 times with a threshold visual field, how many times could you evaluate the, the patient's visual function with an ERG? 200, 190, 180, 150? You know, those numbers are going to be similar if you understand how to do this stuff and how to, to get the maximum value out of your technology. So you wouldn't have a practice where you would do 200 visual field tests and 38 ERGs. If you did 200 visual field tests, you'd do 175 ERGs. Right. At the reimbursement rate that I just posted up on those slides, guys can put the pencil to it and see if that's a positive return on investment from a price point of view. So don't look at the dollars of acquisition, you know, like the, the, the dollar to buy the thing, unless you're just going to buy it and write a check or put it on a credit card. I always look at stuff. The way I get my machines, and I got a bunch of them, okay, I don't buy them, I lease them. And I just look at the payment, man. If, if the payment's 400 a month, you know, can I get 400 a month on this technology? Yes or no? Well, you know, for me, usually the answer is yes. Because again, especially with this one, because the reimbursement's so high, uh, you know, again, one to two patients a week, you know, you're, you're making money. So the first goal is, can I get this technology and not lose money? If the answer is yes, I think you should get the technology. So that's, uh, that's a long answer on the price, but that's how I look at it. Right, and the, the uh, you were actually pretty close to the price. Seventeen two fifty is uh, the, the official answer that I'm getting right now uh, for the price of the device. Okay. And uh, question here, billing and coding question. I know you love these. Um, so, is the ER <laughs> is the ERG or VEP exclusionary? Is it exclusionary on the same day as an OCT or or, or a dilated fundus exam, et cetera? Is it is it exclusionary? That's an excellent question, and the answer is no. Uh, there's no bundles. Uh, no exclusions. You could do a, an ERG at the VP on the same day, and that's why I commented on that, because on occasion, it's not common, but, you know, maybe one out of 15 ERGs, I'll do an ERG at the VP right back to back where I don't even unhook the patient. We just, you know, go right to it because uh, I want the information. Uh, right. So so you certainly can report them both on the same day, and there's no exclusions at all. Right. Interesting question. I don't know if this has happened to you or not. Question is, have you ever missed diagnosing glaucoma without using uh, the ERG? <laughs> Say that again? Have you ever missed a glaucoma before and then you use the ERG and you're like, oh, okay, this is what's going on? Um, I don't know. A, I, I, I'd have to ponder that. I don't think so. Uh, usually me missing glaucoma is just missing it right at the beginning where I didn't recognize the, the appearance of the nerve head. And I've actually posted a case on that on OD Wire where I, I admitted my culpability. Uh, so it's usually not not running enough tests. It's usually just being not being perceptive enough in the beginning to order the test. Once once I start ordering tests, I usually go A to Z. That that's why I want to I want people to see that. If you got four machines sitting down the hall, don't run two tests. Run four tests because you never know what the results are going to be, and you blend them all together. If I had five machines, I'd run five tests, okay, if I'm trying to figure it out. Now, once I know what's happening, I might not do that. So, you know, a guy that's under active management, I've seen him for seven, eight, ten years. Okay, I might not run five tests on him every time he comes in because I already know what's happening. Uh, but in the beginning, or if the guy looks like he's changing, okay, I'm not going to do two things. I'm going to do four or five things. Right. Uh, quick question here again, another billing and coding, pretty popular topic tonight. Um, so uh, how do insurers cover um, this device. Uh, this person was commenting that he's heard that Medicare makes it a hassle. <laughs> so what's no. the current status on reimbursement? <clears throat> well, that, that the, that's a good question. And the, 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 the optometrist there, unfortunately, is, is kind of drinking the, the Kool-Aid where 
what happens, unfortunately, in our profession is things, rumors, things take on a life of their own. Somebody will go to some seminar, somebody will say something, somebody's on stage, some expert, something, and, and they'll say something. And it might be right, it might be wrong, it might, but it'll get twisted or, or distorted by the time it gets back home. And once it passes down four or five people and gets to the billing clerk or the optometrist that didn't go to the meeting, uh, you know, it's almost like, hey, man, don't do that or your hand's going to fall off. You know, you don't even think of doing that. You're going to jail. And, and we get we get to fixating on what we can't do and what you're not supposed to do in the negative. And it's it's just not like that. Now, I did make the reference. And again, the, 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 the question is Medicare makes it a hassle. OK, now, two or three years ago. Uh, Medicare tried to stop paying claims for a minute because they were discriminating against optometrists, saying that we didn't have credentials to to order and interpret the test. Well, we fixed that pretty fast, and that and that was just nonsense coming from a bunch of medical doctors, and they just they took the bait and did it. <clears throat> so some optometrists had to go through that uh, about two or three years ago, but that had nothing to do with the technology. That was just ophthalmologists hating on optometrists. That's all that was. Uh, so so you can't count that. And then the only other thing. And, and, and I'm positive I'm right. Uh, the only other thing is the thing I referenced where uh, because of abuse, uh, because you had too many doctors doing too many tests for, for not enough good reasons, uh, Medicare had to say, OK, you guys, y'all can't control yourselves. We're going to control it for you. Uh, so they put more rules in place. They, they put rules in place that were not there at the beginning. Uh, so since everybody went crazy with the glaucoma and the glaucoma suspects, I mean, I saw optometrists that did a thousand VEPs a year. You know, and I might do 180, and I'm busy. You know, and I'm like, man, you did a thousand? Oh yeah, yeah, we do them all the time. I'm like, no, you can't do them all the time. You know, it's nonsense. So that so Medicare came in and they said, okay, we're going we're gonna put we're gonna slow this down. And so two or three or four of the carriers, uh, they all copied each other's language, and they said, okay, we don't want you to use this technology to diagnose and treat glaucoma. Okay, they said it plain as day. All right, those are the rules. Uh, so you can't use it to diagnose and treat glaucoma. And they took all the glaucoma codes out of the covered diagnosis list. Now, what they did leave in, and they did it on purpose, they know what they're doing, they left the codes for glaucoma and optic atrophy in because you've got to be able to make a differentiation. Is my patient's retina and or optic nerve messed up from glaucoma or is it messed up from something else? You know, you got to have the right to do that. And so they're, they're giving you the right to do that where they still got the glaucoma and optic atrophy codes and those partial optic atrophy codes. Because again, we're looking for optic atrophy. We're not really looking for glaucoma. You see why it's important to have that distinction? You see now? That's what I'm talking about. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So in the beginning, <clears throat> all you're trying to figure out, does the person have optic atrophy? And is it messing up their vision? That's second or third. And, and then, <clears throat> excuse me. So in that beginning, that first visit, you know, when you do your OCT, you know, unless the pressure is outrageous, you know, and again, if the pressure is outrageous, then you got to go with that. But that's not the, the case most of the time. You know, it's not outrageous. You know, to me, 22 and, and 24 is not outrageous. That could be normal. So in the beginning, all you know is that the person has an abnormal OCT scan. Okay, that, that's all you know. So it's optic atrophy. You don't know if it's from glaucoma and you don't know if a pressure of 24 is producing glaucoma. You don't know none of that on the first visit. All you know is that the person's got a messed up nerve fiber layer or optic nerve or something that the OCT scan is showing. So when you do your electrodiagnostic testing, your ERG and or your VEP, the service that the, the, the code that generates that test, that generates the medical necessity, is not any kind of glaucoma code, the H4O code, or any kind of glaucoma suspect code, which is also an H4O code. It's an optic nerve code. That's what the technology is for. Does the person have a defect from the optic nerve or the retina, and you use these two tests to try to figure it out. Okay, that's that's the deal. And, that, and now, once you figure it out, one, so, 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 what, let's say you go two or three visits, and then you make the decision. Hey, this guy's got glaucoma. You know, when I saw him the first day, the pressure was 20. I saw him the second day, the pressure was 19. I saw him the third day, the pressure was 27. Okay, <laughs> he's got glaucoma. Okay, so once you make the decision that the guy's glaucoma has glaucoma then, you know, most of the time I'm not really using the test to, to manage the glaucoma. Uh, 
I will, as we go forward, let's say the guy can't do a visual field or his other, or like the one I showed where, where the color vision won't help me at all. Okay, well then, you know, I got the right to use other tests. Uh, and I still got the right to see if the, if the guy's changing from glaucoma or something else. So then I use that glaucoma optic atrophy code uh, to generate the test, you know, as I'm into the, the active management down the road. But sometimes you just got to let it go. You know, when the, when, the, when the insurance company says, we don't want you to use this to diagnose and treat glaucoma, then once you make the decision that the guy has glaucoma, then you may have to let it go. But, you know, without sounding mercenary, uh, you know, I may have done two ERGs and a VEP to get to that point uh, to where I've generated three, four hundred dollars worth of, of electrodiagnostic fees uh, to help make my decision. OK, I'm good. Uh, you know, I got a bunch of patients. They'll come back. You know, I'll see them all in a couple of months and, and I'll take that four hundred dollars and go on to the next patient. And I don't worry about it. And I don't worry about I'm not going to make four hundred dollars next year. I don't worry about it. Uh, you know, I'll have some new technology or I'll just go to the next patient or the guy right. get drives or something. I don't worry about it. OK, right. And, and so just to be clear, then do you, you don't do ERG on all glaucoma suspects that come into your chair? No, no. If you can make a decision without it, then you can make a decision without it. Uh, I mean, again, it's, it's you know, I'd say the number is 70% of my visual fields. So if I do 100 visual fields, I'll do 70 ERGs. So sometimes I can make the decision without the information. Okay. Right. You know, I, st I still go by the step by step. I'll start with a visual field because that's standard of care. And, you know, and if I, let's say that, the you know, if I did a visual field, and, and one eye's got this humongous superior arcuate scotoma and the other eye does not. Okay, I may be done. Okay, I, I may do two tests and call it a day. Okay, this guy's got moderate glaucoma, right eye, get on these drops, I'll see you in three weeks. You know, you know and I, I'm, I'm done, you know. So it's not, so there's no, there's no everything on everybody. Everybody's different. But I will say that last year between me and my two associates, we did over 500 ERG tests in this practice. So it's a test that we do often. Right. So uh, interesting uh, question here again, more billing and coding. Um, observation is that, you know, your patterns of billing and coding might be different from other people's, making you an outlier. Have you found that you've been audited uh, based on this? Yes. And how did that go? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> uh, I am absolutely an outlier. Uh, me and many other uh, optometrists, uh, uh, we seem to know each other and run together because uh, we all go through the same stuff. Uh, I've lost count of the letters I've received from Blue Cross threatening me with removal from the panel because of the way I practice. And usually I just have to talk to someone that's reasonable and just tell them, hey, you know, we do more than sell glasses and contacts here. People with eye disease actually walk through the doors and this is what we do. And once they hear it properly, it's usually, it's, it has been enough. And they'd say, okay, fine. Uh, but it's happened four or five times. <laughs> They're the worst. Blue Cross is the worst. Right. It's, it's happened with Aetna. Uh, it's happened. Blue Cross is the worst with that stuff. Right. So, um, you know, some other interesting questions here. You mentioned you sometimes do ERG and VEP back to back. Don't you need to use two different hookup points between the two, one on the back of the head? Not with this device. See? Hmm. Ah, ah, no. No, back to back. Boom, boom. Okay, I said it. I said it on purpose. You don't have to hook them up again. Okay, just hmm. just one one right after the other. Right. How how long does it actually take to hook someone up? I I saw that picture of the first one you put up uh, early in the lecture with the. Uh, I mean, you know, you wipe their cheeks down with a lid scrub to get the oil off, so you get the best contact. Uh, peel the little strips on. Uh, to give the patient instructions, which is basically look at the light. Uh, hook the thing up with the little electrode clip and go boom boom i mean it's it's pretty quick <laughs> you know yeah. and that's uh, it. I, did, I did a 10 month old infant last week uh it was that was really it was really slick as uh man it was kind of a sad case that i don't want to get too too deep i know it's late but this little 10 month old kid had a stroke and uh and apparently is blind and has developed the the pendular searching the stagmus and he'd been to three eye doctors you know the pediatric ophthalmologist and one doctor said he was blind and one doctor said he could see color and shape and stuff. Uh, then he went to the, the low vision clinic here in Dallas and they evaluated him and the, the low vision optometrist said he had some vision. And so th they were just kind of just lost and confused. And they called my office three weeks ago and says, hey, 
can you do a VEP test on an infant? I go, sure, if he's breathing, we bring him in, you know, we'll give it a shot. And I said, what's going on? And I actually got on the phone, they told me what's happening. I'm like, yeah, yeah, bring him down. And so the, the, it was, it was kind of, it was a little sad. Uh, you know, the mother was there, the grandmother was there. Uh, the other grandmother was on the phone during the whole exam. We were all talking together in the room. It was kind of kind of fun. Uh, and the, the kid was cool. He was a cool little kid, 10 months old. He's cute as a bug. But this kid was blind. Uh, I mean, I'm telling you, I was shining a light. I was shining a floodlight at him. He didn't bat an eye. Uh, I was waving my hand in front of him. I mean, nothing. No blink, no, no reaction, no nothing. It was spooky. I was like, hey, this is not good. I think this kid's blind. And he had a CT scan that showed a bunch of, of visual cortex damage, and it looked like he had cortical blindness uh, from the stroke, you know, like total, like like no light perception. So <clears throat> we finally were able to get it. It took about, you know, I mean, I stayed in the room with him, you know, to kind of comfort the mother and, and you know, my staff member had never done a, a 10-month-old infant. So I stayed in there with him while they did it. Uh, you know, and then it, we, we got one eye that was okay, uh, you know, where we got kind of a waveform. I mean, it was hard. Uh, but I asked the lady, you know, because, you know, it wasn't my regular patient, uh, my, my regular demographic. And when I looked on the computer, I saw that she lived about 50 miles away, maybe 60 up north. <clears throat> and, and I like, ma'am, you know, without me sounding stupid, you know, uh, how'd you find me down here? I mean, you a long way from home. <laughs> you know, you drove past like 700 eye doctors to get here. She goes, well, I looked up VEP testing and your name came up first. I go, no way. She goes, way. <laughs> I go, really? She goes, yeah, it came up on your website that you do VEP testing. I go, yeah, well, we do. She says, well, you were the only one that came up on the search, so I decided it was worth driving down here, so here we are. I go, okay. And this kid had two vitreous hemorrhages from the stroke, and so I did an exam, B scans on both eyes, and a VEP on this Timothy baby. And, you know, and I'm not trying to talk about the money, but that was a good visit, you know, <laughs> I mean, that was a good visit, you know, not, you, especially nowadays, you know, how did I, how did I open this lecture? Uh, you know, we got to get ready to start working again, and <clears throat> you may have to go at it a different way. Uh, and adding this ERG and DEP testing, you know, it may help recover. Uh, I'm telling you, it makes a difference. <laughs> Right, right. So we're almost out of time, but I have a, a tidbit here, and I, I don't think I mentioned it before. So Conan is, uh, you mentioned those uh, low interest, no interest loans that the government might be giving out, but in lieu of that, um, uh, Conan actually says that they have a special right now, financing equipment with no payments and no interest for six months uh, wow. when you're ready to consider purchasing equipment again. So again, just to sort of keep that back in your mind, I think, you know, companies like Conan are, are trying to help get everyone back on track again. And that's unprecedented to me. Uh, six months without to spend any money. This is going to take us a month, maybe six weeks, I think, to ramp back up. You know, there's hopefully there's guys listening, ladies listening, where they're not under the, you know, shelter in place or cease and desist and all that kind of stuff. You know, there's parts of the country that are still kind of sort of OK. And, you know, and if, if you're in that part of the country, I mean, just, you know, move forward. Uh, right. For those of us that are kind of stuck for a minute, it's, we're just going to be stuck for a minute. To me, if you got a bunch of money or your credit's good, man, I would I would start buying stuff and fixing up the office and doing all kind of stuff and just getting ready. Uh, you know, people are they're not going anywhere. You know, it ain't like people are just falling off the earth. They're all going to be back. Uh, the only question is, are they going to be back in your practice or someplace else? Because because yep. to me, the patterns are changing. People are getting used to doing different stuff. They're not going to the restaurants they used to go to. They, you know, they're going to start shopping online. You can't get no ERG test online. Okay, that's all. That's the last thing I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I think I think it's actually a pretty good way to end. So, you know, if anyone has any more questions, this is all going to be up uh, on ODWire. This archive will be up and we'll continue the conversation there. And by the way, there's also um, C wires coming up just in case uh, folks don't know. Um, C wire this year, uh, b because of everything that's going on with the coronavirus, has now been approved by, by Arbo temporarily uh, to be the same as in person live CE. So if you attend CEYR, you can get up to 60 in-person live CE credits. Essentially, you can get your entire, uh, you know, your your entire cycle's worth of CE just from showing up at CEYR. So um, just throwing it out there so everyone knows, uh, go to CEYR2020.com. Um, and you'll learn more about it if you come back to ODWire and look at this archive as well. So, so Craig, thanks so much for being here, and thank and thank you everyone for showing up tonight. You know, there's a a really big crowd here tonight, and it's kind of nice actually, Craig, hearing your voice again and <laughs> getting back to normal. You know what I mean? I'm sorry, it's so hoarse, man. I just got dry all day. <laughs>
Uh, well, well, thanks again, everyone, and uh, I guess we'll uh, see you all online. Okay. Good night.